Alright guys, hope you're all doing well. It's tournament time. So today we have a community tournament, 1v1, mostly people from our Discord, so skill uh, levels all over the place. We got some Conquerors, we got some Bronze players. It's gonna be fun. So when we finish the 1v1s, we'll uh, if we still have some time, maybe we'll do an FFA to close it out as well. Alright, so we're gonna be casting our first round match here in just a second. Uh, taking a look at the brackets, let me show you. I believe we have over 30 people signed up, which is pretty cool. So let me close this down, looking solid here, and taking a look at the brackets. So you can see here we have all the different players, and yeah, a lot of people signed up today, which is pretty cool to see. And, uh, you know, these are a lot of folks who don't normally play 1v1 tournaments either, so it's it's neat to see uh, the new, uh, new folks getting ready to battle as well. Here's the round description. You can see the maps, all the various tournament rules on AoE4Tavern.com. We basically duplicated Total Tavern, made a different version for Age of Empires, where we'll be hosting tournaments. Uh, you can unlock avatars, do all that sort of good stuff that you can do on Total Tavern as well. So it should be a lot of fun. All right, so switching back over. The Lords of Bronze, who will uh, emerge and be the be the conqueror of the uh, old world here? All right, so folks are uh, getting all squared away. Let's see this. Outstanding. And hopefully they will leave the observers for me. Yes, yes. It's going to take about five minutes for them once they get started. Um, it is a faction war style, so today people are playing only one Civ all the way through. I know it's not the most competitive format, but it's very simple. And for our first tournament in our Discord, I think it's going to be all first tournament in a long time. I think it's going to be easier for people to just kind of move through it quicker and uh, get used to playing again in a competitive setting. So scrolling down, making sure there's no admin issues. All right, so now we've got to find a game to cast. Let's see. We could cast Vice Bros game. Let's see what their ranked history looks like. If they've played ranked games or not. Always a little bit of lag when you look at people's profiles. Yeah, we could do this one. That looks good to me. All right. So Vice is playing. Let me check who they're matched up against here. And we're going to be doing a, a game each round. So he is playing uh, Quill. Oh, that's going to be a, a very, very scary, sweaty one indeed. Quill, I believe, is Conqueror 3. So we will do that. Uh, Quill... And uh, Vice Bro, Vice Bro, it's with an S. I'll be casting your game first. Make sure to have OBS. Can set delay to 2.5 minutes. All right, outstanding. So we have our game to cast. We just got to wait for them to start and get in the lobby with one another. I found them on the old friends list. And uh, hey man, we'll cast your match. Spec at 2.5, please. Good luck, have fun. Yeah, so we have a nice combination of players playing new and old tips today. I, I saw a lot of Mongols signed up. I think there was like three or four Mongol players. Lots of, lots of, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be overwhelmed with just seeing like, you know, Japanese and Byzantines, but it seems that people in a competitive setting are going back to their comfort zone to an extent, which is quite a bit of fun. Yeah, Friday evening, yes. Hopefully you feel better, Chris. Sorry to hear that, Hadris. Hope, hope you feel better. Um, is there a Tyrant faction that dominates the others? Not really. I mean, in 1v1, it's not... The game is pretty balanced. I mean, there are some, like, little things. Some civs that are pro probably slightly more dominant, but it's probably too early to tell. I don't think there's been any, like, huge major competitive tournaments that have dictated that yet, so... So, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, the tournament's now starting. It's uh, It would be too late to sign up now. If somebody drops, I can put you on a wait list. Favorite new civ? I really, really enjoy playing um, Japan. That's, that's been my favorite so far. But the Byzantines are what I want to be good at, but I'm just struggling with them. Um, I've been winning a lot with, in 1v1 with Japan, but with Byzantines, I'm like 0-3. With Japan, I think I'm 3-1, maybe. I, was like, I don't know what it is with the Byzantines. I just can't quite get it at all click. Um, I think I'm just... I need more practice with them. They're much harder... harder they're harder to play. Yeah, harder to play for sure. This is going to make Friday afternoon at work go by so much more, uh, so much quicker. I got you. I got you. All right, so they're starting right now. Outstanding. Should be able to uh, watch their game in a second. Good luck, have fun. And we'll see what they're playing here. Yeah, the Byzantines seem really good. There's some cool strategies with Byzantines. Uh, like one of my favorite ones is going for the Hippodrome at tier two, which is the horse landmark. It gives your cavalry more damage and healing and doing big horseman raids. And then your opponent is like, oh no, a lot of powerful horsemen. Let's make spears. And then you roll up with mercenary longbows and just absolutely just dunk on them, right? So there's a, a lot of a lot of great stuff you can do with the Byzantines. And all the mercenaries are so fun. You can get the cistern landmark with the Byzantines, and then you're you can get elephant mercenaries, which can then heal. <laughs> it's so cool. Like the Civ is so awesome, you know. Um Yeah, a lot to a lot to check out here. Alright, can I observe from here? It looks like uh let's refresh the friends list here. 
Okay, oh, friend request. Okay, so we need to accept that. Accept. Thank you guys for adding me. Makes the tournament a lot easier. And a big thanks to Gunhound for helping as well. He is helping out with the old uh, the old adminning. So we will go down here and we will find our uh, our casted game. We could cast any number of these matches. Um, most of the people that I'm seeing here on my friends list are playing in the tournament. So Quill, did he forget to put the observer slot on? Uh, I'm not sure. He might still be loading in. I'm pretty sure that's who we were talking to. Let's see here. Okay. Still not observable yet, so he must be loading in. I think it has to get a little bit closer. So, yeah. Should be there in a minute. The water system looks fun. It is. Yeah. And, dude, it's pretty nuts. Like, if you have level 5 reservoirs with your cistern system with the Byzantines, your military buildings nearby produce 100% faster. 100% faster. So you can just be launching armies out. Like, launching. Like, rapid fire. It, it's really, really cool. Okay, if, he's, if he forgot to put the Spectator on, then I can go and um, just cast another game. There's plenty of matches to choose from, so not too worried. I'm just going to keep looking down here. I know Vice Bro is on my friends list now, too. Yep, Nanny Yori's in a match. And uh, here's Vice. All right, yeah, this was the match. Cool. The Cistern thing is really neat, though. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are in our first match of today's tournament. I just want to sincerely thank you all for joining. It's really, really fun to be back casting 1v1 Age of Empires. And probably my favorite element of it is these are a lot of folks in our community, some who have played a lot of 1v1, some who haven't, but it's going to be interesting to see who rises and really just kind of gets the W here today. So here we are in caster mode, spawning on the west side of the map. It is going to be Quill on the Ayubids. So the Ayubids are the new variant sieve of the Abbasid, and we'll get into talking about some of the tricks and uh, traps that they have as we get later into the game here. And up on the northeast side of the map, it's going to be Vice Bro on Joan of Arc. As far as the ranks of these players in traditional 1v1, I believe, I don't know what their ranks are now, but both of them are like, I know that Quill is Conqueror level. I believe he's Conqueror 2 or 3, or historically, I don't know about this season. And Vice Bro, I believe, is around Diamond level, so certainly in a range that they could run into each other on ladder and have a nice little duel, so we will see how this goes. I have been playing a bit of Joan of Arc, and I think Joan of Arc is awesome. It's such a fun... Such a fun sieve. Um, when you get tier two with her, you can go and hunt the wild boar, and that gives you like 40 or 50 experience, which is good. Eventually, she can capture sacred sites. And her sniping ability with her bow is really, really good. Um, it does a ton of burst damage, so if you have like a bunch of arbalists or you want to alpha strike units, it lets you finish off units before your opponents can react to, uh, you know, with the fancy micro. So it's very fun indeed. But down on the south side, we are going to be getting the House of Wisdom going down here in just a moment. And once that is done, I'll show you guys all the Ayubid techs. Uh, and there's a couple kind of pretty straightforward routes I've been seeing. I've been casting a couple high-level games from, uh, I guess you could say, pro players. And uh, I've seen a lot of Ayubid matches. And oftentimes, you'll see the Economic variant first to give additional villagers or the Wood variant to get a fast second TC. But we'll uh, take a look here and see what they end up doing. Up on the top side, Joan of Arc is going to be fervently mining these sheep. And the way that she levels up in the Dark Ages when she starts off as a peasant is that she can level up by building buildings or by harvesting resources. And she also does get passive income as well. So taking a look here, uh, she also builds 33% faster. So you can actually just have her like solo build your landmark if you want to or just have, you know, uh, one villager help her and that's going to be enough. On top of that, she heals out of combat, and uh, she does take reduced damage at higher levels from range attacks, so she doesn't get like one-shotted by bombards at tier 3. And she does also uh, generate experience, like I said, from capturing sacred sites, uh, getting in combat, building, harvesting. You guys get the idea. So yeah, she's a really, really fun character. I think the ranged variant of Joan of Arc is hands down the best. Uh, I feel like the melee variant, it can be very good for sure, but it's... Um, it's, it's, it's tricky, you know, when she gets in the front line, it can get chaotic. If your front line folds, she can die very, very quickly. So you got to watch out. All right, so the School of Cavalry, and we do see Joan of Arc in one peasant building this, just like we talked about, and it is going to be building 33% faster for Joan. On the south side, the Ayubid's going to be leveling up with what we talked about, which is the economic wing of industry. So when this completes, these bad boys are going to be getting 300 free wood, which means they can just go like 2TC really quickly. So instead of having to have all these villagers on wood, he's able to bank on the free wood he's going to be getting from the House of Wisdom and take all of his eco, essentially, or his uh, wood eco, and switch it over to stone to get that really, really quick second TC, which is just badass. So... Yeah, lots of neat stuff for the Ayubids. So how they work is you can see they have the wing structure. When they age up, they choose one of two options from the wing of their choosing. And when they do that, it eliminates the other option. So you're not going to be able to get it for the rest of the game. And the other options will then level up. So if this gives you three villagers when you go to the uh, feudal age, 
when you go to the castle age with it, if you opt to go somewhere else for the feudal ages, it's going to give you more villagers. It gets progressively more powerful. So free wood going down, baby. Very nice. And uh, that will be popping off here in just a second. So what I've been seeing is the uh, rapid expansion with the industry. And then I've been seeing this one, the culture wing advancement. So this makes it so advancing to the next age takes 40% less uh, time and also is cheaper on resources. It is really good for going 2TC fast castle. Um, it's insanely powerful, actually. Up on the top side, Joan of Arc looks like she is going to be going for uh, two expansions or two TCs as well. We do see the stone being gathered here, so obviously a pretty massive tell. Looking at the wood bank here of uh, Vice, though, he currently does not have a lot of wood in the back pocket, although he does have his villagers here and he is setting it up, so should be adequate. And Joan of Arc um, should be pretty close to leveling up. I don't know if there's any way to like look at her experience level in this per particular casting mode, but nonetheless, usually if you have her build the School of Cavalry and um, do everything in a relatively optimal way in the Dark Ages, she's going to be reaching her archer form like almost immediately after you get to the Feudal Age. And then she can go hunting and... Uh, yeah, that's what you want to be doing. As soon as she gets archer farm, what I like to do with her is get a uh, immediately get a French knight out and go just get both boar on the map. So you get the boar, get all the deer, and she's going to get a ton of experience. Because when she gets level 3, I mean, she starts doing some serious work and can really turn the tide of games. And obviously with Joan, you want to be consecrating her buildings too, which is something that's very, very easy to forget. So School of Cavalry is going to be out. And we do see the second TC coming down from Quill on the northwest portion of the map. And that is going to be very classic second TC, uh, deer all around it. So that is some nice sustainable food. Each of these deer are going to be providing 350 food, which is a lot. Um, there's a whole pack here. So they are going to be feasting like the heathen kings of old. Are we going to be seeing a French knight raid? Joan of Arc going to be heading up to the gold uh, for now, or is she going to be going hunting? Oh, okay. So she has reached her second form, and she is going to be the hunter. So she gets Divine Arrow, which is a sniping ability. It does 40 damage immediately. Very good for picking off certain types of units. And on top of that, she does have the Divine Restoration, which heals herself and nearby allies. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. Especially when you have those like really, really powerful French Knights. On top of that, she's got Consecrate. So clearly, uh, clearly Vice Pro here knows what uh, they're doing. Going to be hunting the wild boar, bringing a villager up here. And Joan can definitely solo the boar. And that's going to be giving the French a really nice kind of uh, pocket of food here. Because there's not only a huntable deer camp here, but also this boar. And she gets a lot of experience for doing that. So now she is in her archer form and uh, she's ready to party for sure. Now for the Ayubids, camels are certainly pretty cool. They have camel lancers, and that in many ways does pretty well against a lot of what the French like to do, right? Considering one of your core units for the Ayubids is a camel, you know, obviously, the camels in this game debuff horse uh, horse damage by 20%, and the French obviously like to use their French knights. So that's a really, really nice um, situation here for the Ayubids, but Joan of Arc could be moving across. And that's not to say French can't just go with like Arbalist, Spears, and Men-at-Arms. That's a very powerful army comp. Um, Arbalists are amazing. Like, they'll take mitigated damage uh, from melee if, like, you know, Ghulams or Camel Lancers trying to attack them. They'll be able to hold their own very well against those. So, yeah, Joan's doing it. She is. <laughs> the RPG. Yeah, she's the final boss here. But definitely need to find that other boar. Um, although, oh, that's a dangerous spot. That boar is in the far corner. So, Joan should be hunting right now, going after these camps to get experience. And it looks like uh, Vice is going to be doing that currently. We do see a big economic lead here for Quill, which is no surprise. The Ayubids can definitely get a lead on you pretty damn quick. With the rate at which they can expand and tech up, they seem like they're going to be a really, really big powerhouse Civ as we have our first duel here between these two mighty champions. So Barracks is up, Stables is up, and it is going to be Spears, uh, obviously to deal with potentially French Knights. And here we have the Stable, which I believe can make, des I think Desert Raiders, which are the uh, Camel variant that can switch between Bow and Sword, can be made at both the Stable as well as the Archery range. And I'm really curious what Quill's going to be doing as it pertains to the Age Up. My guess would be that Quill is going to be using the Culture Wing uh, Advancement, which makes it cost 500 less resources. Dude, that is so powerful. You can age up for 850, 450 to Castle Age. Oh, look at that. The Joan of Arc harass coming in. She should use her sniping ability, um, the, 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 the Holy Arrow. I think she's going to get a pick here. Maybe get a villager. Definitely needs to. And is she going to do it? Is she going to pop her Sacred Arrow? No, looks like she's going to be switching to doing battle with the Spear, which she should win pretty easily against. You can see Joan is going to be healing. And do we have the Arrow? It has not been popped yet, but yeah, that Spearman is going to be going down. And the dreaded Joan of Arc harass, picking off a Spearman, forcing back the Wood Eco. I do like that. But the problem is Joan is going to get wrecked pretty bad once a critical mass comes out of uh, defenders from the Camel. So we see a Desert Raider. Joan is going to be pulling back. Does she have a French Knight? Find out on today's episode. So 2TC is up. The French are a little bit behind economically. And Joan, has she baptized this building yet? She has. So here, this building has been consecrated. So it's 25% less food to produce. And that is her ability right here, the Consecrate. And she can do that... 
perpetually over the course of the entire game. And that wasn't a bad raid for sure. Um, I've seen some good Joan of Arc harass for, that comes in with like archers as well as knights, and it, it can be very nasty. I mean, having a hero character that can heal and uh, do stuff like that can be very nasty. And it does also force a response from Quill, but Quill, I think, feels pretty comfortable dealing with her now. He has a Desert Raider as well as two Spear units, so I think Joan of Arc is going to be pulling back and should probably consider go hunting some wild game to try and get a little bit more experience and level up. Archer is coming out here for ye old, uh, for ye old Vice Pro. And that's good. Archers counter camels pretty well. I mean, they'll do well against the Desert Raiders who literally have zero ranged armor, and they'll also do very well against Spears. So if Joan of Arc wants to get like a push going with, you know, five or six archers, that could be pretty devastating. It could really, really uh, cause some havoc because like I said, Desert Raider is not very good here against the archers, but horsemen are. So Quill, obviously being a seasoned player here, is going to know that he's going to need some horsemen to deal with the inevitable archers. TC could be under some pressure. We do see Quill coming up for a little bit of harass. So moving up with his Desert Raiders, as well as the Hardened Spearmen. Vice Pro going to be responding very quickly. Both players on two TC. IU bids preparing to engage here as the uh, scout unfortunately does meet his demise. Gets a little bit overextended there, but the, immediately the Spearmen are being just crushed by those archers. And Joan of Arc is potentially going to get sniped here. We'll see. She's got two charges of her Divine Arrow. What she should be doing is using that to snipe the uh, Horseman. And if she's able to snipe the Horseman, that's going to really, really let the Archer shine here. So the Horseman does go down to Joan of Arc, but nonetheless, the French army is going to be forced back. The Desert Raider able to pick off the Archers. And uh, I would say a slightly favorable trade here for Quill, considering he's also going to be getting a pick on a couple of villagers here. So these villagers do get hammered. One does go down and Joan of Arc has pulled back into the base. This TC would be pretty safe though. It would take a lot of effort here for... Uh, for Quill to bring this down. He would need to get battering rams and different things like that. He does end up garrisoning there, and one of the Desert Raiders does get popped down. Very cool to see the new camels in action. They're uh, they're rad, and like I said, they can switch between these two variants. So whatever you need. If you want to poke from a distance, you can do that. If you want to charge into melee, they can do that as well. And they do have good melee armor too, so they're very good at fighting against, like, uh, obviously anything that's going to get at them up close. Tower being set up here, I think that overall Vice Bro should be safe, but Quill's economy is a booming back here. And he has not aged up yet. Is he saving up for an age up? Doesn't look like it quite yet. Currently, his resources are being spent as he gets them. 201, 170, and 75. So he's probably pretty comfortable here. But the Desert Raider harass is being very effective. Joan of Arc needs to get up here and look at this. They can switch to their bows, uh, get a pick on the villagers here. TC does get garrisoned, but where is Joan of Arc and the defenders? All right, so here they come. Heading up this way. Oh, deers do not give experience to Joan. Okay, that's good to know. For some reason, I thought they did. Okay, well then, correction to my earlier statements. They do not give her experience. Only the wild boars. Only the most dangerous game gives Joan of Arc experience. So Desert Raiders poking and prodding down here. The French army is going to be archers as well as spears. And this Desert Raider could for sure get picked off if Joan of Arc wants to use her sniping attack. And she does. So that's 18 experience right there. That is quite a bit. So if she's partaking in combat and not dying, Joan of Arc can do very, very well for herself. Eco is 54 to 42. The Ayubids did have their second TC up a little bit faster than the French. And the French also lost about three or four villagers in total. Uh, as it pertains to the early harass. Let's see if she gets experience for wolves. Okay, looks like Joan of Arc doesn't get experience for wolves. And now Quill is going to be pulling back with his Dread Camel Legion. And now he's saving up for the age up here. You can see Quill sitting on about 700 food. And that's pretty insane. I mean, if they want to do the Culture Wing Advancement, they can age up with only 450, which is just bananas. Golden Age coming in as well. Quill also very close to reaching the second Golden Age, which is going to be augmenting the research speed of the faction. So you can see the Golden Age system is different. For the Ayubids. Um, meanwhile, in the middle, we have a bit of a mortal combat here. Spears chasing uh, spears. Archers trying to take down the camels. But Quill does have a pretty nice mass of camels there. And a little bit of scooting and shooting. They should be able to do well. But more reinforcements coming in from Vice Pro. Very, very nice hold here. Spearmen battling it out. And Joan of Arc has got to be approaching level 3 soon. She's probably about 3 quarters of the way. Maybe halfway to level 3. But Quill with some very, very nice micro. Pulling back here and luring many of these units to their demise. And if they overextend, the Desert Raiders are going to draw their swords and just punish them super hard. Oh, the swords have been drawn and now they're going to be concaving in on the overextended units. Joan of Arc could potentially be in danger here. But we do have two more spears coming out. Spears are going to be rushing forward to force them back. And I think they're going to draw their bows again. Look how cool that is. The fact that he can switch between the bow and the sword depending on the circumstances. And, you know, a player who is of the caliber of Quill... That Conqueror 3 level player, that is going to be a really, really powerful combination right there. So, um, yeah, neat stuff. Yes, yeah, so you can see the total number of villager kills down here, which is going to be two. All right, so it was only two. I could have sworn it was more, but I guess only two villagers ended up going down there. So, Joan of Arc is going to be forced back. Outpost there, holding it down. Vice Pro is playing very, very well. I mean, Quill is, uh, is an incredibly, incredibly strong player, and so is Vice Pro is playing great. Like, this is a good match. Uh, up on the top side, the French uh, TC looks safe. Looks pretty secret, looks pretty safe. The Desert Raiders pulling back here. 
And we have our first round one match concluded. All right, so people are getting through their games. Cool to see. We're about 13 minutes into the match, and uh, I don't think this one's going to be over anytime soon. I, I suspect that, you know, neither player is getting bullied to the point where it's that bad. And it's only going to get better for old Joan of Arc, because now she is in her uh, third form. So she's in her uh, level three form, and she gets access to calling in riders so she can call in her champions, which we'll see how they do. All right, so the champion's being called out. Joan's men at arms. And that's going to get a little bit of armored screening. So they are going to be chasing back the Desert Raiders. The archer's hot in pursuit here. Is there any Castle Age on the horizon for old Vicebro? Looking at Vicebro's base, I don't see it. I think Vicebro is investing a lot into military here to hold back these Desert Raiders. While Quill seems to be investing a little bit less in his military overall to, uh, to uh, you know, put the pressure on. Because those Raiders can really scoot and shoot very, very well. Are there no? Is there no one playing Mongols? There is actually one of the best players in our Discord, Eravity. Um, I believe he's a Conqueror Three player as well. He's playing today. He's playing the Mongols today. That's his one of his best sieves. Okay, nice raid on the side. They're going to be coming in. Villagers getting pounded out. Villager kills going up to four. Vice Bro does react a little bit late. Is going to be in a little bit of danger here. I wouldn't hate maybe some wooden palisades coming over here to try and mitigate this encircling that we are seeing from uh, Quill. And Quill with his villager harass has now amassed a twenty villager lead, which is pretty fat. The army of Joan of Arc is stronger. You can see the military strength of Joan is 33 against 19 of Quill, but Quill is totally happy with this. He's just harassing, and he's going to be going Castle Age here in uh, no time. Yeah, look at that. Saving up 2,000 food, and it looks like he's not going to be using the Culture Wing Advancement. He maybe saves that for Imperial Age, which isn't a bad idea. I'm really curious which age up he's going to do, so we'll be watching closely. Another flank raid coming in for the Dread Camels. The Desert Raiders moving in. They got their swords drawn, and they're going to be butchering these villagers in the base. Vice Bro needs to get some spears over here ASAP. To defend this but overall we do see seven villager kills and that is a lot of casualties going down as the desert raiders are proving their worth man and the thing is like normally you would want to chase down horse archers with horsemen but desert raiders wreck horsemen they can draw their swords they have five melee armor and then they can get in there and go fisticuffs and uh, cause a lot of havoc but we're going to need to see a castle uh castle age here quickly from vice pro so he's going to need to start banking as uh, we do see the tower garrisoned and uh the wooden palisades are now coming down here so the wooden palisades very very good call that harass and encircling has been very obnoxious as far as the age up goes we do see the advancement okay so he did opt to go for the cheaper age up which leaves him with a ton of resources and now this is where it's going to get really crazy we're probably going to see a ghoulon push so we see the first uh, barracks coming out and obviously we're going to see crossbowmen following up perhaps as well and the wall off is done all right cool stuff indeed this might be the opportunity for joan of arc to attack i mean we are going to be seeing the rapid age up though man that is such a fast age up here from the iobids what is it 40 percent faster that is nuts that is like almost twice as fast a couple villagers going to get picked so joan of arc going to be equalizing the play playing field a little bit and doing some uh, vill kills of their own and i don't know why that didn't show in the bottom when it, as it pertains to villager kills see how it didn't show that maybe it did oh it did show it up top okay so it's four villager kills got it i was just reading the ui I'm not used to casting with the CUI, so I'm going to be learning it with you guys as well. Yeah, these guys can build CG units too if you have the military wing tech. So if you get the military wing tech, which is the um, the reinforcement, it allows you to uh, build siege weapons with your camels. So the camels get their little little feet and basically build uh, manjuniques and various siege pieces, which is fun. So Joan of Arc pressuring in, I like this. You know, Joan's got a, a substantially bigger army, so you got to capitalize on this. Some siege engineering, I think, would be very prudent as well to try and get uh, some Ramstein pressure. But yeah, good to be going for the TC. We do see Quill uh, probably going to be pumping out Ghulams very rapidly. So we do see the Ghulams coming out. And uh, yeah, there is a double racks here. So the army quality is going to start massively improving for Quill. So this is basically Vice Bro's opportunity to get back in this game. If, if Vice Bro can get in, maybe take down a TC, uh, you know, get some villager damage here. Probably should send like a French Knight over to the west to go scout the corner, see what's going on here. And now the Camel Legion is going to be coming in, and the Desert Raiders are now veterans. So it's going to be kind of scary here. But yeah, you gotta you gotta do some damage here, 100. percent So archers need to turn and fight. And honestly, the spearmen should probably fight as well. But the archers wreck those camels. It is so much work. Royal Knight in there. Joan of Arc obviously doing some substantial DPS as well. And that is a very nice play by Vice Bro. Vice Bro dragging down the TC there, getting a little bit of revenge. But those Ghulams are going to be tough. And the best way to deal with the Ghulams for Joan of Arc would be to use the uh, arrow. Just use that, that holy arrow, whatever the hell it's called, divine arrow to pick them off because it'll go right through their armor and do that divine damage. Okay, really, really nice play there. That was clean. Able to push uh, Quill back. We do see the forces of Vice Bro moving in and nice dual prong terrace as well as the Royal Knights are going to be doing some nice villager damage here to help equalize this game. Now, do we see the age up from the French? Uh, the French look like they're kind of all in on this push, which it's going to be very, very hard to finish Quill here. I think with the TC and the home field advantage of production, it's going to be a tough one. But Joan of Arc is still doing good damage, and there are a lot of villager kills. We see Joan's champions 
uh, which are quite strong. And they actually do bonus damage against Spearmen, which is a really nice energy with France, doing some uh, good DPS against the Vils in the back. But the Desert Raiders do draw their swords and are diving onto the archers. But overall, Joan of Arc's forces are holding well. The Ghulams, though, are starting to get into uh, a certain kind of mass of numbers where I think Joan of Arc is going to have problems dealing with them. She's getting a lot of experience here, though, for sure. And looking at the villager kills, we do see 15 villager kills here for the French. So this might be the time when the French player is going to want to pull back and make sure Joan of Arc doesn't die because she's expensive to resurrect and, uh, you know, get that going. Lone Spearman harassed right there. Joan of Arc going to be pulling back. The TC has gone down. I believe Quill now is on one TC. French Knight's diving into the base. And we do see 18 villager kills here for Joan of Arc, but she has to be really careful not to go down here. That is a lot of gold to resurrect her. I think it's like around 300 or 250 at this point. And uh, old Joan, though, still farming experience wherever she can. And I think we are going to be seeing a retreat from the French and an age up to castle because the French player really just helps kind of bring the villager count closer together. But we do see the Ghulams uh, starting to get a little bit crunk. They are getting a solid critical mass. And if the French don't have any castle age tech, they're going to have a hard time dealing with them. We do see a big palisade coming down in the front for Vice Bro. And uh, overall, great match between these two mighty champions. They're both playing very, very well here. I'm loving this, man. Joan on the run, two charges of her sniper ability, could definitely turn around and pick off that horseman if she wanted to. Could probably actually just take all three of these units if she decides that's going to be in the game plan. But the Ghulam Swarm is on the way, and that's probably what we're going to be seeing uh, here as we do see the uh, third Golden Age being reached, which gives you production speed of 20%. The second TC being built by the Ayubids, and now we do see the big, big defense. The Feudal Age French Knights can fight the Ghulams to an extent, but it's certainly not the easiest thing in the world. And now the archer is going to be fighting at the Palisades, but yeah, those Ghulams are jacked. They are pissed. They got their double attacks, and they're going to be absolutely wrecking those spearmen. It's going to be a massive karate chop. But Joan of Arc using a big AoE heal. We see villagers being pulled into combat here. Certainly desperate times. Oh my god. So this is a little bit of Bronzodia here. We do see, like, a ton. Look at all the units queued up here. Uh, as a matter of fact, if Ice Bro were to cut, like, half these units he's got queued up at a school of cavalry, it's probably a bit of a panic. You know, he's in a tense situation, so it's easy to overlook that. But um, he would have, like, almost enough to age up if he canceled a lot of those. And we do see a lot of production coming out here. Archer's going after the Ghulams. Uh, will Joan of Arc be able to hold Joan of Arc a little bit surrounded? She's got to get back. She's surrounded by the Ghulams. And it looks like she is going to end up going down here, which is going to be very tough. And the Royal Institute is now coming out for the French up on the high ground, which is going to get them to the Castle Age. And I think overall they will barely hold on, but... Hopefully, um, for his sake, he will realize. Okay, Joan instantly gets resummoned, or maybe just was on a respawn timer. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but she's going to go down immediately again. But in the back, we do see the Ghulams still just duking it out, causing massive havoc. TC doing some nice work. I do think the French will just barely stabilize here. Looking at the eco damage, it's not that much more. It's about 22 overall. And up on the top side, the French are going to be holding, and they will be reaching Castle Age as well. So good hold there for sure. Um, hopefully, for Vice Bro's sake, he realizes how many units he has queued up here. Uh, he would have been able to age up much earlier if he had noticed this, but alas, we will see. Joan will be back in due time. Uh, obviously, got a little bit chaotic there, so she did fall in the uh, kind of uh, heat of the moment. The forces of Joan of Arc probably going to want to push out here. We do see the cab charging, so the knights move out and do start butchering down some of the villagers. So overall, this could be a nice little find. Uh, you know, lowering the villager count is always nice. But currently, Quill is going pretty bananas on production. Quill has almost 100 villagers, whereas the French are sitting at about 70, which isn't terrible, but obviously it's substantial less. The big wooden palisade is down. Decent, healthy farm eco back here. Wood probably needs to be updated, and we will see if you got the Mameluke upgrade. Yes, so the Ayubids have a unique upgrade uh, at their blacksmith, which gives them movement speed when they kill enemy units. It's really rad for chasing down archers and you know, obviously hero characters like Joan of Arc, but I don't think that they got that. So upgrades coming in for the French. We do see the Spearmen being upgraded to veteran. Uh, archers and knights not yet being upgraded. That's obviously going to be a pretty big priority as more and more Ghulams come out. You're going to need to see some Arbalists. I think that's going to be the play. Uh, you're just going to want to spam those bad boys out because they can counter the Ghulams, which are obviously the unit preference here for Quill in this battle. And we do see Spring Alt Towers being set up in the front. So Quill doing a very, very nice job taking map control. He's got these towers, which is going to be securing the middle pass and the sacred site. And obviously he's going to have free range of these relics if he wants it. So Vice Bro setting up a defensive uh, Palisade perimeter which will potentially keep the uh, the old Ayubids from getting into the base. Eco looking okay for both players. Um, Quill currently does have the stronger Eco, though. 1,500 food a minute compared to about 1,100 for Vice Bro here. And now the Ramstein is coming. So this could be the end of the French. They're going to want to get their Knights upgraded for sure. The fact that they're not being upgraded yet is certainly a little bit tough. Arbalists coming out, and uh, good. Arbalists are your saving grace. But you need, you need, you absolutely need this upgrade. The uh, Oh, he got it. Okay, the Gambesons. That's the one that gives them five melee armor, if I'm not mistaken, unless they changed that. Did he get the upgrade? Oh, does Joan of Arc not actually have that upgrade? 
Huh, interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Again, I'm still learning all this as well, so bear with me, my friends. Ramsteins and Duhas coming in. We do see the battering ram pushing up as uh, Vice Bro is going to be sallying forth to do battle. The knights move in initially and uh, are able to drag down some of the camels. Crossbows, of course, doing nice DPS as well. Could send these knights to maybe go deal with the ram initially, but overall, the ghoul on front line is probably going to be able to overwhelm the French defenders in the front, but the French do have some nice reinforcements coming out and uh, are getting a nice mass of these uh, crossbows. And Joan of Arc, the champion of the people, has returned. And now she's going to start using her Divine Arrow to pick off some of these units. And she does call in her champions. You know, Joan immediately summons these, uh, these, these champs, which are pretty rad. I believe they have some sort of... Uh, there was some sort of weird buff going down from them as well. But overall, the French defender is able to rally and push back the forces of the Ayubids. But the Ayubid army is going to be folding with the Valiant Defense of Joan of Arc. And you guys better watch out. Joan of Arc is going to be getting a shotgun soon. She's going to be riding around on her horse with a giant uh, hand cannon. And what's really cool about the next Joan of Arc age up is the fact that she gets uh, a cannon summon, so she can summon cannons, which is just so incredibly powerful. Because, like, you know, you got a couple annoying towers in front of your base, okay, they're dealt with. You know, it's, it's just such good utility for sure. Sounds sounds good, Gunhound. Um, I will take care of that as soon as the game is casted, and if it's something that you can deal with, feel free to make a judgment on it. So do let me know, my friend. On the other side, the Battering Ram going to town on the School of Cavalry right here. And uh, School of Cavalry should be fine, as long as those guys uh, end up finishing the ram, and it looks like they're going to. A little bit of counter-pushing going back and forth, as we do see the towers putting some good, consistent DPS on this French army. Quill sending for you, uh, for units forward, just pretty much as they come out. And now the Dervishes are here. So if you haven't seen Dervishes, these are the unique religious unit for the Ayubids. They do AoE healing, and when they have a relic, they heal even more, which is pretty cool. But it's kind of like Roos in the sense that you have a very fast unit that can go out and uh, catch those old relics on the map. Thank you for joining. Yes, yes. Somebody in chat says, if he queues Gambesons in Royal Institute, it doesn't show in the archery range. Got it. So he got the Gambesons upgrade from, from his Royal Institute. That's what it was. It's very strange to see the Royal Institute. You know, I'm so used to seeing the, uh, I'm so used to seeing Guildhall from FFA, but here you can get cheaper upgrades from any age, basically, which is really nice for the French if you want to do like Castle Age timings and things like that. Yeah, Relic's being grabbed by Quill. Quill is going to be building a Mandranique, which is a unique... Uh, artillery piece, a unique mangonel here for the Ayubids. It can go incendiary, which does like bigger AoE, uh, or it can go just straight damage with its kine kinetic attack, which is uh, very, very neat indeed. Fun times. Fun times, man. All right, so the Manjanique's going to be cruising up and starting to put a little bit of siege pressure on the French. French going to be responding with siege workshops. We already see a combination of rams, and I would wager we will soon see uh, Spring Alts coming out to deal with these. As soon as you see the Manjaniques, it's going to be like, okay, it's getting real now. Look at that. That actually does quite a bit. Yeah, those farms getting melted there with those uh, those AoE shots. That ain't bad at all. I mean, taking down four farms, like that's uh, 75, 150. Yeah, that's like uh, like over 300 wood. Not bad at all. Ayubid's up, starting to get crossbowmen. The crossbowmen going to be able to hard counter these men-at-arms as they do try and dive the Manjanique. I don't think diving is going to be the solution here. We're going to need to see some old Spring Alts. But there is going to be some do hosting come out as the battering rams from the siege workshops are going to be the choice to try and knock down these towers in the front. Quill taking massive map control right now and grabbing the sacred sites as well. Very, very nasty stuff. And probably has already gotten three relics. Yeah, we see another relic being grabbed by these dervishes showing why he is a Conqueror 3 player as this dervish is going to be bringing this back across and dropping it off back in the base. Manjanique set up in the front. Still sieging the old French base. The French looking a little bit nervous here. Joan of Arc is now shotgun of Arc. All right. So she can now, um, she can increase the attack speed of nearby units, which is really powerful. But more importantly, um, she can summon a cannon, which is just so heavy metal. And she hits like a truck too. I believe her hand cannon, yeah, it's like 36 and it does plus 200 damage for its building. So Joan of Arc can blast down buildings too. She is uh, an absolute raid boss and uh, hands down one of my favorite variant civs to uh, play. Overall, just like, yeah, I mean, I've been playing Joan a lot in ranked 1v1 and uh, she's great. A little bit of a camel raid on the other side. Joan of Arc could be coming across with her hand cannon, helping to deal with these units. How did the camels get in? Looks like they knocked down the walls on the far side and were able to find a way in. Nice spring alt play. We do see two spring alts coming in here for Vice Bro, and he is able to immediately pick off three of these Manjaniques, or at least two of them. Third one's probably going to go down here, and do they rip the shot? They don't, and they are going to overextend forward and give Quill uh, a freebie, which is unfortunate. But at the very least, two Manjaniques did go down for two spring alts, which isn't the worst trade in the world. School of Cavalry under a lot of pressure. Is there going to be an age up for the Ayubids? Uh, it looks like the military wing is producing right now. Yes, so the military wing uh, is going to be producing seven Desert Raiders every two minutes for the rest of the game. And then cavalry units can make siege. So it is going to be a military tech here. As the French rally forth, Joan of Arc going to be summoning a cannon here relatively soon. We can see the two arms. So perhaps the cannon will come out. That would be uh, very, very nice for not only sniping this Manjanique, but also for dealing with the outpost as well. 
Up in the front, Joan of Arc going to be moving forward. The Mass Crossbow Legion kiting very effectively, but obviously the Arbalists and Archers will be pretty good against them. Villagers popped out trying to uh, stop the Rams, and they're doing a pretty good job of doing that. Joan of Arc should probably call in her cannon right now and just start blasting. She's getting a lot of experience, obviously, but um, overall she is in the place she wants to be. Camel Lancers are the next call-in. The cannon is out, and it does take down the tower, which actually had five Camel Lancers in it. I don't know if Quill noticed that, but there was five Camel Lancers in that tower there, which is pretty funny. And they do dive in and take it down. And now Quill is going to be going for the kill, bringing in uh, all of these uh, outposts and most likely equipping them with a combination of Spring Alds. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Vice Pro tap out right now. Uh, his army size is one, literally nothing right now. And uh, Quill is just full momentum. Just going full born to the base. And Joan of Arc probably is going to be falling today. But man, that was a great match. Really, really well played to both players. Um, you know, Vice Pro having to fight, you know, a Conqueror 3 player. I don't know about his level himself, but he played very, very well here. I'm, I'm impressed with him. So Dervishes are actually bringing the Relics because with the Relics, they heal 50% faster. And they do AoE healing, which is just bananas. The Camels have gotten into the base here, and uh, they are going to be tearing apart the Villagers. Up on the top side, Royal Institute, you know, it's it's there. It does have the, uh, the cool upgrades, but not going to be saving him, and uh, that is going to be GG well played. Surprised he hasn't tapped out yet. This game looks pretty damn over. His villager count is tanking, and Quill is doing the ceremonial, uh, <laughs> the ceremonial low, low, low in the base, just chanting his prayers. And you can see the TC can't even do enough DPS to drag down these dervishes, which are just uh, absolute menaces. Are we going to be seeing some siege equipment coming in, or is it just going to be the slow grind? We do see school cavalry going down, dervishes just waddling around. Camel lancers basically just farming units uh, as they come out, or excuse me, the desert raiders. And now it is Imperial Age for Quill. So Quill is Imperial Age. He has cross map trade as well. Just an absolute machine. While attacking, while pressuring, he's just doing so much, man. He's doing so much, and you can really see why he uh, is the rank he is. So tower's being garrisoned up. The camels are going to be rampaging through the backfield. <laughs> the dervishes are hunting the villagers. Are they going to try and wolo low the villagers? I think that's what's happening here. I think the dervishes are trying to get them with a wolo. <laughs> oh my god, dude. He's just hunting them down. Now back at the base here, we do see the dervishes as well as camel lancers uh, getting through. A desperate tower coming in. You know, I like the fighting spirit here of uh, Vice Bro, but his... He, the man, Quill is at 153 eco, which is just such overkill. Obviously, um, but at this point, he's just got the victory and uh, he's got tower set up. He can pretty much do whatever he wants here. Quill also does have 2,000 stone. He could do a keep drop in the base, any number of different uh, threats for sure. But um, that probably is going to be it for old uh, Vice Bros. He tries to re-garrison. More camels arrive. The dervishes in the back of the base are uh, flying around. Yeah, no blacksmith upgrades, I believe, for Quill, which is a little bit strange. Obviously, in the heat of the moment, he might have... Uh, yeah, he realized it. So double blacksmith coming out right as we talk smack, which is really funny, but... Uh, yeah, he does have that now on the way and is going to be getting some upgrades. A, a true flex that he does not need blacksmith upgrades to uh, do well for himself here. But yeah, Joan of Arc is basically dead in the water. Um, again, surprised he hasn't left yet. And there, he's got like four horsemen here, which are trying to hunt down these dervishes, maybe get some relics, who knows. But it's just a matter of time until the camels burn down the entire base. And do we see siege workshops coming up? We do not. Random houses being built over here for Vice Pro. He literally has 160 eco against 58 guys, which is just absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. Nanny destroyed your soul in the tournament. Hey, you know, it's all good. You played, and that's, you, you, you know, you put your hat in the ring and you played. It's a good experience, and, uh, you know, you can go back and review your mistakes and go from there. How many of you guys in chat are playing in the tournament? How you guys doing? Who won? Who's winning their games? GG, well played. Victory for Quill in round one. The Ayubids with the uh, scary camel pressure, the camel harass, was able to do quite well against old Joan of Arc. That was a good match, though. There was, there was moments where both players were in a good position for sure. All right, so a little bit of adminning. Let me check this. All right. Uh, perfect. So Westerly, uh, that's good. As long as he advanced. That was a, that was a good one. It's a good match. GG. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that one. All right. So now I'm going to go to the web, uh, website, take a look at the brackets, and we will find another match to cast here. So let us go ahead and jump on over to our tournament and see how this looks. So let's go bracket. And we have uh, Inko winning round one, OG Khan winning round one, Phil winning round one. Inizio, Nani Yori was able to win as well. Load uh, Tucker. Yeah, a lot of people winning their first round games. So we have a Delhi match. Delhi versus, uh, well, that could be a fun one as well. All right, let's go find another game to cast. It's a lot of fun, man. I love not having to wait in between games. That's probably one of my favorite elements of this. All right, so it's friend request and cool. So let's go find a match. I don't know what they're playing. Uravity is playing today as well. 
Um, but we'll save a gravity game for a little bit later. There's Mongols here. You guys want to see some Delhi action? I think we need some Delhi action in our life. Let's cast an Allied Trex game. He was Conqueror 1 last season too, so it's going to be Delhi versus the Ayubids here in this uh, second round match. So we get another Ayubid game. They seem to be pretty popular. All right, baby. Let's get it going. Round two. Let the good times roll. All right. So one sec here, let me just get all the settings squared away and let's go into the old caster mode. They just started this game, they're like two minutes into the game. So the deli shop is here, baby. All right, so here we are, everything looks good and showtime. Spawning in on the west side of the map, it's gonna be our very own allied Trex, the Dark Lord of the Delhi. And he is going to be bringing his people to their glory here in this tournament. Uh, I believe he did reach Conquer 1 at the end of last season. So congrats to him on that. Over on the east side, it is going to be another Ayubid player. It's going to be Kirk Salvatore. So Kirk has been playing in our FFA matches. I believe I've seen him several times. So we're going to be seeing how he does against Allied here as we do have the Ayubid versus Delhi Sultanate duel. So today's tournament, the match is our best of one. It's a more casual tournament format. Um, eventually, we will do best of threes and whatnot. But um, for today, we're just going to be starting off with the old... Uh, Best of ones, just to keep it simple. I think it's a good casual format, and it's a little bit easier to get into when you don't have to worry about picks and bans and all that stuff. So we can take some questions from chat as well. How is Byzantines falling into the meta? I don't know yet. It's a little bit too early, and honestly, I'm just now getting back into casting 1v1 games, so I'm not like super, super, um, you know, I'm not super on point with the meta yet. But all in due time. So obviously, Delhi's going to be rushing out the efficient production, so setting up their mosque. If you guys don't know how Delhi works, maybe you're a little bit newer to Age of Empires, I'll give you a very topical overview of how they work. Basically, the Delhi Sultanate gets free technology. Um, obviously, it takes a long time to research, but the more scholars that you put in your mosque buildings, the faster that research goes. So that's kind of the basic gist of the Delhi Sultanate. They're unique units. They do have the tower elephants as well as the basic elephants and the sultan tower elephants, I believe is what they're called. Uh, they're the ones that have the shotguns on their back from the Imperial Age. They have the Ghazi Riders, which are horsemen in the Feudal Age, which are amazing. They do, uh, they do anti-heavy damage, so they're pretty good against like men at arms and things like that. And also, uh, yeah, just great in general. So, jelly's very fun. They also get a perk from uh, berry bushes, so they uh, they like the uh, abbasids, uh, like their berry bushes. So they're going to be swarming those. And now, what are we going to be seeing from old Kirk and the Ayubids? And for the next game, I'll make sure to cast a game without the Ayubids. We'll try and give you guys as diverse of a range of factions as we possibly can today. But here we do see uh, the different advancements. I wonder if we're going to be seeing the same strategy. That seems very strong. The, uh, the wood, getting the free wood. I have seen some high level players do growth as well, which gives you plus three villagers as soon as it finishes. But I do like that wood one a lot. That seems like a really nice strategy. And obviously we saw Quill do it. And Quill was able to get a nice lead on his opponent by using that. So I'm certainly going to be taking some notes and uh, copying old Quill's build that I saw previously. Uh, is anyone playing Order of the Dragon today? That's a good question. Um, overall, Order of the Dragon, I think there might have been one Order of the Dragon player. I'm not sure if they're still in the event or if they got eliminated in the first round, but overall, we'll do it. So, by the way, um, one of the ways that AoE4 Tavern is going to work, our tournament website for this game, is that the leaderboard is going to be the, the tool through which I invite people to, like, faction wars. So individuals who are on the top eight, I'm going to be doing faction wars where they can pick a champion faction. And we're going to have a one day stream with eight players where uh, they represent their champion and we're going to have a big prize pool. And the individual who wins that tournament is going to get sent like a unique banner. Um, we're going to do a lot of neat stuff. So make sure to stay tuned for updates on the channel with all that. All right. Curious what a future Delhi Specialist faction would be. Yeah, you know, there's certainly variant civ options for a lot of these bad boys. Like, I can see the Mongols getting some really cool variant civs. I think it's going to be fun. Gritty, thanks for becoming a member. Welcome, welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. And I greatly appreciate your support. So the Tower of Victory is going to be the choice here for Allied Trex. And what this does is enables Tower of Victory, Mosques, and Madrasas to increase the attack spite of infantry by 20% when produced within their influence. So if you have a mosque and then a bunch of barracks surrounding it, all the infantry coming out of the barracks are going to have 20% attack speed. So, you know, Allied, I would say I have probably battled Allied more than anybody in our community. Uh, him and I always spawn next to each other in FFAs and we end up just battling. It's just, it's just like... You know, tide goes in, tide comes out. It's just inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, and he is the Dark Lord of Men-at-Arms. He loves, loves, loves using Men-at-Arms. He just always is swarming them. It's his go-to. Men-at-Arms and Elephants is the usual army comp. For better or for worse. Wheelbarrows coming out. Delhi getting that free tech is very, very nice. And nobody's going to be trying to get these uh, fish 
in the middle. Obviously, it's just two fish, so it's not really worth investing in. But you can send some villagers over there, like two or three villagers to go harvest those if you want to. Not a terrible idea. Uh, as far as sacred sites on the map, there are two sacred sites. That's very nice for Delhi. We do have one sacred site here and one on the other side. And the age up. Oh, he actually ended up going for a trade. One of the trade wings. Okay, so he went for the trade wing upgrade, which gives him access to the Bedouin swordsman as well as the Bedouin skirmisher. So he can immediately hire these bad boys, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't know if it's immediate, but we'll watch. And he can hire those. Okay, that's that's a curious change of pace here. We're going to be seeing a Bedouin style build. So lumber camp going down, no stone being gathered. Are we going to be seeing some sort of interesting early aggression? That is the question. So Bedouin swordsmen, what do they do? They have short swords and they do plus three damage against melee. So if they're fighting uh, men at arms or spearmen, uh, they're going to be able to trade pretty effectively into those. As far as allied goes, allied going to be popping out a stable. Delhi typically goes fast castle. Um, Delhi is very good at getting relics because they, they typically have their um, scholars as soon as they reach castle age so they can go pop out and get relics. And also they like to go fast castle because their keeps are cheaper with the compound of the defender and then they can produce villagers from their keeps and that's where they get their big economic boom, right? So Kirk is going to be going for the House of Wisdom for the uh, for the mercenary tech. Yeah, you can hire traders as well. You can exchange 125 for two traders and it could get a really sweet trade route. But Allied is, is spying this. He's looking around, and yes, now we see more uh, Bedouin swordsmen coming out as well as Bedouin skirmishers. What do the skirmishers do? They do bonus damage against light infantry. Okay, so that can deal with a multitude of threats for sure. Now, considering he's investing in this early military, he needs to go harass. He needs to head over and attack Allied. If he lets Allied just do whatever he pleases, he's going to have a really, really bad time. Um, uh, what other kind of play are we going to be seeing? We do see the double broad axe coming out, so going to be searching for some good old wood here. That's what she said. For Allied, uh, we are going to be seeing the free upgrades coming out of the Blacksmith. So Siege Engineering is going to be the first choice here. I don't know if Allied just clicks that or if his actual intent is to get in there and uh, and actually Ramstein his opponent. Very interesting. A lot of villagers being idled here. Um, looks like they're going to be setting up a tower. Okay, makes sense. The Ghazi Rider is going to be forced back here as the Bedouin Swordsman and the old uh, Skirmishers stand at the ready, General. All right, all right. So remember also something to take into account in the earlier rounds of this tournament, we are going to be seeing potentially a big discrepancy in skill levels. I don't know if that's the case here in this game, but you know, some of the players might be newer, you know, having to play high level players. So obviously cut him a break as it pertains to that stuff. I don't know about Kirk's experience, although he's looking pretty good economically. He does have 30 villagers compared to his opponent who is a uh, rocking ye old 25. So where are the skirmishers going? It looks like they're heading down this way. Um, maybe doing a little bit of scouting. Maybe he thought he saw a ghost over there. Not sure. But we are going to be seeing the Ghazi Riders jumping into the line here. Maybe going to get a little bit of damage. Overall, Allied uh, does get one villager kill. Not bad. And the villagers do jump into the tower. And those uh, skirmisher units are going to be coming back. So maybe they saw something over there. I don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, the Javelins should be able to put some uh, supporting damage down. And uh, those horsemen should be pushed back here. But overall, good raid by Allied to help equalize the old uh, count here as Allied is probably going to be approaching Castle Age soonish. Nope, he's actually going for the early kill. So he's going to be getting Ghazi Riders as well as Archers. The Siege Engineering was not a mistake. Uh, he is legitimately going for the kill here. And we're going to see if the Bedouin are going to be able to hold this back. This is going to be a nasty amount of pressure. Obviously, Allied has been practicing quite a bit in the previous seasons and uh, was Conqueror 1 last season. So this is going to be some high-level pressure. And uh, we're going to see if the old Bedouin are going to be able to uh, take that. He might have been going to guard the Relics for sure. Maybe expecting Fast Castle from Allied. Siege Engineering has finished. Are we going to be seeing the construction? Allied immediately grabbing the Sacred Sites, which is really, really nice. So that's just a power play. And considering the Ayubids are kind of forced back into their base a little bit, um, Allied does get both of those sites. Very, very good, man. He, he gets the goodies. That's going to be a ton of gold. On top of that, we already see a Battering Ram coming up. The Bedouin Swordsmen coming out and are going to be chopping down some of the archers that are trying to build this. Javelin Throwers uh, also supporting, but I think the Bedouin Swordsmen probably going to get cut down here. They do Prison Shank down one archer, and another archer is going to be going down to the Skirmishers, but overall, he's going to need a lot more a lot more than that. Okay, he's doing a Fast Castle. Okay. So Kirk is going fast castle. That's why he wasn't really building too much. So he does have the blacksmith as well as uh, barracks. And it's Ghulam in time, ladies and gentlemen. He's just going to be spamming Ghulams. I was wondering why he wasn't building too much. We do see an arrow tower in placement here, but Allied's going to be coming in with the ram relatively shortly. And Allied is for sure massively ahead in this game. Considering all the free gold he's getting from these uh, sacred sites, it's going to start compounding really, really heavily here against Kirk, who uh, obviously is just barely maintaining his economic lead. He's on one TC, though. But yeah, he did the rapid age up here. So that's going to come. We see the blacksmith, which means we're probably going to see the upgrades for the Ghulams. And it's, it's Ghulam in time. 
I, I suspect we're just going to be seeing Ghoulams upon Ghoulams upon Ghoulams. But Allied's gold is going to get pretty bananas. Currently, you can see he's at 250 a minute. His food income isn't bad either. And now the age up is complete. And we do start to see the Ghoulams coming out. So it is going to be the triple production here from these barracks. A little bit of farm eco being established as well. And yeah, we're going to see if he can hold. Ram's coming in. Villagers could be pulled to torch that down. Some good control. You could grab all 13 of these villagers and kill this Ram before Allied even reacts. Uh, but I think Allied is happy to pull back as well and just kind of take advantage of his gold here. We'll see. We will see. Some turn after getting submitted a ton in training. Yeah, yeah, it's a good time. Uh, it's always a good time. Gotta love some jujitsu. You know, just gotta avoid those damn injuries, man. It's brutal. All right, so the Ghoulams are now moving forward. They're probably going to be able to mitigate this raid, but the question is how much uh, eco damage are we going to be seeing from Allied? So, yeah, like, honestly, these two Ghoulams are probably going to be able to deal with all these units. Depending on the micro, the archers could scoot and shoot, but Allied seeing this will probably pull back, and I would wager that he is going to be going for uh, just Castle H himself and getting some fat Dumbos and some elephants. Where are these villagers going now? It looks like they're just kind of pulling back from the conflict. The Ghoulam trying to battle the horsemen there, but we're going to need more and more of those bad boys. We do see them surging out. Spearmen as well. Uh, probably a bit of a misclick there. Maybe he didn't have the resources. And now stone is going to be gathered. Maybe for a second TC, but what I suspect in this situation is going to be a keep. I think he wants to keep there. Denver, how you doing, man? Welcome to the channel, and thank you for becoming a channel member. Greatly appreciate you, my friend. All right, Ghulam's moving in, trying to fight off the Delhi, but you know, I didn't even think of this. The Ghazi Riders do do bonus damage against Heavy, so they trade surprisingly well against. I mean, it's only plus two, but that does add up with each attack. Uh, so they trade surprisingly well against these bad boys. And we do see the Delhi Scholars able to outheal a lot of the DPS, which is very nasty. You have to remember, Allied is also pretty close to a Sacred Victory. Uh, he's only seven minutes away, and uh, it doesn't seem like the Ayubids are in a position where they can really mitigate this. Up on the north side, we do see uh, both sacred sites being taken. Allied is going to be going for the compound of the defender here. Uh, I hope we see a keep drop. That would be that would be a power fantasy realized. So we perhaps could see that. The Ghulam's uh, starting to get some progress in the pushback here. But the Ram is still penetrating into the base relatively effectively. Uh, not seeing any of the Bedouins being hired or the skirmishers. Uh, looking at Kirk's bank, his gold is very, very low. But the Ghulam's are able to fend off the attack. But uh, unfortunately for him... Allied is now Castle Age, or at least will be right now. He's going to grab probably three or four relics. He's got both sacred sites generating him just a ton of gold. And uh, I think that's going to be the end of the road here as we do see the Scholar pulling back here. In the meantime, Archer shooting. This Chad Ghulam does have a ranged armor upgrade and is hanging in there. And uh, yeah, the battle continues, man. Continues indeed. Somebody in chat saying, yeah, I was out for four months and broke my ankle in two places during comp. Yeah, it's, it sucks, man. It sucks. My wife and I were doing jujitsu and she tore her ACL. It's, it's such a like brutal thing like that's like and especially in america with our crappy healthcare system like how much you have to i mean sure the doctors are great but the the money that you have to pay to see said doctors and for like procedures oh my god it's like yeah it's, it's rough it's a it's a rough hobby to have but it's so fun all right farm infrastructure being set up here currently allied has passed him in terms of eco allied is basically massively ahead he's getting about 500 gold a minute Granted, the mining isn't terrible here for the Ayubids either. They're getting a decent amount of gold. But Allied is going to start gobbling up all these relics in the map. And now he's got his own men-at-arms. Is there going to be a keep drop? We do see uh, the stone being gathered. 240 here. Sacred victory in five minutes. The Ayubids are going to need to move out and do some battle here. But yeah, this is, a, this is a good play by Kirk. I don't know about his experience level. Could be a little bit newer to multiplayer. But honestly, the fact that he's fighting and holding off pressure from a Conqueror 1 level player who's playing their main faction, is very, very impressive. I am uh, I'm impressed with this. Where do you sign up for these tournaments? All you have to do is um, is be in my Discord. And then we have a website called aoe4tavern.com, which some of the mods can link to, and all my tournaments will be announced there. I suspect I'll probably do one Age of Empires uh, 1v1 tournament a week, um, just standard 1v1s, and the Sacred Site does get decap, so that is going to be buying some time. Allied, in the meantime, getting the Village Fortresses upgrade, so this one's really rad. It basically makes it so all of your keeps can uh, act as town centers, and it's a really nice way for Delhi to go fast castle while also having a decent eco. Um, I, I like it a lot. Although his scholar system sucks pretty bad. No uh, scholars really garrisoned up. I think it's because they're going out to gather relics. Allied with a little bit of sloppiness here. He could have grabbed these relics and brought them back to his base quite a bit sooner. Um, he does have a scholar who's deciding to try and tame a wolf out here, and it looks like it's not going too well there. Over on the east side, uh, the Ghulams stand at the ready on the defense. Are more Ghulams being produced? No, a mosque? Let's try and grab some relics, which is good. You want to deny Delhi as many relics as you possibly can. Eco is pretty even for both these players, but Allied is certainly going to be passing him soon, as he is going to be getting the uh, upgrades from the uh, village fortress. And where are these villagers going? It looks like they're going for the stone, maybe going for that food up there. A little bit hard to tell, but time will tell, ladies and gentlemen. 
All right, so Ghulams, they're here. They can make siege equipment. There are some free sheep outside the base that Allied did leave there earlier, so those sheep could be taken. We'll see if they do. Um, looks like these Vils going to be heading back to gold. And the Ghulams going to be heading across the map, maybe to apply a little bit of pressure, a bit of an exploratory mission to see what's going on in the realm. And those uh, spy sheep are continuing to spy and doing all their good stuff. Yeah, injuries in jujitsu are rough. Did your wife get surgery? Yeah, she did. Um, I don't know which one she ended up doing. I, I can shoot me a message in Discord and I can, I can tell you, but... She's doing a lot better now. Um, I think she's about, what, like six? How far out? Like four or five months out of surgery? Maybe a little bit more? She's doing great. You know, she can ride a bike and jog and, you know, do everything. But yeah, in terms of like, you know, doing jujitsu again, it's a little bit scary. Ghulam's getting in there bashing some of the Delhi defenders here. And uh, they do drag down a couple of those units. Ghulam's are very good. They quickly deal a second hit after finishing an attack. So they have a nice little, like, double strike. Some of the better men-at-arms in the game. But Allied's going to be responding with a push of his own on this side. He does have his men-at-arms and crossbows. Coming in and flanking, and a couple of the Ghulam defenders getting ready to do battle. These villagers definitely need to jump in this tower right now to try and help overhaul the sacred site. Uh, probably going to be taken again by Allied. We're not sure. No, it looks like he's not going to do it. And Allied does move into the base, starts torching down the infrastructure. Meanwhile, on the other side, oh, the elephants are here. It is time. So the tower war elephants there, and he's an anti... I mean, the archer one is way better here. It has crossbow shots. Um, this one is designed against cavalry, but he probably just made this simply because he had a stable built already. Relics being brought by by, uh, by allied, so we do see one relic being captured here as the dreaded war elephant defends against the ghoul on pressure. On the other side, allied uh, taking a little bit of damage and uh, spring all tower going down. Gonna be able to probably fend off these units, but not before they get a little bit of a uh, little bit of damage. Allied has kicked, killed six villagers so far. Yellow has only killed one. It looks like he did drag down one villager right there. The eco is pretty even. We don't see a second TC coming out. We do see dervishes being popped though. Dervishes gonna be heading up north to grab the old uh, relics, which is great. Ayubids can go do so much, man. They, the diversity of their strategy, man. It's so rad. Okay, a keep drop coming in, guys. Eight months. All right, that's what I thought. I wasn't sure if it had been that long, but... Am I the final boss of the tourney? Uh, no. Uh, there are players that are better than me in this tournament, for sure. Like, Quill and your Avity are both, I think, Conqueror 3. I usually, when I'm, like, playing, like, towards my best, I'll be, like, you know, mid-Conqueror 1. But, yeah, those guys are better than me. So, yeah, I, I don't think I would win. <laughs> I mean, I, I could take a game off them, perhaps, but statistically, their chances would be better, so... All right. Camels, camels, and camels, desert raiders, and ghulam coming out. But this is going to be the beginning of the end, most likely. We do see the dreaded Delhi keep drop. Their keeps are cheaper, which is rad. If you take a look at the price of their keeps, uh, it is 720 with the compound of the defender. Siege Workshop is really nice there. He can make spring alds and or trebuchets to try and punish the base. And it makes it incredibly difficult to push him out. Bedouin Swordsman being called out here by Kirk. And Kirk played a very good game. I mean, he's having the battle of Conqueror player. So shout out to our boy Kirk. For having the courage to put his hat into the tournament today and uh, honestly is uh, doing great for himself so keep is there crossbow shots the desert raiders coming out to try and do battle and uh, the daca will now resume and uh, i suspect a counterweight trebuchet is going to be the first call in here i'm surprised ally hasn't recaptured this uh, sacred site to put additional pressure on another thing that would be really good for allied since he's got 700 is to build a giant palisade wall on this side of the map to prevent the decap of that just little things like that. And that's something we'll try and do is give, uh, you know, little pieces and parcels of advice as we do cast these games. All right, Casso, during them four months, your videos helped me a lot when stuck in bed with the ankle. So also broke, uh, hey man, dude, please don't feel obliged to donate ever. I really appreciate that, man. And uh, hope to keep getting you through all those uh, times, my friend. Yeah, this is probably GG. Trebuchet's out. Um, we don't see much to defend. A couple desert raiders, they were dealing with Allied who did do a little bit of a night harass in the back so that Lancer was able to get in there, but... Uh, the House of Wisdom's under heavy pressure. There's a lot of the Delhi men at arms under the influence of the Tower of Victory with that 20% attack speed. And that is most likely going to be game blouses here in the second game as the Delhi Sultanate is going to be cackling all the way to the bank, just bathing in gold between the sacred sites and the relics. Allied needs to drop those off. A little bit, a little bit lazy there. He needs to get it in. The last defender is sallying forth. The Camel's trying to do battle with, battle with the War Elephant, but the War Elephant will uh, be able to do good damage back because they, I believe, do they have the, the cavalry keyword? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll have to look at that in a second. So Trebuchet is out. Another uh, Siege Workshop is going to be popping. And as soon as these two landmarks do go down, that is probably going to be game blouses here in this match as we, I believe, can do a little bit of fast forwarding since we're not at the live game right now. Sacred Site being captured. The second Treb has popped out. And that is going to be baptizing this House of Wisdom in the old Delhi uh, fashion. Sacred Site's also taken. Defender's coming out, trying to rally forth. But once again, Ally just has a superior army. And that is going to be game over. All right, man. That was fun. Shermster, I've always wanted to try that. I've always wanted to try that. It's been a power fantasy to do the medieval martial arts, but honestly, it just looks like it mostly becomes judo. All right, Allied, you know, good, well played to Kirk, you know. 
I don't think he has maybe the same amount of experience as Allied has in 1v1 based on what I saw, but he honestly did a good job fighting back. So shout out to you, man. Denver, thank you for the 25. Great content and community. Keep up the awesome work. We will. We will. GG to both of those players. All right. So let's take a look at the old brackets now, see how we're hanging. Let's refresh this. All right. So over to the tournament. Um, you can see aoe4tavern.com. It's not fully finished yet. Like I don't have all the graphics up and everything, but you can see we have a leaderboard, which is going to be keeping track of wins and losses as people play. And individuals who are high up on the leaderboard are going to get invites to special events and things like that. So very, very fun stuff. Very fun stuff indeed. You guys ready for me to lose the gravity? Oh, I think we might need to catch that. That's Mongols versus Delhi. Uh, you know, maybe we'll do a different matchup though. But you can see we have a leaderboard here. And oh, by the way, Allied, if you go, if you go to your profile in the top right section of the website, you can unlock avatars. So we have an entire avatar system here. Um, you can, if you win five games with Delhi Sultanate, you will unlock um, like a Ghazi Rider. If you win 20 games with Delhi, you get a War Elephant um, and you can put it next to your picture here. So Allied, if you could actually go test that for me, go to the top right and unlock, you should have unlocked at least the Spearman avatar. One win gives you a Spearman um, as a basic unit. So again, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's good. So looking down here, we do have some matches. All right, cool. The tournament's progressing well. We have Quill versus Newman here and Nani Yori versus Anisio. Let's go cast Nani Yori's game. That could be a lot of fun. We'll uh, go see what they're up to. All right, all right. Mountain Dew drinking night. I know it's pretty great. It's our, it's our community. Yes, yes. That's uh, That leaderboard is for our tournament. So it's only going to keep track of the tournament games. Yeah. All right. So looking here. And scrolling down here, we've got a lot of good matches to cast. A lot of choices. Where art thou? Quill is playing Ayubids. We've already done that. I don't know what Nanny is playing, but we're gonna we're gonna see if we can find that match. Alright, and let's observe. Oh man, it's so it's so nice to be able to just jump into matches. Okay, we got the Japanese versus Joan of Arc here in this match. This is a matchup we haven't really had yet today, I don't think. For tournament games hosted by turn, yeah. So we're gonna have other hosts too. Anybody in our community that you know wants to can also uh, potentially host. This is so much smoother than the Warhammer Three tourneys. I know it's it's a whole different beast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, spawning in on the north side of the map, it is going to be our mighty champion of Japan, and that is going to be Prime. Prime, of course, doing very well in many of our FFA matches. Immediately building a house next to the berry bushes, which is uh, because it's a farmhouse. The Japan's houses also serve as uh, resource drop-off points for food, which is great. And yes, Japan, probably my favorite city to play so far of all the new stuff in tandem with Joan of Arc. On the south side, it is going to be Joan of Arc and Annie or Joan of Arc immediately building a house and getting to farming and harvesting some of the sheep. So that is how she levels up in the early ages. She can, uh, you know, just farm and do all the peasant stuff and enjoy her best life. Yes, yes. So Joan of Arc... Again, we talked about her a little bit earlier. She builds things faster. She heals out of combat, and she can also level up by doing, you know, combat, hunting boars, taking sacred sites, killing enemy units. You guys get the picture. But very excited to see what route Nani Ori takes. It's always fun to see the little RPG element of Joan of Arc. All right, let's go into caster mode. What are we doing here? Let's quit messing around, man. That's right. So another thing about Japan, if you guys haven't seen them in action, one of their unique mechanics is the fact that when, when Japan harvests gold, uh, a percentage of that gold is given to them as stone and vice versa. So if you're gathering stone, you get a little bit of gold. If you're gathering gold, you get a little bit of stone. And the reason being is that you need to be able to upgrade your centralized economy, your daimyo manor. So Japan does not have any upgrades that increase their food harvesting rate uh, far away from their TCs. The only way that Japan's going to get increased food harvesting rate is through their daimyo system. So they can upgrade their uh, manor to a daimyo manor, eventually a palace, and then a shogunate castle. Initially, each tier is 25, 25% uh, upgrade. So it goes 25, 50, and 75% for everyone within this big radius nearby. But we don't see the radius quite yet, but it's a little bit less than the uh, arrow range, if I'm not mistaken. But So typically what Japan does is they build a very, very centralized um, uh, eco around their TCs. Like if, if, like if Japan tries to build a bunch of farms out on the corner away from a TC, for example, or somewhere that isn't near a TC, essentially, uh, they're going to have terrible, terrible efficiency. So Japan really needs to have a centralized farm economy around their town centers. If they don't do that, their food eco is very, very bad for sure. So 
that's what's up. Japan does have some unique upgrades here. They do have their uh, version of the wheelbarrow. So instead of having one wheelbarrow upgrade, they actually have uh, three variants of it. One which they usually get in the Dark Ages, and then they have Feudal Ages, and there's another one a little bit later on as well. So villagers going to be retreating back. We do not know where they're going yet. They're hustling, maybe for some stone, which is a good idea because, again, Japan can uh, do some really neat stuff with the kind of system of getting stone to gold and gold to stone. So they got enough gold to age up, right? We see that coming in from Prime and immediately jumping over to the stone outcropping. The reason being is that this is going to allow them to get their daimyo system going really, really quickly or build a second TC if they want to. There's a couple of options for that for sure. I suspect we're going to be seeing the Kora Storehouse for the second age up. The Kora Storehouse is, I think, the stronger of the landmarks. Uh, here it comes. So the Kora Storehouse generates farms around it, and you always want to build the Kora Storehouse next to your town center to make sure it gets the benefit of your daimyo system. So here it comes. Building it behind the base is obviously a little bit safer as well. Yes, and it also does increase your, increase your gather rate with uh, berry bushes, the Japanese upgrades here, the uh, Takazaiku. Now, back down to Joan of Arc, she's going to be building up the old uh, School of Cavalry here, so perhaps a little bit of pressure coming on. Japan feels like a very diverse sieve. They have incredibly good feudal pressure in my experience, but also seem very good for just ecoing and booming and doing all that. Um, a strategy that's also very fun, but I would say more niche for Japan, is going for the Shinobi Rush. So you get the Shinobi, the Assassins, and you just use them to harass while you go 2TC. It's like a distraction carnifex, essentially, which is fun. But the Forge is up in the back, and uh, overall, Japan looks like they could be going for 2TC play. We do see five villagers on wood here, that's what she said. And also, we do see the stone outcropping uh, being hit pretty hard. So it makes me think there's going to be a second TC with Japan. You could build it, you know, you could build it near this deer camp. Uh, you know, the TCs are very strong with Japan. When you upgrade them, they get more HP, they get more defensive parameters. And when they get higher tier, they get even crazier. They get like rocket emplacements and stuff. They're kind of like mini castles for sure. So, um, so yeah. Life's good, man. Joan of Arc, what is she up to on the bottom side? She is in the Feudal Age. We do see uh, Chivalry being researched first here by Nanny Ori. Interesting. It's almost always the case that you see a knight coming out first, which I do think is a little bit more optimal because that gives you the map control and the pressure. Like, you could be hitting these berry bush workers while the Chivalry was then upgrading, but it's not the worst play in the world. It's, you know, just something that is a little bit odd, perhaps. All right, so Joan of Arc is got to be reaching level two. She's usually it's like right like a like a minute or two after you reach feudal age. She's going to be in her archer form, and the most important thing is to make sure you go and get those boar on the map because they give a ton of experience. And obviously, you want to get Joan of Arc to level three as quickly as possible because that's when she really pops off. When she gets on the horse, she becomes uh, you know very tough to snipe. When she's on foot, she can get chased down by horsemen and have a bad time. But when she's on horseback herself, she becomes super super obnoxious, super obnoxious. So Japan getting a barracks. Typically, a lot of Japanese play is centered around getting a double racks and just getting either Onobugeisha harass. Obviously, getting the Yari Ashigaru, the spearmen, to battle off the French knights is always good. Samurai probably not going to be very good against the French in the feudal age because feudal samurai would probably get wrecked by the French knights pretty bad. So I suspect that probably wouldn't be the play that we would see here. Uh, eco count, pretty similar. Joan of Arc has got to be close to leveling up. Um, usually, I think if you have Joan of Arc solo build the School of Cavalry longer by herself, uh, the landmark that's how you age her up a little bit quicker and there were more villagers pulled this time around tnt love your aoe4 content keep bringing it all day every day man thank you so much for the support french knight coming out yes and it's going to be hunting down the japanese scout but the scout should be able to get away here palisades coming down here for prime up in the north so prime is going to be getting nice and secure making sure the french knights can't go around the flanks of the base and are we going to be seeing any yari ashigaru well they're actually just called spearmen but i i played shogun 2 a lot so for me i'm thinking of uh i'm thinking of the you know spearmen in that game which were the yari i mean you can base they, they say that when you click on them they're like yari you know so it is what it is all right so spearmen are out getting ready to hold it down here and defend against the old french knight harass the classic and what, you know, most French players do, and, you know, I do when I play French, is I build two French Knights. So I go for Feudal, I build two French Knights, and then I just build a second TC right away. Um, and your opponents will often overreact to the two French Knights, because French pressure is really scary. So they're going to panic and build a ton of military, which then allows you to have an economic lead, right? That's very, very um, big stuff, in my opinion. Joan of Arc is out, and oh, look at that. We have the Woman at Arms. So we have the Melee Joan of Arc, which... In some ways, it's kind of badass, too, because she can um, potentially kill the spearmen, allowing the knights to really do some nastiness. Okay, so she has Holy Wrath, which does AoE damage, Divine Restoration, Healing, and Consecrate, of course. Okay, this is actually kind of cool. So Joan of Arc with the knights pushing into the Japanese base. I mean, they should win this fight. Joan of Arc could solo, like, three of these spearmen. But you don't want to lose these knights. Don't move them to those spears. Pull back. You need the, you need the Lady at Arms. 
It looks like she's going to be doing battle with this wolf. Dude, look at that giant sword she has. All right, so she's going to be moving in. And do we get the AoE? We do get the AoE. All the spearmen take quite a bit of damage. And now Joan's going to be moving in. The knights are going to be following up against the spears. And those Yari could be in serious trouble there. Some of them do take the charge. Joan of Arc cutting through them. Chivalry is here. And unfortunately, she does pull back. Looks like the tower is going to be coming. Knights doing a little bit of cycle charging. Joan cutting down another of these units here. But she's going to have to watch out. This tower is going to start putting a lot of DPS into her. And she does, of course, have that heal. But the heal is on cooldown right now. But the knights should keep fighting. They they could butcher these spearmen right now as Joan of Arc does pull back. That was uh, pretty cool seeing the uh, the melee version of Joan getting in there. Granted, I do think the archer version would still be superior just sniping these spears, but it is what it is. So Knight's going to be circling about. Japan does have the Kura Storehouse as well as the Takazaiku, so they are going to be getting more gather rate. And this landmark progressively moves uh, or creates farms on increments of, uh, I don't know what the exact timer is. Let's see here. So it's going to plant into the field, 45 seconds. And when it fully surrounds itself, it then generates passive wood. It is just an insanely powerful landmark. So Joan is uh, back here. And I mean, they can all heal too. That's the thing about this army. They can keep harassing and keep diving and uh, healing. As long as they have good micro, they're not going to be losing those units. So Japan makes a Katana Bannerman. So in order to make a Bannerman, all you have to do for every single upgrade you have on a TC, it increases the cap of banner units you can make. So you can make uh, a melee uh, Katana Samurai, you can make a ranged Bannerman, and you can make a horse Bannerman as well. And they all increase damage of nearby units of the same type, right? So all these Spearmen are going to be getting 15% more damage, which is actually really, really good against the Cav. It looks like Joan of Arc's going to be harassing the backside. The Woman at Arms is here, and she's ready to party. On the bottom side, we do see the Spearman moving up, and the Onubugeisha. Onubugeisha here, probably not very good. Um, probably just accidentally queued one up, but the Onubugeisha are just going to get annihilated by French Knights. They're better against like archers and Spearmen and harassing Eco, but they're very squishy and uh, don't hit super hard. So the French trying to get into the base here. The Japanese would lose this fight pretty decisively. If Joan of Arc was able to get a good Holy Wrath on this big blob, uh, that would be a victory for the French army. But the French army should start making archers. Exactly as we say that, we do see Nani Yori moving over here. Uh, Nani Yori is a huge fan of Melee Joan, thinks she's really underrated. Hey, I'm, I would love love to see that in action. So one of these guys is going to be pulled back. Joan of Arc is going to get wrecked here um, if she gets surrounded. Uh-oh, she gets a little bit surrounded. Joan of Arc gets uh, absolutely pinned down. Knights come in and try and salvage the situation. But overall, that is going to be a nice pick there for Prime as Prime is able to uptrade super hard. And the Katana men able to just absolutely annihilate a lot of these French Knights. And now they're going to be forced back as the Yaris and the uh, additional 15% uh, damage just do an excellent job. Joan going to be resurrected in the base, I would wager. Uh, is she already back yet? Doesn't look like it. Definitely needed some archers in that fight. But um, yeah, tough one. Japan probably a little bit ahead here because they already have an upgraded Daimyo uh, Manor, which is going to be giving the gather rate. You can see that kind of yellow circle gives the gather rate to all these farmers out here. And I believe it's going to be 25%. It's pretty much the equivalent of like one of the upgrades from the other civs. But that is a much better trade for Japan. But Joan of Arc can be brought back very quickly in the early ages. And is she back yet? 250 is actually still a pretty handy price point. That was a really good play by Prime. Prime moving up and surrounding Joan of Arc when she was unprepared. But Joan needs to come back right now because every second she's not on the battlefield, you're just losing a ton of ground as, as the Civ, like a ton. Um, Nani Ori does not have the gold to resurrect Joan, which is really not good. She needs to be on the field at all times because if she's not leveling up, you're basically just like a weaker version of France, uh, which is not what you want to be against Japan, which is a very strong Civ. But Japan overextending a little bit, like this French army could turn around and steamroll this Japanese army and then get the momentum back, which I suspect is going to be happening here with this tower. It depends if Nanny is like aware. Um, obviously, the psychological factor of losing Joan could put him on the defense. More Palisades coming down. A couple Onubagesha going to be flanking around. This is a good play by Prime. Onubagesha are an amazing harass unit. They're very quick. These ladies do not mess around. They got their Naginatas and uh, they know how to use them. So, French Cab chasing with some archers. Is Joan going to be returning to us? Um, not quite yet. And uh, yeah, need a little bit more gold right now. The gold is low. It's 250. No Joan yet. Yeah, looks like a second TC is going to be the play for Nanny. Nanny saving up at 500 stone, so a little bit of a misplay. I think Nanny misallocating resources. Uh, maybe just went for the TC idea earlier, but panicked after some of the fighting. One of the Onobugeisha does get picked off here, and they did get walled off the bottom. So that was a good play there by old uh, by old uh, Nanny Yori to wall off the bottom side. Not bad at all. Onobugeisha going to be forced back. Japan, though, looking economically pretty strong with the Kura Storehouse. They are going to be able to get a nice, nice, stable kind of extension to the next age. And now we're getting some hardened samurai coming out. So these are not soft samurai. These are hard samurai. Because you can actually get samurai in the Dark Ages as Japan, which um, I don't think is a really good strategy. But overall, uh, it's an option. You know, you can do it. You can do it indeed. Uh, do other factions have single entities like Joan? Uh, yes, England can make a king unit, but it doesn't level up. But England does have a king. 
which uh, is like a you know very nice buffing unit, but typically it's not used because of how good the other landmark is. All right, so uh, the battle's soon to be on, and Joan of Arc is back. The woman at arms, she's pissed. Divine Restoration is going to be coming off cooldown soon. You might want to wait for that before you fight. But honestly, the Japanese army, sh with proper micro, that Japanese army will lose this. Um, if Joan of Arc gets in, does the Consecration, catches that army. So what Nani Yori really needs to do right now is attack this TC. I don't know if Nani is aware of that situation. Going to be going in for Villager Harass, but Prime reacts very well. Uh, Joan of Arc is in the back with the archers. But yeah, the French army could win this fight. Uh, 100% in my opinion. But we'll see if they end up taking it. More archers, more knights on the way in. They don't want to let this TC get set up. Japanese TCs, especially if they get upgraded quickly, are just absolute nightmares to drag down. And that's going to be giving Prime a little bit of an eco lead for sure. Do we see a second TC coming out for the French? The French are currently sitting on 700 uh, stone. So yeah, I mean, you could make almost two TCs for that, for sure. This one's about to finish. French Knights and Joan of Arc harassing. Joan does get passive experience as well. So as she uh, just kind of runs around the map, she's even going to be getting a little bit of experience. It looks like she might be going for the boar right now. She's heading down to the south side of the map, which will give her some good experience. Archer's doing a little bit of poking and harassing, which is nice, but if they don't micro back, they're going to get butchered. He might not have noticed. Oh, Nanny Lori, uh, <laughs> Nanny Lori. Nanny Yori loses a lot of those archers, which feels pretty bad. Knight's coming in to help, but overall, this isn't going to be great, especially with Joan of Arc not there. You don't want to take the fight without the Iron Lady here. So she's on her way, and the French just doing a little bit of harassing. With Joan, maybe they can win it now. It looks like the Japanese army's gotten a little bit bigger, and here they go. So Joan of Arc is going to be engaging. Katana Bannerman goes down very quickly. Joan does pop her AoE heal, and the French Knight's getting a decent little surround, but there's still a lot of spears, but a lot of Onobugeisha and Samurai as well. But Joan needs to make sure she doesn't get surrounded by all these units. The French Knights with good micro can obviously come in and save her, but she is on the run. Uh, might as well pop Holy, Holy Wrath, but the Onobugeisha are able to outpace her, so Joan of Arc not as quick as the... Uh, Japanese units here. They are able to hunt her down, so they you need to save Joan. Because that 250 gold, you can't afford that. Onobugeisha are just going to get leveled by that charge there. Holy Wrath, nice turnaround. The French might want to just have a sustained fight here. I mean, how many spears are left? Uh, there's still five spearmen, which is a little bit scary. So Joan does have that heal. She's healing up, but you can't lose Joan here. You cannot. Those French knights need to turn around and make sure she doesn't go down and keep protecting her from the Onobugeisha. Currently, Joan's HP is at 3328, getting very, very low. Nani Yori needs to turn around and protect Joan. She's going to get taken down, and down she goes once again. You can't afford those plays. That's just going to get Prime even further and further ahead here. Second TC is coming down right here, and uh, that's going to give the French a little bit of a push for sure. Is Joan going to be resurrected in the base? Certainly enough resources to do so, I think. Does Nani have enough? No, not at the moment, actually. So that is uh, pretty unfortunate, but the second TC is quite nice. Going to let them kind of hang with Japan's eco. Both players at a relatively eco, uh, equal amount of eco, but that it's deceiving the villager count here. I would say Japan is actually massively ahead in eco because of their farm infrastructure. That's just so much sustainability. They don't have to worry about food again. Japan can just cackle. They have a Daimyo Manor, which is getting upgraded to a palace. All these villagers are going to be getting 50% more gather rate. Japan is going to start blowing the French out of the water in terms of uh, food production, and that's really going to be showing. So the French need to do something about it. Um, Joan of Arc's coming out, and we are seeing the risk of melee Joan of Arc. She's a little bit more vulnerable, but honestly, a lot of these fights were winnable for sure for the French, but I just think it came down to prime microing better and getting better engagements. Um, the French army at many points has been superior, but it's been afraid to engage and um, has let prime take the initiative on those fights, which you definitely don't want. Hardened Samurai getting run down here. Nani Ori could move up to the north, so the archers and uh, horsemen are going, and or excuse me, knights. And I, I certainly think resurrecting Joan and pushing here would be the power play. Double TC. Uh, only only one is uh, producing, unfortunately, which is a little bit rough. Definitely need to get those bad boys producing. You build a second TC, you need to make uh, units from it. You can't, you can't, you know, can't suffer. Yeah, a little bit more micro there, and I think that fight is uh, doable either way. So Divine Restoration heals 30% of the missing health. Got it. So you got to have taken a little bit of damage. Makes sense. So here they come. A lot of Royal Knights. I think just committing and taking a fight would be good. I mean, this army is strong as hell. 13 Royal Knights. Uh, there's only nine Spearmen. So like the, this French army, like if this was, let's say like, you know, a professional level game, this French army would annihilate this one because the archers would methodically snipe off the spearmen and then the um, the knights would just dominate everything else there. Like Onobugeisha and Samurai will not trade well into those knights at all. But, you know, in this situation, fighting under a TC here, uh, I don't know if Nanny has the um, the dreaded sniping ability to take down those spearmen because it's kind of hard to tell them apart from the Onobugeisha as well as the Samurai. They're all using kind of like pointy stick weapons like they have Naginata and... Um, what are the Samurai actually wielding? Yeah, they're using Naginata as well, so... Yeah, a little bit scary. A little bit scary indeed. So pulling here, TC is not producing at this point, which is rough. We see Nani Ori falling behind on villagers. 
So a little bit of Bronze Odia right there, but the Archers do move forward and are able to pick off a couple Spearmen. So that's a good play. Is Joan of Arc back? Is the Lady returned? And she has. So the Lady at Arms is uh, coming back to party. Divine Restoration is here, and the Holy Wrath is uh, in full effect. Buildings need to be consecrated as well. None of the Joan of Arc buildings except the School of Cavalry are consecrated right now. So we definitely need to jump on that to get those bad boys going. Yeah, it is hard to tell with Japan which ones are the spear units. Like, when you're just looking topically, you're like, oh man, it's like... It's a tricky one. Prime has a nice eco, and now we're going to be seeing the Floating Gate. So Floating Gate is one of the best FFA landmarks in the game. But in 1v1, it's slowish. It's not like something that's just going to like overpower you. But it is going to be generating the Shinto Relics, which you can put in your buildings for various benefits. So we'll, of course, explain that as we do go, do go through this. So... By the way, Gunhound, if you're here, um, if you're still, if you're here watching, if, if people end up reaching the grand finals, um, make sure they don't start without it. So a couple nice picks, Nanny with good engagements there. I mean, this army is scary as hell. Like this Japanese army will fold up very quickly. I think that Nanny just needs to get over the fear of the engagement here and just push, like fight right here. Just, just go balls deep and, and fight. You know, but again, Micro the cab back, let the archer shoot a little bit, which is good, good play here. But keep that pressure up because it's Castle Age now, and we have a Shogunate Castle. So Prime actually got the final form of the Japanese keep. That is really, really, really bad for Nani Yori. Now nearby villagers have a 75% faster gather rate. Nani's army is quite good, but the Shogunate Castle also has a rocket emplacement. I believe, yeah. Let's go ahead and double check here. Yeah, it has the bow, it has the bow, and it has the rocket. So there's no way you're getting that with the French without trebuchets. Um, the French player, uh, nowhere near aging up, just basically making mass military. Prime certainly has a little bit of a weaker army, but like I think he's going to be okay with that Shogunate Castle. Joan of Arms getting in, using the Divine Wrath, and then pulling back. So gets some nice AoE. Joan of Arc's going to go down again, does get the heal. And once again, a little bit of rough micro there, and Joan of Arc does pay the troll toll. That's why I always recommend the range Joan of Arc for players who like aren't the most, you know, maybe like Conquer level, Diamond level, whatever. I don't know what Nanny's level is. Nanny seems very strong in terms of macro, for sure, but um, yeah. It's, it's tough. It's, it dies so quickly. You really, really have to be careful. So the castle is shooting rockets, and the French army is going to be diving in here. And yeah, like the Japanese army is going to be folding up here pretty hard. A lot of archers moving in. Could this be the comeback for Nani Yori? If Nani Yori is able to do this and get a lot of villager kills on top of this, that's going to be brutal. Knights do get into the base. Well played to Nani Yori fighting. A lot of villagers to be hunted here, but you have to capitalize. If these French knights don't get a lot of villager kills here, it's going to be GG. Because the Shogunate Castle will just fend off a lot of the raids. And uh, we're going to be seeing game blouses. So archers picking off the veteran samurai. The French knights diving in and picking off many of the defenders. But the rockets are just going to pick them off one by one. So there they go. And the defenders have fallen. Uh, the economy is idled right now. And that shogunate castle basically just going balls deep. While the French attackers outside uh, continue to do some okay damage to the army. But now we're starting to see some mounted samurai coming out. And as far as villager kills, after all that being said and done, Nanny got about five villagers. A couple more going down right here on the top side. So we do see villagers being popped. Is Nanny producing from the second TC? No, Nanny is still not producing villagers from these TCs here. Uh, so neither of them are producing bills, which is very, very rough. So a little bit of lapse in micro right there is going to cost quite a bit. Because if they had been producing villagers effectively, uh, we would see the French with probably a lead here. They would have like a villager lead at this point, which would be pretty big. All right. <laughs> Joan, Joan died faster than Pone's love life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of micro, man. you got to be careful with Joan. I mean, she's really good and, and can turn the tide of a game on her own, but... It requires a lot of micro for her, especially the melee variant. You have to be, yeah, Jonas the Wolverine, yeah, just constantly being killed and maimed and coming back. But yeah, I mean, the French should keep the pressure on. The Japanese army is not looking great. Uh, a bad rally there is going to be sacrificing a knight. But the Shogunate Castle here, man, is so sauced. And now we're seeing just mass stables coming out. So it's probably going to be mounted samurai uh, in tandem with foot units. Um, we do not see the Onomusha. The Onomusha are pretty good against French knights. They do bonus against heavy units, but the French are going to be pulling back. Nanny going to be macroing. Our villagers being produced. Yeah, but why is the second TC not producing? I swear, this is haunting my soul. The fact that you invest so much in a second TC and then it's not building, it's uh, it's pure pain. So Joan is coming back. Is she going to level up here? Uh, Prime has done an excellent job of sniping Joan. This is still kind of a close game too, actually. Both players uh, not too far apart from one another. Looking at the scores, we do see Prime pretty well ahead because of the Castle Age tech. And here are the free gifts. So Prime has uh, not deposited the gifts yet. So a little bit unfortunate. Probably did lose. He might have lost the priest during that fight. <clears throat> the French Knights might have been able to get a pick there. But nonetheless, these relics of Yoroshiru, when they're dropped in the forges, they give you 75 gold a minute. When they're dropped in lumber camps, they give you free wood. When they're dropped in town centers, they give you villager production speed. Lots of neat stuff can go down. But Joan's back in business, but it looks like the Samurai Army is going to be moving out, and they're going to be ambushed potentially by the French here. Is Joan of Arc nearby? She, she returns. 
They should take this fight. This army is tiny. This like Japanese army is just minuscule. The French army could absolutely steamroll that. So a little bit of a rough threat assessment there. Uh, that would have been a freebie. Joan of Arc going to be getting some experience here. So you can see the experience is going. Maybe Joan's fortunes will turn around um, when they, um, you know, when she gets level three, she'll become tankier and she'll have a horse. So she'll be able to kind of micro back quicker. And now the French army moving up. How quick close are they to Castle Age? Uh, looking at the French, we get farms going down, farms going down. See, see, this is something that Japan couldn't do. They couldn't build farms separate from their TCs. Farm, their eco is very centralized, but like Japan's food per minute, guys, is is insane. It's 2,000, whereas the French food per minute is about 700. I think if Prime plays his cards right, he 100% wins this game. First semifinal starting winner is where to not start grand finals. Great. We'll cast the semifinals after this. And uh, again, if we go through this quicker today, we'll also uh, play an FFA game after all is said and done. Just want to thank you guys all for joining. It's been fun. <clears throat> been fun so far. Mounted Samurai harass on the flank. Looks like they're trying to harass some of the French eco on the periphery. We are going to be seeing the French knights with a response to go deal with that. On the far side, relics being grabbed by the Shinto priest. We have the dreaded wall off. It looks like he was able to squeeze through there, and he's going to be getting that relic back to the base. While the Mounted Samurai here are going to be hunted down by the French knights. It's going to take a moment to kill them, but the Mounted Samurai are amazing. They're a great unit. Uh, they do have the deflective armor, so every 8 seconds they can deflect an attack, which gives them a massive amount of damage reduction over the course of a long game. But yeah, Japan's going to start drowning the um, drowning the French in, in production. You can see they, they're producing from literally everything. That 2,000 food a minute and the castle age advantage is going to be brutal. And I think it's going to be the end of the French here. I think they're going to pay the troll toll. A nice attempt for sure. I think overall Prime had slightly cleaner uh, micro in some of the early decisive engagements, which gave him the win. Uh, in this situation, I mean, I, I don't see any chance that the French are going to win this at this point. I think Prime's, his war machine is going. He's got mounted samurai and basic samurai with the bannermen supporting him. So they're all going to be doing more damage. And this archer legion is going to be paying the troll toll here. And that has got to be it. Also raiding into the base. Joan of Arc never really got going. Um, melee Joan is risky. I think she can be very good if used properly and microed very well. But now we have a Joan of Arc as a knight. So she does what? So she's got a sword. And uh, once again, she's going to be getting in and doing battle. Holy Wrath is there, but Nani Yori does uh, unfortunately lapse a micro there, and Joan of Arc does pay the troll toll again. So uh, back in the back, we got Killed Hall coming down, the classic FFA landmark. As far as that goes, the Japanese are in the base. I think we can do a little bit of fast forwarding. This is pretty much a foregone conclusion. So a couple of variables. Nani Yori had good macro in terms of army building, but unfortunately did slip and not produce villagers from the second TC for a long time. And also the Joan of Arc micro was tough at times and Prime really capitalized on that and was able to drag down the Joan of Arc. So GG well played. That was a lot of fun. We'll uh, be getting to the semifinals next. Let's get it. Oh my God. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how nice this is to be able to just jump from uh, game to game and not have to like have haggard lag and all this. Well played to Nanny though. Nanny played a good game. Prime is a very good player and so is Nanny. But you know, if Nanny just tightens up the Joan of Arc micro a little bit, Nanny could have won that game. It was close. That was a close game. Just need to tighten it up a little bit and then you're there. Well played to Nanny and well played to uh, the opponent as well. All right. So let's refresh the old brackets and do the semifinal match right now, which is going to be on the bottom. It's going to be Quill versus Uravity. All right. This is the Conqueror Duel of Fates. Did anybody get their avatars going? Let's see if it works. Yeah, so check it out. Um, as you win games on total on uh, AOE Four Tavern, you can you can unlock avatars. So you can see here, uh, Deavok won a game with the Byzantines and uh, unlocked the uh, the Spearman uh, portrait. And also, we see wins going down. So the players with more wins, once they get five wins, they get another avatar as well. You go to your profile in the top right where it says like "Welcome Turin." You click that, and you can go unlock your avatars there based on games played. So yeah, very fun. Joan of, Joan of Arc is really good. That faction is very strong. It's very strong. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it, man. And if you guys are enjoying the stream, do drop a like. It helps out quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, scrolling on down now, let's see. Uravity versus... Uh, hopefully they didn't forget Spectator. Come on. Don't forget Spectator. If they forgot Spectator, we'll just have to cast another game, which is fine. Which is fine. All right. So today's tournament, um, we have a $50 prize for first place and a $25 prize for second. Uh, so there is a little bit of a prize on the line. Quill appears to be in a lobby. I don't know if they already finished their game or, or whatnot. That would be weird. Um, hold on a sec. I'm going to go check just to make sure we don't spoil anything. Go to the intermission and let's check this. And it looks like Quill is now in the game. All right. Here we go, baby. Let's get it. So somebody was asking about Mongols earlier. And now you're going to be getting it. 
Hey, Nani Ori, well played. Realizing I didn't control group, my second TEC was the moment I... Yeah, you played You played good, Nani Ori. You played a very a very solid game. It, it just... It was that, and also the Joan of Arc was... Um, there was a lot of engagements you could have won that you didn't take. They're just little things. You played very well, though. We need to wait 40 minutes for Subutai to build his army in Total War, I know. I might do a Realms of Rune stream. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll grab Professor Pwn, the homie, and we'll play it. <clears throat> oh, yeah, we should have done an Olive Garden gift card for the winner. Although, I don't know. Gravity lives in Scotland, so I, I don't know if they have Olive Garden there. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, GG. Prime, Nanny, you guys played a great game. That was that was an awesome one. All right, so the time is now. By the way, if you've won games, go check, go to AOE4 Tavern and uh, unlock your avatars too. Once you get five wins, um, there'll be more. We'll also be doing Swiss format tournaments soon too, which uh, guarantees every player gets four games at least. So even if you're like a new player, you might lose your first game to a high level player, but from there it'll match you against people who also lost their games. Yeah. Okay, so it is time. 22 seconds until we get there for the haggard old hand. Thank you. Thank you, Tinker. I greatly appreciate that. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying the ferocious battles that we're having here today. The single sieve tournament is on. Yeah, th this is this is a sweaty game. Both these guys are like Conqueror 3 level. So we're approaching the, the territory of the finals now. And uh, I'm curious to see how the Mongols fare against the Ayubids. Gravity known for his dreaded Mongol play. So spawning in on the south side of the map, it is going to be Quill on the Ayubids. So the variant sieve of the Abbasid, we've talked about them. A lot of unique techs at their House of Wisdom. They can age up rapidly. They can get uh, free wood if they want to and get a, a rapid second TC. A lot of really, really fun stuff. Yeah, you're to get a Weather Spoons gift card. <laughs> Do they have spoons in Scotland? Do I need to be conquered to join? No, you don't. We have a lot of skill levels. Like the last game, I think, Prime, uh, what's your 1v1 rank? Are you like Diamond? Conquer, are you Conquer? I'm not sure what your 1v1 rank is. So yeah, but we have players of all skill, skill levels playing today. Up on the north side of the map, it's going to be Uravity. The King of Scotland, the Highlander himself, is going to be on the Mongols. And it looks like there's going to be a quick, obviously, well, not quick, but a standard Obu coming out. And is he going to be doing some early pressure? Perhaps getting some Spearmen? Classic Mongol stuff. Oh my god, are we going to see a Tower Rush too? I think there's going to be a tower rush, guys. Based on what I'm seeing here with the uh, perpetual villager pressure on the wood. And yeah, you can move the gear around and just grab these random trees, which is pretty funny. Oh my god, are we going to see a tower rush? Is this going to happen? I, I, I don't know why I'm getting a feeling we're going to see a barracks and then we're going to see a tower rush. The dreaded Mongol tower rush is the uh, traumatizing many a ladder player. But for sure, we're going to be seeing a Rax coming up right now. Let's go to caster mode. I always forget to switch to that. And, uh, oh, hello. Okay, it was freaking out a little bit there. It was freaking out for sure. What's he doing with this fill? Currently, we see Uravity sitting on 150 wood. So clearly, he wants to build a barracks here. And there's the barracks. It's going to be plopping down. So Spearman going to be coming around to press. Typically, what you can do against this is you can just make sure to get 200 uh, gold very quickly. So then you don't need to overextend your gold villagers. And you can just age up and build archers. And uh, you're going to be fine. <clears throat> so the con circling around the map. Somebody asked about hero characters, so this is another one. The Khan is a unique a hero character available to the Mongols, and he levels up over time. He has some nice auras, so you have, you have the King of England, you have Joan of Arc, who's obviously the strongest hero character, and then you have the Khan, who's pretty respectable as well. Yeah, caster mode looks really good in this game. It's, it's very nice, and it's built into the game, too. It's not even like an overlay or something. Yeah, so it's, uh, imagine, if, imagine if CA gave us stuff like this. Okay, double Spearman is going to be on the way for the Mongols, and aside from that, they've kind of resorted to a, a fairly standard economic opening here. Although, are we going to be seeing these bills switch on over to gold? Or are we going to see a legitimate tower rush? Based on the fact that they are gathering more wood, I think that Uravity is going to be doing spear pressure with towers behind it. He's probably going to be towering the berry bushes and then towering the gold. And then uh, if you could tower the other gold on the other side and really starve his opponent out, it can do some nastiness for sure. But yeah, Uravity is on his way across and uh, looks like he's looking for blood, man. And yeah, he wants the early Mongol pressure. And this is... Probably a play style. It's just a play style I've always kind of struggled to play against. I always struggle against early Mongol pressure. It's uh, It's been strong, and it used to be really, really nasty back in the day before some of the tower nerfs and different things like that. All right, here comes the old con, the dreaded two damage con. You know, it adds up eventually. Death by a thousand spoon blows. And now we see the age up here. It's going to be the military wing reinforcement. Okay, so upon completion, cavalry units gain the ability to construct siege weapons, and the House of Wisdom produces... 
uh, one, one desert raider every two minutes for the rest of the game. So that's going to be giving him free desert raiders with which he can fight back against the uh, Mongol pressure. So the spears have arrived. Do we see a villager being pulled? We do. A desert... I don't know if it spawns a desert raider immediately. Uravity needs to be careful not to overextend into the TC there. If he loses those spearmen, it pretty much kills his momentum here. And that would be giving a massive advantage to Quill. But I suspect a tower is going to be getting popped right here on top of the gold. And then a tower would probably be made up in the north. But the Desert Raiders will hard counter these Spearmen. So he needs to get started on this tower uh, really, really quickly or else it's not going to finish. So what are these Spearmen doing? Uh, they're moving forward and taking a little bit of free damage, trying to torch down the House of Wisdom. Military Wing Reinforcement is there. All right, perfect. And uh, up in the north, what do we see from Uravity? He's just going to be transitioning to a fairly standard economy now. Going to be getting gold so he can age up himself. And this is what Mongols normally do. They'll suppress your economy uh in the dark ages and then will then age up themselves uh under the pressure or behind the pressure i should say of the spearman con is nearby age up is completed so i believe it's every two minutes no it's actually a little bit quicker okay so 30 seconds so let me read this so uh i guess i can't see it anymore okay that's fine but yeah it looks like it's gonna be making a desert raider soon if that tower doesn't finish it's gonna feel really really bad for your avity uh, the Desert Raider is going to be popping out in about 12 seconds. So I think this tower will be finishing here. And that gold is going to be shut down for now. Which is going to be probably forcing old uh, Quill. Well, this tower is actually really good. Because it's denying not only gold, but also stone. So Quill would have to move away from his base to get some of those resources, right? Which um, the other gold is over here, which is not the best position either. And it looks like this has been garrisoned. And I suspect we're going to be seeing another tower coming here. Oh no, he's coming back to build this. He's just going to, he's potentially going to lose a villager here. Yeah, so those villagers are going to be forced back. Quill under a lot of pressure from the Dreadlord of Scotland. Uravity certainly causing that uh, Mongol uh, harass. And now we see the Desert Raider coming out. So that's the free Desert Raider. And the Mongols are going to be getting pressured a little bit. Granted, their base is very compact. I don't see that there's any, uh, you know, efficient rating that this Desert Raider is going to be able to do. Whereas this one tower is extremely disruptive. Are we going to see more tower pressure? Or are we going to be seeing trade get set up? What is this villager doing? It looks like he's just running back to the base. Spearman just chilling out in the tower. In the middle of the map, we do see the Khan. Oh, look at this. And the Khan expects this. He figured that there would be a desperate play at the gold here. But the Khan's going to be getting prison shanked. He better be careful. It looks like he's able to run away. Archer coming out from the Ayubids is going to potentially push back that Khan. More Spearman coming out. And this is going to be very important for Uravity to shut down this gold. Because currently, if he can deny gold to the Ayubids, that's going to be brutal. So Spearman chasing down archers with the support of the Khan. They might be able to actually do okay against those bad boys. Desert Raider sitting outside here. We're about to see the Feudal Age from the Mongols here. It's going to be the Silver Tree, which... Um, are we going to be seeing the dreaded Mongol trade? Certainly not easy. Desert Raiders with their mobility and horsemen can shut down the trade. So you have to watch out for that. And, ooh, sloppy play from Miravity here. He loses his Khan to those archers. That should not have happened. Clearly, he was microing somewhere else, and his dread Khan is going to be falling. But the Khan will come back in due time. But still, that, that gives up a ton of map control. And now we do see the Ayubids having healthy gold. They can even wall this side to make sure that uh, nobody can reach them there. Yeah, so good pressure. What are we going to be seeing? Kashyyyk. So Kashyyyks are coming out, but Kashyyyks are not amazing against Ayubids. The Ayubid uh, Desert Raiders are probably going to be able to fend them off. They can draw their swords, and they have five melee armor, and they also debuff cavalry damage. And they do bonus damage against cavalry with their swords. So overall, the uh, Kashyyyks are really not going to be having a good time. Nomi, thank you for the fiver. Greatly appreciate it. Really, really uh, kind to you, my friend. And uh, even though it's not my birthday, it uh, means a lot. Hey, nice little spear raid. So the spearmen that were in the tower just pop out and they shut down the berry bushes. And are they going to be getting a vill kill? Oh, the villager's running. No villagers go down there. That was very, very fortunate. A couple spears do fall, but it is denying food to the Ayubids. This barracks should be packed up and run. You're going to want to move that back to the base for sure. And it looks like it is going to be packed up here. In the meantime, these villagers happily on gold as that tower in the back is cackling. Now, what is the next tech going to be? Is it going to be the rapid age up here from Quill? Quill building more military infrastructure. It looks like we're going to have a pretty heavy feudal duel as archery ranges are coming out. And what's so cool is like the Ayubids can build feudal archery ranges and they can get melee units out of them because Desert Raiders fill both purposes. Um, so you're still going to be able to get some melee units from your from your archery ranges, which means you don't need to necessarily build like a barracks. A little bit of an early raid here. Kashyyyk's going to be coming out to battle the Desert Raiders, but he will get wrecked super, super hard. And uh, it looks like your boy Uravity on the back foot now. You see the Silver Tree setting up, looking to do a little bit of trade. But that's going to be very hard to get past Quill. I suspect Quill's going to do Siege Engineering too. Oh, guys, and his Camels can actually build a Siege too. So he has the tech that allows his Camels to be able to build Battering Rams. So the Camels can actually help with that. 
Okay, so the Kashyyyks are going to go after the archers, and so far they pick off a handful of archers, but the camel riders just wrecking these Mongolian heavy cavalry, and it looks like the Mongol Kashyyyk is going to be forced to pull back here. He will survive, but the Khan is back, the Spearman is back, and, uh, you know, Yravity might have a decent chance of fending off this raid here. We're going to have to see, but the prevalence of the archers and the perpetual sniping of the Spearman is really, really just allowing these desert raiders to shine. Man, those units are awesome, dude. Yeah, Desert Raiders are, uh, are great. What they're really weak against, Desert Raiders are just miserable against Archer units. So, for example, if um, Uravity were to switch his tech and build like two or three Archer ranges, he would be able to just annihilate this army. Because Archers just wreck them. And obviously Spearmen will do very well against them too, in the classical sense, right? A bit of a duel of fates right here. We do see the Kashyyyks deciding to engage the Khan moving up, but Uravity slips and loses everything. I don't know what that engagement was about, but that was rough. And I think we're going to be seeing Quill taking over this game very, very decisively here. Uravity jumping in the TC. Uh, it does manage to pick off the scout with the TC focus fire. Uravity's trying to set up an eco here with his pastures, which are going to be giving him a steady flow of sheep. But man, there is not a lot going well for Uravity here. It seems like the Ayubids have his number. And uh, Quill has just been getting the better engagements. There's been a couple sloppy ones of the Khan dying twice. Little things like that, when you look at a super high level game, are going to be making all the difference, right? So down in the south, Ayubids, are they going to be going siege engineering? Uh, I guess they don't need to. That's right. They get it for free because they're a Bassid, yes. And maybe the camels with their little camel feet are going to be building uh, battering rams. Vu going down and good scouting here. You can see that Quill is expecting Mongolian trade. So he's circling around the map. Mongols could just go Castle Age here. Maybe that's going to be the game plan. Just trying to get a bunch of pastures and just sitting in your base and hoping that the rams don't come. Close your doors and hope for the best. We will see. Meanwhile, Lumberjack upgrade from the uh, double Bronx here at the Gare. Uh, Quill, he is getting uh, the Bloomery as well as the Steeled Arrows, so upgrading his Desert Raiders. I think Desert Raiders might be one of my favorite new units. I haven't had a chance to try them yet, but man, just from seeing them being used effectively. In the first game we had today between uh, Quill and, um, and Vice, Vice Bro, we did see that and uh, how good they were at just disrupting. Just nasty, nasty. Finally, the archery ranges. So the archeries, uh, the archers are the counter against them. Uh, they're very good. I mean, yes, they can ride down archers, but typically a critical mass of archers is going to be very good. We do see a pretty big economic lead for Quill as well. I would say pretty much in every regard, Quill is ahead in this game. And the landmark has been found, so the silver tree is going to be raided here by the Desert Raiders. And it's Q and W to switch between those two hockeys. Okay, very, very neat. Very, very neat indeed. So double archery range coming up. Desert Raiders in the back are all over the place. We are going to be seeing one villager go down here potentially. And is it going to get away? It does get away just barely. Gravity really needs to start producing mass archers. Just get an archer ball with a con leading it and you're going to have a decent quality army at that point. But Gravity's falling massively behind, man. He's going to need some good plays. Um, that silver tree is now uh, packed up and is going to be running back. We do see this archer getting hunted down here as the silver tree is trying to get away. But look at the micro here from Quill. Quill is just... He is not letting this thing escape easily. As a matter of fact, he might be able to stop it. Look at this micro here from Quill, man. He is just a machine. Not letting anything, anything get uh, get by here, man. And yeah, maybe that might lead to its death, which would be pretty big. Because then if he just kills the TC, he basically wins the game. So he's trying to set it up over there. And uh, it is just getting pounded. Quill, as a matter of fact, may be going to be able to surround this. The Kashyyyks and Spearmen and now Archers are going to be on their way over, which might be able to fight okay here. But those Desert Raiders are just going to be drawing their sword, and the pressure alone from Uravity does allow the Silver Tree to get back. Tower still denying a little bit. Gold looking good here. Plenty of gold, as the Desert Raider legions have gathered. And uh, are they going to build ramps? Currently looking the wood of Quill. Uh, he doesn't have any wood, so I don't think there's going to be any ramps in the immediate future. And you can see the Archers and the TC able to fend off the Desert Raider from the north. And the Mongols... Yeah, Uravity's got to just be like hoping for Castle Age here, hoping he can hold long enough to find his way to Castle Age. But even still, I don't know how that's going to go. Do we see a second TC coming out here? Nope, it looks like it's just pedal to the metal. Iron Undermesh means he wants blood. And now you can see he's banking a little bit of wood, which means that there's going to be some Duhasting coming, which is going to be very, very nasty. This has, been a, this has been a very, very brutal game. I mean, Quill is playing very clean, like very clean. Oh, yes, here it comes. The Desert Raiders now, and the Camels are also building the Rams. That's so cool that they can do that. That's so cool. Down to the bottom side, any other uh, unique techs coming along? Quill, yeah, he's pretty much pouring everything into the aggression here. I think he knows that he has Uravity on the back foot. I mean, the army size is a colossal difference. It's 41 against 19, and he has an eco lead on top of that. It's not just one or the other. He has a lead in both regards, which is just super, super um, nasty indeed. Hmm. That's some good stuff right there. Some good water, man. Some good H2O. Another battering ram is there. We have the double ram. And here they come. This could be the end of your avenue. The king of Scotland could fall. 
but he will never truly be de- he will never truly be defeated. He will fight on in our uh, in our hearts. I like the counter raid idea here. I think this is good. I think he's so far behind that he's going to need to get really lucky here. Uh, not lucky, but he's going to have to play like a golden <laughs> like a golden god. He's going to have to fend off this push. But man, look how many desert raiders there are, dude. There's so many. They should probably switch to their um, their bows. But there are also so many Ayubid archers. And the villagers are garrisoned in the TC. The Mongolian archer is pulling back. This would be an opportunity for your Abity to get back in the game. If he could kill a lot of villagers here with this push... But overall, we're seeing a lot of villager casualties here for Yuravity on the defense, which makes sense. A lot of the villagers desperately trying to deal with the rams, and those rams are getting in there and doing work. Yuravity might hold this in his base because of the TC DPS, but no, I don't think it's going to happen. The rams are both still pretty healthy. A lot of villager losses. 23 villager kills here for Quill, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be game blouses. As we are going to be seeing Quill advancing on to the grand finals of today's tournament to face the winner on the other side of the bracket. Dude, those camels were mean as hell this game. They were nasty. Yeah, they're very weak to archers, but at that point, it was like a 50 supply army against like 19 or something like that. <laughs> I love how your avid is like a high-level conqueror player, but he also always uses the gold icon. That's that's pretty funny. Yeah, so it's, it's good flavor. Statistics, pretty much a, a very dominating game. Uh, the early harass was good, but beyond that, it got uh, got a little bit rough. All right, let's take a look at the brackets here. GG, well played. Yuravity will be back for blood eventually, I am sure. We should be getting close to the grand finals. So still a couple more games. Yeah, so we do have the win going to Quill there. So Quill will be in the grand finals. The other semifinal has not started yet. Um, I suspect it's going to be going soon. So we have Anisio. Is he on my friends list? Let's go ahead and check here. And uh, yeah, man, life's good. Life is good indeed. Well played, man. Good game. <laughs> you Yuravity you lost the power creep now. No, it's a, the army composition was off. Like, Yuravity making the Kashyyyks was not the right response. The Kashyyyks just get wrecked by the camels. So he basically just spent a ton of resources on units that were weak against what was already on the field. Whereas if Yuravity had your, responded immediately with double archery range, um, he probably would have been able to win a lot of those trades and potentially take map control again and also establish trade. So that was a totally winnable game for the Mongols. Um, alas, the, the building was was tough. That's prime? Okay, got it. That's prime. So we'll probably chill for a minute. Um, I don't know how long they've been in there. Phil and Inca. Inca is a very high-level player, too. He's playing on the top side. He was a Conqueror player. Um, and Mongols. Oh, man, we could actually legitimately have a Mongol um, mirror match. Yuravity coming into chat. I had no idea what his camels did. Yeah, your Avity, you, so you must not have played the expansion too much yet. So the camels, uh, I'm sure you know now, but they can switch They can switch between bow and sword. They have five melee armor, and they wreck They wreck the, uh, they absolutely wreck your calves. So your Kashyyyks w were what lost you the game. Like when you went Kashyyyk against camels, it was basically the end. But if you, they're really weak against archers. They have zero ranged armor, and they, ha they don't have a lot of HP, so you can gat them down with archers. Don't worry, you're still Professor Pwn's hero, man. You're still his hero. All right, let's see here. Got it. Uh, I can change that on site later if you want. Perfect. Yeah, the camels are great. He won my heart with his stoic last stand, yes. This is good, give me a little minute to rest up here. And um, let's see how far along that game is. I'm pretty sure they've been playing for a hot minute. Oh, hello. It's lagging a little bit. Sometimes when you try and load, uh, when I try and load my offline friends list, there's like 800 people there. So it sometimes crashes my game. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Recently played. Yeah, I ran into divine DFP on ladder <laughs> the other day. That was brutal. <laughs> oh my God, an English mirror match, just pure misery. All right, um, looking around here. Let's see. So it is, I believe, Inca playing up there. Let's see how far into the game they are. I suspect they'll be done soon and we can cast a semifinal. Um, scrolling down, let's find him. What would be a really nice quality of life feature is if they added a search, like so you could search through your friends list. I know it's um, probably not an issue for folks who aren't like casting tournaments and stuff, but for me, it would be nice. All right, scrolling down. Where are you at? I know you're here somewhere. Did I miss him up top? Maybe I did. Just ended the other match. Perfect timing. Okay, so in that case, we could just cast Prime's game. So we'll find Prime on the list and we'll hang tight. All right, so they're gonna be getting the next one. Outstanding, so they just finished it and the score should be getting reported. 
and you can see our uh, community leaderboard is now starting to populate. So currently Quill is the top of the leaderboard. Uravity is ranked number two. And uh, yeah, you can see Prime is undefeated here as well. You can see the various avatars being uh, allocated there, which is fun. And eventually we're going to have a page to keep track of our FFA tournaments as well. Um, this will be the Hall of Fame. So all of our FFA tournaments will be banked here. So you guys will be able to keep track of who's won those in the past and uh, go from there. It's wild coming from the disaster that was Dawn of War 3 to this. I know. Well, a large reason, I think Microsoft has a big hand in this game too, financially. So I think that is uh, one of the reasons why it's getting a lot of good support too. Yeah. Yo, Turin, how high do I have to be to be a faction leader? Well, so currently as it stands, Allied, you would, you're would you never number seven on the leaderboard. So you would be invited to a faction war as it stands. You just, you'll just you just need to be top eight probably. I How many civs do we have in total now? So let's go to learn, um, four, eight, 12. Okay, maybe we would do 16 players then, yeah. But casting, that would be a lot of games to cast. That would be like a, a good six, seven hour stream. Um, well, if it's best of one, maybe not, because there's no army building process. It's just straight into the battles. So maybe just top 16 will get an invite. So we'll have to, we'll have to see how that goes. All right, well, anyways, let's find our match. So the semifinal match is going to be Prime. So let me find him. He should be getting it. He's in a lobby here. Perfect. So what we would do for a faction war is we would go to the top 16 players on the leaderboard and we would uh, invite them from top to bottom in order. And the number one player will get the first pick of their favorite sieve and you keep going down. So yeah, so we would invite top 16, but we'll have a couple tournaments before that happens to make sure the leaderboards are like accurate. <laughs> you're, you're not low at all, dude. You're in the, you're doing great. Not calling your website only Rams was a huge mistake. <laughs> yeah, that would have been fun too. That would have been fun. All right, so Prime's loading up. And as soon as they're ready, that's our semifinal match. Let's look at the brackets so far here and see how this goes. All right. So we have uh, El Inca versus Anisio, who is Prime. So this is going to be Japanese versus Mongols. Um, we'll see if a giant tsunami is going to come forth and save the Japanese this time. On the bottom, we have Quill. So we have uh, the Ayubids in the Grand Finals, and then we have Japanese and Mongols remaining in today's tournament. And uh, overall, it's been it's been pretty fast. I mean, we're not even at the two-hour mark, and we've gotten through a pretty big tournament. Um, obviously, if we did best of threes, it would go way longer. Likely, many of the early matches would be two O's as the uh, the skill level variance is kind of you know solved. But hmm, that's fun, man. All right. Uh, are more equipped with multiple sieves. Uh, Kirk, well, typically you, you want to reward the players on the top of the leaderboard for their for the efforts they've re put in to reach that position, you know. Um, but it also could be a situation where maybe I just work with all top 16 players and I ask them what are their top three sieves and I'll do my best to give everybody the sieve of their choice. Yeah. We'll figure it out. We're, we, I haven't like ironed out the format yet, but it will, uh, it will go down in due time. All right. Hope you guys are ready for some more hot, hot Age of Empires action. As we jump in to the semifinal match, it's going to be Japan versus the Mongols. Dude, I'm hyped, man. This is going to be great. So as far as this matchup goes, Japan pretty durable against early harass with their um, daimyos, with their keeps and all that stuff. Obviously, Japanese archers are pretty cool too. They're squishier than regular archers, but they're also faster. So they can, uh, they can move and scoot and deal with a lot of the Mongol mobility. Shinobi? What about Shinobi in this matchup? Like the Assassins? I don't know. I think the Kura Storehouse is just too good of a landmark to pass up on. The only time I would probably use the Shinobi landmark, the uh, the Township, to get the Assassins would be on a hybrid map. So if there's like a, a contested water between the two players, I would maybe get a Shinobi to come out and sabotage their docks. That would probably be the only reason I would do that. I can't really think of too many other places, so... <laughs> Can I get a... Well, here's the thing, Allied. If you if you win enough games with Delhi Sultanate in tournaments, you will unlock an elephant avatar. I think it's 20. 20 Delhi wins will get you the first one. And we're going to be hosting Swiss tournaments soon too, in which you can get essentially four wins in one tournament. If you win all four games, and then the grand finals will be best of three. So Swiss tournaments are really fun. And uh, it's a good way for people to uh, to learn everything. So, All right. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are in our first semifinal match of the day, spawning on the south side of the map. It's going to be prime time, baby, coming in with the Japanese. 
Very similar build order, opening up with the house next to the berry bushes to have the easy gather access, and he is good to go. On the north side, it's going to be the Incan. He has been in our Discord playing Age of Empires since the very start. Uh, I looked at his, I believe I looked at his stats before the tournament, and I think he was a Conqueror player last season. So clearly he's got some serious competitive chops and is a Mongol main. So this is like a dream format for him, right? Like the single faction tournament where you can play, or single Civ tournament, where you can play one faction all the way through and just like kind of really channel all that. It's a nice casual tournament format because a lot of players play a lot. They might just play on ladder and play one or two factions. And if you force them into a pick and ban system, they can get wrecked pretty hard if people know what their mains are. <laughs> mains are, But in this case, they get to shine, which is good. Everybody can as well. Everybody can as well. Yeah, Quill did, uh, Quill did great. He was very, very solid in that game. But... From what we learned after the game, it would appear Yuravity wasn't familiar with what the Desert Raiders do, but perhaps that mistake will not be repeated in the future. We will see. Yeah, he's a Conqueror Mongol main. All right. Mongolians making some appearances today, and it looks like we're not going to be seeing the tower pressure. We saw that last game, uh, obviously from Yuravity, the tower press. Against Japan, how would that be? Um, not bad. Obviously, you know, a little bit of uh, spear pressure here and setting up a tower wouldn't be a terrible idea to deny Japan gold. We certainly like their gold. And then you would need to deny these two stone nodes too. I, I like the more consistent play here of just going for the age up. Myself personally, those like dark age plays, they just stress me out too much. I've never been too good at them. So the Khan here able to get a good find drops off a lot of sheep there. So good sheep haul initially here for the Inca. Meanwhile, down to the south side, Prime with a very standard build order. And again, if you're new, Japan, whenever they mine gold, they get stone. When they mine gold, uh, stone, they get gold. Uh, I believe it's like 20% of the drop off or something like that. But yeah, it's nice. It allows you to get your daimyo manor. So Japan, their economy needs to be completely centralized. So they need to build all their farms around their TCs. And each tier that you upgrade your town center gives you 25% additional gather rate. So that's how Japan's economy just pops off. Yeah, caster mode. I'm sorry, I'm not used to it. It's, um, yeah, I'm getting used to all these tools. I've been doing FFA for so long. So the forge is a Japanese uh, stone and gold drop off point, and it also has your upgrades. It's a blacksmith as well, which is really nice. So Japan doesn't need to build a blacksmith in tier two to start getting their upgrades. They're already gonna have that. Somebody in chat giving an update. Inca doesn't tower rush. He'll go fast trade with Kashyyyks and Mangudai. Dude, I love that. The fact that he like plays the Mongols with Mangudai, which aren't the most common pick, is super, super heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> Gunhound. It's okay, man. I believe you'll get there. We'll do some Swiss We'll do some Swiss tournaments, and then you'll be able to get some uh, fat dubs for sure. Or even regular tournaments. You know, you can do it. All right, up on the top side, we do see the deer stones coming down from the Mongols. So that landmark obviously gives movement speed and uh, unlocks the Yam network. So the Mongol army can fly around the battlefield. I am so incredibly excited to see some Mangudai. The Koro Storehouse obviously is the go-to landmark. Just auto-generating farms. It just gives Japan such an economic lead. Um, you know, farms are expensive. They're 75 wood a pop. So it's going to be just giving you a ton of value. And then you can spend your wood on other things, whether it be a second TC, uh, you know, maybe you want to get some early military units, like some spears and archers, whatever, and press. It's really, really nice. One of my favorite techs with Japan too is going double barracks and using the Onubugeisha rush. So you go double racks behind the Kura storehouse, which is going to be giving you an economic boom. And you get Onobugeisha with the Katana Samurai uh, leading them with the banner. And they do good damage and they're fast. And it's a really, really nice rest tool. Granted, Mongols can probably shut that down really easily. Uh, I think that the Mongols could use the, uh, what are those things? The Mangudai, yes. And just kite them and blast them into oblivion, which would feel pretty bad. So, all right, it's on, baby. Little defensive tower coming down. So it looks like he was already anticipating the Onobugeisha rush. Japan does have really good feudal pressure for sure. Japan is kind of a sieve like the English. In my experience, I can kind of do like, a, they don't, they're not like set in any one way. They can do quite a bit of a different tactics here. That is a lot of sheep being taken here by Prime. So Prime taking those sheep across, looking for the goodies here. Archery range is going to be coming out and we most likely will be seeing a double uh, Mangudai. So there's a couple responses for Japan. They can go archers to try and battle the Mangudai, which works totally fine. Uh, obviously Palisades are going to be your best friend. So against Mangudai, probably just a giant wooden Palisade along the back would pretty much shut down their raiding completely. And then just get a couple archers and you're going to be you're going to be chilling barracks is definitely not what you want against the mangudai rating that is going to be really rough and now we see double mangudai coming out so prime is really going to regret building this barracks and that's one of the big importances of scouting um i don't know if he saw his opponent had an archery range but you know you would oftentimes it's a good idea to wait until you see what your opponent's doing and then counter build them right but in this case um, Prime really could pay the troll toll. He does get an archer range coming up quickly, which is good. And obviously Kashyyyks are still going to be on the table. Um, Unabugeisha 
are out. Onobugeisho will be absolutely annihilated by the Kashyyyks or the Mangudai. And here comes the Mongolian Raiders. All right. So the Raiders going to be heading down to the south. The Hardin Khan nearby as well. He'll be joining them on the raid shortly, I would wager. And uh, this is this is what it's all about with the Mongols. The Deer Stones, what does it do? So the Deer Stones unlocks the Yam Network upgrade, which makes it so your towers, uh, cavalry and traders near an outpost gain movement speed. So essentially it gives you more mobility across the map. It augments your trade. And uh, is he going to be going for standard trade? I wonder. Yeah, he's obviously not going to be double producing traders. But we immediately see a tower coming up. So the Mongolian raiders do force a tower, and we see archers coming out. So basic archers will do very well against Mangudai, but you need more than one. The Yumi Ashigaru are not going to have a good time against just the, uh, the the two here. But yes, more archers are on the way out. Mangudai poking in, the archer trying to return the favor, but it does cancel the tower. And currently Japan is going to be completely pushed off ye old uh, gold. Now going to be setting up the tower once again. Double archers getting in, but the Mangudai have a nice critical mass. They might be able to just bully these archers here. As you see them scooting and shooting, spearmen overextending, going to be dragged through the mud and picked off by the Mangudai. Tower building in the meantime. The Yumi Ashigaru, the archers, trying to fend off these Mangudai, but they're hanging in there like champs. And they're actually picking off Vil, so villager damage going down. Khan giving the attack speed arrow to these bad boys, which is going to be giving their range attack speed by 50%. So that's big DPS. And several villagers do die. A three villagers picked early is really good. And the archers are able to finally fend them off. So nice early pressure here from the Incan. Now, what is going to, his follow-up going to be? Blacksmith tech, and it looks like Kashyyyk are going to be coming out. Kashyyyk will counter the uh, archers, obviously, if they can catch them. And uh, the battle's on. Double archery range, that is the right call. It's going to be super important uh, for the uh, bannermen to come out too. They want a samurai bannerman, or the Yumi bannerman, which will give all these archers 15% more damage, which is which is quite good. I mean, their damage is quite very, very low initially, but here they are. Up on the top side, we do see the Kashyyyks now on their way down. The Mangudai pressure is going to be mounting here on Prime. He does have a tower, uh, does not have an emplacement on it. Might not be a bad idea to just get an arrow slit. And Palisades need to be set up here. If you're being raided by a top-tier Mongol player, you need to you need to Palisade the hell out of your periphery. Otherwise, you're going to get just hit from so many angles, you won't know what's uh, what's coming at you here. It's always really fun to see, um, to see faction mains in their element, you know? <laughs> it's definitely fun. All right, so the archer is pulling back, and now they're going to be circling. You could go mass horsemen, but the problem with going horsemen to counter the Mangudai is that there's going to be Kashyyyks mixed in, and uh, they will pick you off as you try and chase them down. So I think mass archer is definitely a good early strategy. Uh, you know, archer horsemen would not also not be bad. You're going to want to get some upgrades here, and yes, he is getting the ranged armor upgrade, which is going to be super essential. Also, textiles wouldn't be a bad upgrade for your villagers to increase their health by 25 to make it harder for the Mangudai to get the picks on them. Kashyyyk's coming in. This is going to be a dual-pronged raid, and this is where it gets really, really nasty. We see the Mongolian raiders here on this side, and the Mangudai going, and yeah, he does react, though. Well played to Prime. A lot of lesser players wouldn't have reacted to that. Looks like there is going to be another uh, loss here as the old uh, Kashyyyk's get into the main base. The Daimyo Manor is going to be defending valiantly, but a lot of villager kills, and the Mangudai are going to be harrying the back of the base. This is like, Mongols obviously can't build walls. Their defensive capabilities aren't the best. But for the Mongols, the best defense is a good offense. That, uh, that that old saying really, really rings true with them. As they encircle the base, looking at the eco count, it's pretty even. You know, Japan hasn't taken too many big L's yet. But overall, this rating is quite nasty. And now the Yari Ashigaru, the Spearman, the hardened Spearman, going to be trying to battle off the Kashyyyks. One of them going to be going down here most likely. As the archers draw their bows, Spearman going to be chasing them down. And the Mongolian rating continues. Now, is he establishing trade behind this? Is he going castle? Um... The fact that the Mongols are banking a decent amount of food makes me think they're doing a very kind of casual approach to the next age. Here the Kashyyyk does run through the base. One of them does fall here. And Japan may have stabilized their eco. The tower here putting a little bit of Daka down as the Spearman chase them back. And the Mangudai lurking in the back of the base. Yes, yes. Somebody in chat here, uh, Wang is saying his APM too much for my old Wang hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he's got some serious APM. So battle's on here and this looks pretty good for Prime. Uh, his spearmen going to be immediately dragging down a Kashyyyk, and the Yumi archers do get the advance and push back that unit there. So overall, amazing trade here for Prime. This could be where the momentum starts to shift. Losing a Kashyyyk, your Khan, and a Mangudai, that is uh, some serious losses. And Japan, what are they going to be doing with their eco? Currently a lot on wood. The Kura storehouse going to be getting those farms going. Obviously Japan not too far behind. They've only lost four bills, so you can see that is the difference in villagers. And now potentially going to be equalizing that as they do push this outpost here. How many spearmen? Only two spearmen, so they're not going to be able to kill that outpost at all. Is Japan going to keep the pressure, or are they going to be ecoing? That is the question. 
If they overextend into Mongol lands and the Mongols are able to get enough uh, of the big Kashyyyks out in the Mangudai, this whole army could get steamrolled super hard. There's only three spearmen here. If those spearmen start to go down, these Yumi archers are going to get absolutely flattened by those Kashyyyks. So you got to be careful. You've got to be very, very careful for sure. All right, moving across. More Palisades coming down. I really like this from Prime, you know, controlling the map, keeping the Mangudai from getting into his lands. And, you know, Mongols uh, have a lovely history with walls and probably not their favorite thing. But uh, we do see the uh, flank coming. Okay, potentially going to get some picks here. This is really big. Picking off a couple of vills, equalizing the score a little bit. So, so far we do see three villagers going down four. The tower does get built. They do garrison. But that was a great, great little engagement here by our Japanese player. He does manage to pick off villagers, equalizing the economy. But on that same note, um, he is going to be losing his entire army to the Mongols here. So what he wants to do is try and pick off those units if he can. But the Kashyyyks could basically solo all these guys at this point. These archers hit for only five damage. So mitigating... Yeah, they're literally hitting the Kashyyyks for one damage apiece, which is brutal. The Mangudai coming around the bend. And Prime is going to want to try and pick off some of those units if he can. He does pick off a Mangudai there. And yeah, not the worst situation for Japan. It does take the pressure off. He picks off another Mangudai. But overall, his entire army does get wiped. But dude, the Dark Lord of Palisades, look at this. He's just setting them up all across the map, trying to contain those Mongols. And are we going to be seeing a second Japanese TC? We don't see any stone being gathered, but now it looks like Prime is going to be switching all of his villagers over to the stone outcropping and is going to be trying to probably get a second TC going down or maybe just upgrading his Daimyo Manor into a palace to get the gather rate going nearby. Totally a fair option. Probably should delete this lumber camp too and rebuild it further up because a farm could be placed right here. And unfortunately it is blocked right now. So he's missing out on a free farm. Also the sheep here are blocking a free farm. So you're going to want to have some units gathering on those just to make sure. So the Mongols looking to counter push now. Eco looking relatively even for both players. A slight lead for the Mongols here. Currently the Hardened Spearman and the Yumi Ashigaru stand at the ready. The Mongols going to be looking for a way in as the Palisades are being built. And I think they're going to find a way in eventually. They're going to be kind of circling the walls here. And uh, Prime is not going to be able to finish those walls before the Mongols get in once again. Although, is he going to stop looking? Maybe he just assumes the Palisades are already done, which is a mistake. Uh, Incan could come over here and for sure just get through and uh, cause some big havoc. But it does not look like it's going to happen. Yep, just going to be pushing through here. So that's going to give Japan ample time to react to this. I'm surprised we're not seeing a Bannerman. Getting a Bannerman would be a huge boom to his army. The 15% damage on those archers would add up and, of course, uh, give them some tankiness. The Kashyyyk's knocking on Heaven's door, pushing through the Palisade Gate here. So trying to get in there, looking for the goodies. In the Japanese base, stone is being gathered. Currently, Japan's sitting on about 72 stones, so not that much. Uh, no upgrades on the Daimyo Palace. Just a progressive kind of slow push to the second TC. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so he does have it. So second TC coming down to the west side, which is going to be giving Japan a nice uh, economic lead. And now trade is going online for the Mongols. Hell yeah, dude. Mongolian trade. Uh, that play style of Mongolian trade and pressure is just so cool. You know, keeping your opponent pinned while you have the map to trade on is just so nice. So it looks like trade is going to be beginning, and it is a respectable trade route. It's bringing back food as well as the old gold, of course, at 57 rate, which ain't bad at all. And the raiding is going to be beginning in the Japanese lands once again. But Japan's army is pretty good, and now finally they got a bannerman. So they have a Yumi bannerman, which obviously has 140 uh, HP. I believe it has armor as well. Yeah, he's got a little bit of armor and, of course, uh, does have deflective armor. So he's going to be excellent here. A wild villager on the edge of the map. Uh, not sure what he was up to. Oh, he's trying to get the walls closed. But yeah, he's going to get hunted down by the Mongol army. So it feels pretty bad. Back in the base, we are going to be seeing an upgrade on the uh, manor. Are we seeing this one being upgraded? Yeah. So this one is going to be getting made into a daimyo manor, which is going to make it a little bit tankier. And the Mongols have found another opening. So they're going to be moving in, doing some raiding with some horsemen. Will the villagers garrison up? They will. To be able to fend off the raid, but not before a couple villagers do go down here. The Mongols hunting in. One villager going down. Perhaps the second one is it makes a run for the manor here. On the backside, the Japanese army trying to screen out the main Mongol army. Nice dual prong push here. A couple spearmen and Yumi archers do come out. But overall, how many villager losses do we see in that entire raid? Maybe two. So not the worst thing in the world as the two TCs do fight back against those bad boys. And the Mongols are going to be trying to knock their way into the uh, main base here. But the trade is going to start popping off. And the Mongols are going to get Castle Age here behind that trade, and it's going to get real ugly. Currently, looking at the bank of the Mongols, not a lot, but like I said, the trade investment is going to lead to some pretty uh, pretty substantial growth. Good raiding here. Mangudai circling around the base. More and more villagers being picked. Man, I have to say the Incan's raiding tactics are really, really good. I mean, he is putting a lot of pressure on Prime. He's clearly a very good player. We saw him in the earlier rounds as well. Spearmen moving up, and they're going to be prison shanking down these horsemen here. So uh, a little bit of a lapse in micro there from the Incan. Does lose him a little bit of military. 
But overall, the raiding in the back for the Mongols was effective, and uh, the Palisades are keeping them trapped here. It'd be really funny to see like a Palisade wall being set up here to trap the Mongol army in, and you could potentially wipe them, but... Oh, this is only Archer! So he over-pursues with an Archer-only army, and is going to be getting cut apart by those Kashyyyks with the ranged armor upgrade. There's only one Spearman here who's going to be coming in to try and salvage the situation, but he's obviously going to be overwhelmed. What a true champ. He, he took uh, and delayed those Mongol cap for his people. Probably need to see more military tech here. Maybe a couple more barracks to try and fend these units off. In the middle, we do see Japan looking like they want to press up, but the Mongols uh, do have the map control. So all these units advancing out are going to be absolutely run down by the Incan's cavalry and the horsemen. And that is going to be game blouses for those bad boys as they just get chased back. Maybe the bannerman will live. He does have a high HP pool, but overall he's getting hunted pretty hard. And the palisades here do get finished. So that villager was able to fully seal it in. Meanwhile, the Incan is still raiding, still running about. <laughs> this is a historically accurate battle. Yeah, yeah I suppose so. You know, the, the Mongol tactics are definitely very uh, true to the, the flavor. All right, so Forge here, Stone being grabbed on the map. That's a nice little grab right there. Looking at the Eco, we do see a pretty big deficit here, but we do have double TC, so the Japanese could kind of close that gap right now. Farmhouse on the outside being taken down. The Takezaiku needs to be upgraded too. It's an incredibly important upgrade. It gives carry capacity for villagers. Another Spearman moving out, and he does drop his spear and uh, holds back that Kashyyyk for a moment, but overall is going to be getting wrecked. As now the Japanese archers coming across, Kashyyyk's moving into the lands. Farms partially compromised. Villagers idled inside of this uh, Kura storehouse. has got to feel pretty bad. And he needs more spears. Um, he does have a lot of spears coming this way, so that is finally maybe going to be enough to fend off this Mongol raid. The Mongols just trading like the heathen kings of old right now, just bathing in it. And remember, the Mongolian traders are um, getting 15% movement speed from the EM network. So that upgrade from the silver tree that is unlocked we were talking about is going to be making them faster. So the Mongols are getting even more money that way. Archer's moving out. Where are the spearmen at? Spearmen a little bit out of position. And uh, you can see here the Mongols are going to be taking advantage of that, hunting these guys down. But the spearmen might be able to get them here. Is the Incan going to notice? He does lose one cav unit, and those spearmen are going to be hunting those guys to the ends of the earth. Angu dies sitting on the periphery here, and man, this is some really, really troll raiding. We are going to be seeing Castle Age very, very soon from the Mongols. Um, currently, his food is at 700. His gold bank is very nice. He could even buy his way to the Castle Age. He's getting 1,000 gold a minute right now from his trade, and his opponent's getting 150. I mean, talk about a big deficit. And finally, talk about a little bit of catharsis here. The Japanese finally are able to deal with the Mangudai raiders and push them out. So they are going to be trapped in Palisade. <laughs> they're, they're in purgatory. Those, those guys and the Khan are trapped behind. And it looks like the villagers are going to be able to fully wall them in. So Japan in dire straits. I mean, the Incan has a big eco lead. And he's got those traders, which, you know, basically are like, you know, second TC in a way, right? It's giving him a big, uh, big economic boom there. And we are seeing archery ranges come down. Probably going to be crossbow spam. Japan loves to do samurai. Uh, so having crossbows is going to be pretty prudent there, and uh, or it could just even be archers, depending on the comp of his opponent. Yeah, it's going to be a classic Mongol comp, probably, of crossbow Kashyyyk, or archer, Kashyyyk, archer crossbow Kashyyyk. Finally, the last of the uh, raiders does get taken down. Took a long time for Prime to deal with that, that's for damn sure, but Prime actually going Castle Age behind all that, so well played. You know, he's hanging, hanging in there very well, despite all this pressure. So that floating gate is going to be giving him uh, perpetual free relics. I don't think I've literally seen anybody go for the Buddhist one. It seems like the Shinto free relics are just like the way. And you can put them in military buildings too if you want more efficiency. Looking at Prime, uh, he needs more military eco and finally he's getting it. Okay, so that's what I was kind of talking about. He needs that. Mounted Samurai wouldn't be bad here either. They could do some good work. Incan reaches Castle Age. What landmark did he pop down? Let's see. Um, Kurultai. Yeah, Kurultai is great. So Kurultai is like, if you're a new Mongol player, it's a little bit harder to use, but basically nearby units get um, plus one health. They heal and they also get 20% more damage. So it's like a mobile uh, building you can follow your army around with and just augment their stats and go bananas. Now, what is the tech going to be? He's still making Mangudai, which I love that. He's actually getting Castle Age Mangudai and uh, obviously he's going to be getting Castle Age Kashyyyks and he's going to be pushing with just a ball of death. Japan's army is formidable. It's, it's not awful by any stretch. Uh, at this point, you probably are just spamming Hardened Spearmen as well as um, Onamusha. Onamusha are the mounted range units for the Japanese, which have anti-heavy. They do bonus damage against heavy units. So they would counter the Kashyyyks, and they also have enough range to battle the Mangudai a little bit. Do you guys see this? We have the, the trap in the corner. Check it out. And uh, yeah, it's going to take them 10 years to break down that palisade. Certainly want your Khan in your army. Japan looks like it's going to be moving up. The Shinto priest is going to be trying to grab that relic. Good luck with that. Uh, that's for sure not going to work out. Probably should have dropped these free relics off first to get the income going. But maybe he gets it. Uh, he's not being protected very well. Oh, is he going to get it? Might just pop the wall low. Yeah, he pops it. 
but he's going to get lanced down, and immediately the Japanese army is going to be enveloped. They were kind of lured to their own death. Obviously, Spear's doing some okay damage, but this Mongol army is fully erect. They have the Kurultai nearby, and they're just going to mow down that Japanese army. That was an absolute slaughter, ladies and gentlemen. And this could be the end of Japan. I mean, now we have a 34 army against 5. The Mongols are going to go free their Khan from his cage, and uh, and then they're just going to probably full bore attack here. Coral Tai is going to park out front of the base, and we're going to see potentially ramps coming in. Yeah, we already see mangonels and siege equipment being produced. That was really, really brutal. Dark Rider, repeater crossbows everywhere you go, you see him. Yeah, I mean, Japan basically has Dark Rider, repeater crossbows, you know. One of their units here. So veteran Kashyyyks as well as Mangudai getting in, freeing the Khan from his prison. That was an absolutely brutal fight. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show that certainly the old civs can compete with the new ones, <laughs> at least in this situation. Japan trying to set up more uh, economy here. We do have the Shogunate Castle coming, which is a nice tech by Prime. That is going to be giving them 75% gather rate on all his nearby villagers. The Kura Storehouse is fully operational. So Japan's food economy is going to be really, really good. The problem is that Mongol army is thick. And pretty much anything that isn't near the Shogunate Castle is going to be dying. Like, this is dead, this is dead. Uh, everything on the periphery away from the center mass of the Japanese Empire is going to be falling. And Mongols are going to be getting a ton of bounty. Like, a ton of bounty from just terrorizing these buildings. The Japanese army is 13 supply against 40. Um, he currently, looking at his food prime, does not have his food economy fully going yet. But now it looks like it's online. But is it going to be too little too late? The rocket comes out, heat seeking, hunts down that unit, walls being reapplied. And the longer the Mongols just sit back, the better it is for the Japanese because they can recoup their eco and they have the Shogunate Castle now. So all their villagers' eco around is going to be great. Um, unfortunately, these free relics are going to waste. That would be 150 free gold a minute from these two relics if they had been placed immediately. So that was a slight blunder by Prime, but not like game ending by any stretch, but certainly a bit of a mistake. And now we're starting to see some samurai coming out. So samurai are okay. Uh, Kashyyyks will trade well into them, unfortunately. Um, in this case, they will tank the Mangudai very well, though. And this is this is always scary. A coral tie parked outside of your base with the old uh, Mangada or Mangadel. Rams are on the way too. Japan is going to be under big pressure here, and this rating is going to get absolutely crunk. And if the Mongols win this game, today's grand final is going to be a duel of fates between the Ayubids and the Mongols. Very interesting matchup. I can't help but think the Ayubids might have a good time there because of their camels. Although, hmm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that goes. That, that's interesting. Mongols can play infantry super well too. That's something people don't realize about Mongols. Their infantry is not that they have any like unique upgrades, but like it can be very, very dangerous with the Coral Tie support. Oh no, the Mangudai have gotten into the base. Are they going to start trying to run around? There's not too many angles for them to move. So it looks like they realize that and they're even killing the buildings with their archer shots. So Ram is coming across the map. Trebuchet would be very good too. I would like to see a, a traction trap being set up. And the Mangudai have found a way in. This is like every every uh, historical general's worst nightmares. Like, oh god, the Mangudai have gotten free in our lands. As the Mangudai start circling around, and they're just going to be raiding the hell out of this base. And these archers probably will trade okay into them. So yeah, just going to want to find villagers back here. And they're just trolling about. Mangudai going to just wreck these villas here. So, yep, that's another seven or eight villagers going down. That's going to be tanking the eco. Japan's eco is pretty good at 81, though. But they lose four villagers there, and the Mangudai going to continue their reign of tyranny. Whereas in the front, battering rams moving in, but a little bit of a lapse in micro here from the Incan does allow the Japanese defenders to hold this off. Sly, thank you for the eight months of membership. Imagine if CA made PvP like AoE. I know, I know. Yeah, it's it's just it's just like I man, I, I was playing some Total War ladder the other day, and it was just like a lag fest, and it was just like so miserable. I was like, God, dude, no servers is a big problem in that game. But don't worry, we're going to be back to covering some Total War stuff when uh, when there's some new action going on. Archers chasing. Honestly, the Mangudai could turn around and kill this entire army if they want to right now. Here in the front, we see the veteran Kashyyyks piling in, battling the last Samurais. We need to see some Yumi archers. Not the uh, not the Yumi, excuse me, the uh, Ona. The Onamusha. I'm trying to get all these names down. It's a lot. But the Onamusha are very good against these cavalry. They would do bonus damage against them. Up in the high ground, we see Mangonels continue to pound. Uh, I'm not... Not sure why we're not seeing Onamusha. They're literally designed to deal with these type of units. On the bottom side, the Mangudai uh, decide to take the fight, and they move into the archers, and they are able to get a lot of them. So the Japanese defenders in the backfield certainly not having a good time, as these bad boys are just riding around, picking bills. And uh, yeah, they could honestly just move in and finish those off if they want to. Pulling back, triple Mangudel. Another siege workshop is going to be dropped down in the front. Tough stuff indeed. Healing too. Man, the Kuril Tide is going to be healing those guys up, which is so nasty. All that effort that the Japanese defenders put in is going to be mitigated. Prime desperately trying to hold on, man. But this dual prong terrace and also the, the trade is just so foul. Like this trade is so good. It could even be made better. You could probably set up a market like right here 
and it would be a little bit stronger trade. But overall, it's still good enough that you could just keep it as is. Mangonel's going to be moving in, continuing to torch down buildings. Spring Alds being made by the Japanese defenders. Spring Alds, of course, uh, are the counter against Mangonel's, but it's only one. And I uh, I think that there could be a dive here for it. No, it doesn't look like it. Any trebuchets coming out? Nope, Spring Alds or Mangonel's. And those Mangos are just going to pound down those defenders. Those spear units getting wrecked by the Mango shots. Absolute brutality. And now the Mongols have broken through. The defenders of Japan have faltered. And the Mongolian hordes are going to be pushing into the base. And these villagers are going to be forced to garrison, potentially. Yep, looks like they're either garrisoning. Everybody's running into the TCs. And guys, on top of this, on top of this, the Mangudai are still raiding in the back. And if they find the villagers, the wood villagers back here, that's just going to be so disgusting. I mean, they're still getting in and picking off bills on pretty much every front. But I think Prime must know that this is probably game over. But it's been a great... Prime has played great today. Great wins. Um, solid first early round match. This has been a good one, too. But, you know... The Incan is, is, is a dreaded Mongolian main. That is what he plays, and uh, it, it really is showing here as the Mangonel is dropping some big pot shots down there. On the bottom side, we see Eco just being devastated by the Mangudai raids on the other side. And here, what do we got? 20 villagers there. If they head down that way, it's going to be pretty nasty. Mongols just methodically, you know, just a methodical demolition of this base. More rams on the way in. And we are probably going to be seeing the uh, Spring Alts holding well. The Shogunate Palace is one of the best defensive units. It's so good. It's just like obliterating these Kashyyyks as they move in. But man, the map control, the economy of the Mongols has got to be popping off. It's just all nasty. Japan actually has a pretty good economy considering the raiding. But if the Kashyyyks discover um, some villager pockets, it's going to be brutal. And they do. So here we see some uh, wood villagers who are going to be chopped to pieces uh, depending on the reaction of the Incan. Looks like he's a little bit busy in the front line. Coral Tai getting set up in the Japanese base. The flex, that is big. And uh, now the Shogunate Castle with its 13,000 HP is going to you know, potentially be in a little bit of danger here. Rams taking down houses. Villagers being butchered. 69 eco. That's what she said. The blessed number. But that is a big economic disadvantage compared to the 100 of the Mongols. And look at this. Wood villagers in the back being pushed off. Several being taken down here. Houses being built in the back. It looks like overall... Uh, this is going to be the end of the road, and the Mongols are going to close the game out here in a minute. Now, the Japanese can defend for a long time. They're a very good defensive sieve. Very much like English, where like pushing English is just pure misery. Japan is kind of the same way, but it doesn't mean you can't push them. But obviously, uh, you know, it takes some serious effort. The Shogunate uh, Castle here is just brutal. The Sheiks get in there. They take down that old uh, Spring Alt, which is going to be allowing the old artillery to shine very well here. Traction Trebuchet is now online. Rams are destroying the military infrastructure, which is going to be shutting down the Japanese production. And on the backside, the Mangudai are circling around. 57 villagers have died, which is a testament to how well Jap Japan is producing Eco. But yeah, if he finds this, that's just going to be so, so foul. And I think he's going to. The Incan, he's got he's got the blood scent here as he does find the villagers uh, harvesting lumber. And the Mangudai are just going to just shoot them to pieces. And that's just going to be his wood Eco completely gone. Here, this Daimyo Palace in a little bit of trouble. Trebuchet still knocking it down. Rams up at the top side. Taking down the barracks. Villagers desperately repairing. Spearmen just rushing everywhere. Trying their best to stabilize this fight. But Mongol reinforcements are pouring in. And uh, pouring in like the Salmon of Capistrano. Yes. Imagine if Japan... Invasion of Japan if Mongols <laughs> hadn't crashed. Yeah, hadn't had the boats. The tsunamis for sure. Yeah, Potentially so. Potentially so. So the veteran Mangudai harassing the back farms. All those villagers got taken apart. 70 villager kills for the Mongols right now. Absolutely devastating. Traction trebuchets almost have the Daimyo Palace down. But the last samurai, they, they're valiant. The Bushido, they're holding. The warrior poets are going to be going quietly into the night. But that is going to be the tap out. GG, well played. Prime played a great game. It was a good fight. Very tough Mongolian opponent. And uh, I hope to see you back, Prime. You played great, man. That was, that was a great performance. And now we're going to be moving on to the grand finals, which is going to be the Incan versus Quill. Two Conqueror players. I believe Incan was Conqueror 1 or 2, and Quill, I know, is Conqueror 3. So it should be a good fight between those two. It certainly could go either way. All right, all right. Let's get it, man. Let us get it. So Grand Finals going to get set up here, and we're going to enjoy a sip of water. That was a good game. A very solid match. So we got one new save and one old save. We have the Ayubids making it to the Grand Finals. And, of course, the classic Mongols making it to the Grand Finals as well. So that's what's going to be going down here. So they'll set that lobby up. Scores will be reported. And uh, let's see. So how many rounds are there? I think if Quill wins this, he'll unlock uh, a new avatar. And both of them will. If the Ankin wins this, he'll be unlocking an avatar as well. Yeah, they both will. A tier 2 avatar. Because it's 1, 5. You get an avatar at 1 win, at 5 wins, at 10, and then 20, 40, and 50. 
50 is the final avatar for each faction. For Japan, I think the final one is the uh, the shotgun guys. Yeah, which is fun. All right, let's take this round of quests. Let's do it. Do it. Mongols up to up to uh, some serious harass. I'm curious to see how old uh, Quill is going to be dealing with that. Ayubids, I feel, have good tools against it, though. Desert Raiders feel like they'll be really good against it. The fact that they can have their bows to fight off the Mango Dies, and they can also fight off cavalry with their swords, they feel like they'll be very useful there. Yeah. My brain says that Quill will win, but my heart wants Inkin to win. Yeah, who knows? It could go either way, man. It could go either way. I might try Realms of Ruin. I might give it a try. I'll, uh, I'll check it out this weekend. I'll watch Pwn play it a little bit and see. Because I then the early access, it was a little bit clunky. Um, if they fixed a lot of that, maybe I'd be interested. I'm not a big fan of the Age of Sigmar setting. Um, but, you know, I can get over that. All right. So they're setting up the lobby right now. Let me go make sure there's no admin stuff I need to do. See how this is looking. Okay. Looking down here. Everybody's chatting. And uh, we're going to close this out. Oh, yeah, we're about two hours. Yeah, we could do an FFA to close it out at the end. Yeah, I think that would be fun. We could do an old one. I, I have the itch to play myself, so I'm kind of like, I'm like, yes. We'll see how long it goes. If this is like an hour long match, maybe not, but yeah. You and the PC Gamer Reviewer. Oh, what did he say? Did he not like the AOS setting? <laughs> what did they say about it? He basically gave the game a, because he prefers original Warhammer over AOS. That's pretty funny. I mean, I massively prefer Warhammer Fantasy over AOS, but like I wouldn't judge the game on that merit. But for me, a big part of gaming is like the aesthetic of the factions I'm playing is very important, you know? Like, like that's like if Warhammer Total War, if Total War Warhammer was like not the Warhammer universe, it wouldn't be like the, the Warhammer universe is what makes it good. The warmer fantasy universe you know so it's pretty important like in this game it's super fun to have the immersion of these different cultures and see the inflections of what makes them unique based on the devs like design it's that's what makes this game so fun too right it's the it's the setting i'm feel i'm i'm feeling the call of the uh olive garden for sure yeah i'm feeling it all right so it is time let the nerglings feast that guy's name was funny. All right, so are they in the match right now? Let's see what it's going to be. Uh, nope, still queuing up right now. So we have a moment while they get their lobby set up. And they can go from there. <laughs> the dreaded Mongol trade, yeah. They're all talking about it in there. That's yeah, fun. Cool. So Ayubids versus Mongols. Prime is uh, browsing custom, so that's not them. Let me see if I can find Quill in here. I really wish they would add a search feature for friends list. That'd be really nice. That'd be incredibly cool. I have to pop out in about 10 minutes. Hey, Gunhound, thanks for your help today, man. Thank you, thank you. What I've seen, the Undead Aesthetic in ROR looks cool to me. Yeah, the, the, the... But for me, one of my, one of the reasons why I like, like, Warhammer Fantasy so much more than Age of Sigmar is the, the real world inflections in the factions, right? Like, when you look at the Empire, they have a lot of cool historical influence. Like, the Great Swords are basically launch necks. They're based on the Holy Roman Empire but with some fantasy elements, um, which is really cool. Like, and the vampire counts have that kind of like Central Eastern European like style of like, you know, like Dracula, uh, you know, Bram Stoker aesthetic. It's really like, I love those things. And Bretonia having like a combination of, you know, kind of Western European um, culture with like, you know, Arthurian legend. Like, I love that. Whereas AOS, it's just, it doesn't really have that element. You know what I'm saying? Click add and find them. Yeah, that's true. Looks like he's still in the lobby anyway, so they're getting it set up. Hopefully they don't have too many uh, problems adding one another. Looks like they just tagged him. Cool. And uh, yeah, we'll be getting started in just a second. Yeah, old versus new sibs. Oh, by the way, the stats aren't going to be very accurate, but we just do it for fun because, you know, there's a, a vast skill level of players, so the metadata isn't going to be super important, but uh, eventually maybe it will be, but we have stats. So you can see the win percentages of different factions on uh, so just like total tavern we have stat tracking so you can see we've had um ayubids are four and one mongols are four and one you can see what factions they beat um which is pretty cool you got order of the dragon down here so order of the dragon was played today they actually were able to beat uh, joan of arc once and uh 
So yeah, we have stats just like Total Tavern, which is fun. So it doesn't really give us much now and nor is it, I don't think it's going to be accurate considering the variance of skill level, but maybe after a long time, it will give us some good solid data. So yeah, it's just something fun you can see. It's something fun. Did the Incan play Company of Heroes 2? Maybe he did. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, where are you? Gravity, that's uh, not you. Coming down here. So we do have stat tracking. We do have it. Okay, there's Allied. He played earlier. Delhi didn't quite make it. And Quill looks like he's in lobby. Cool. So they're just getting all the settings for the lobby, and then we'll be we'll be good to start. Our two both set up a lobby for the finals and refused to accept each other's invites. Well, are they still struggling with it? I don't know. Order of the Dragon seems really hard to play. That's one that I've been struggling with. You know. Let's see if they're joining the other's lobby. Um, oh, they might be having a lobby bug. Okay, that's what it is. They can happen occasionally. Uh, thanks, Turn, for the site and the tournament organization. Hey, you're welcome. We're going to try and do at least one H tournament a week. I'll, I'll play next week, too. I, I would love to play in one of these. I just wanted to kind of cast it today, though. Pwn vs. Gunhound is going to be fun. Oh, yeah, dude. The show match of uh, the show match of show matches. The Clash of the Titans. There's a, a search for you. Just click Add. Okay, that's nice. So I can do that. Join match. Make an Xbox stream. Oh God. Yeah, you can play this game on console, can't you? That's pretty nuts. Like playing RTS on console has always been like a very perplexing thing. I, I remember playing, oh man, was it the original Command and Conquer back on like PlayStation back in the 90s? And then StarCraft, um, StarCraft was also on, um, I think it was N64 had StarCraft. Who will you cast if you're playing? Oh, I mean, I would just cast my games, obviously, live cast them. Old Man Hands? Uh, I've been playing 1v1s. I play them off stream usually. I play much better off stream. If I'm like trying to commentate and explain what I'm doing. <laughs> so I've been playing offline, but yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Okay. So let's try Let's try this tool that you were talking about. Is it going to crash the game when I try and add somebody? Uh, all right. So Quill. Is he here? Okay, that's like not super efficient. There's a lot of those. Yeah, still in lobby. StarCraft was on N64, yeah. The console on PC are not crossplay. That makes sense. It'd be really unfair. Like people with mouse and keyboard would crush console players. By the way, turn point. <laughs> yeah. Would no controllers are actually harder on my hands. It's weird. Mouse and keyboard are doable, but controllers uh, actually surprisingly difficult. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I remember renting games from Blockbuster. That was a lot of fun. Red Alert, the Red Alert 2 Command and Con Red Alert 2 was Command and Conquer was one of my favorites. That that game was great. That was a classic, classic early, early nine, uh, like early RTS game. Warcraft 3 was obviously a big one. Um, I think the first RTS I ever played, the first one I ever played would have been Warcraft uh, 2 Tides of Darkness. That would have been mid 90s, like 1995, 96. I remember going to a buddy's house and just getting addicted. Um, shortly after that, I was just, you know, had it at home and, uh, yeah. Good times, man. Good times. Unfortunately, controllers and mouse and keyboard get matched with each other on Xbox. Oh, that's rough. Yeah, controllers are harder, my opinion, on the hands. All right, guys. Let's get it, baby. It's go time. So take it a look here at the grand finals match. We might have a little bit of a delay as we load in here. I'm not sure, but we got it, man. It's gonna be Mongols versus Ayubids here. The duel of fates, two minutes until go time. Yeah, Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness was really fun. I, I love that game. It'd be fun to go and back and do a stream of that, although I don't remember any of that. So some people in chat, Command and Conquer Generals. Yeah, my first RTS was Command and Conquer Windows 95 edition. So do you guys remember back in the 90s? Um, so when back when dial-up internet was still a thing, you had to launch, we launched through AOL, America Online. And uh, there was, you could play Warcraft 2 uh, Tides of Darkness for free on, on, the, on the browser. So you could like launch it through the AOL browser and play on there. So that's where I really got into that. Yeah, it was, that was great. Yeah, StarCraft was uh, definitely an innovator, 100%. All right, let's see. So the match is on. Let's see who wins here. I think they're just starting right now. Yeah, it looks like it. I don't think I'm behind. 
You ever play Dune? Yeah, I played the early Dune games. I don't remember them well. I remember um, playing, God, was it Dune? It was like an early Dune game. I think it might have been around the year 2000. It was, um, like, I remember playing Harkonnens in that and getting, like, these units. I think they were called Devastators. Like, they, that were really cool. But I was, like, a child. I mean, I would have been, like, maybe 10 years old when I was playing that. I can't remember. 11? I'm not sure. Honestly, after playing the previous turn FFA in this journey, I feel a lot more confident. Yeah, Kirk, playing in these events will definitely help you improve. Because getting good at 1v1 will make you much better at FFA too. You'll be able to survive against opponents individually and um, and all that. You guys don't have a... <laughs> yeah. Dial-up internet. You remember your mom? Like you would have someone call your house. And if someone called your house, it would like crash your internet. Because it was like all in one line. <laughs> yeah. Dial-up internet. Holy shit. You guys remember the sounds that it made? like dial up internet when you would actually be connecting. I don't know. I assume a lot of you guys are around my age, but that was, um, that was some wild stuff. I think it was literally called Dune 2000. Yeah. All right, guys, welcome to the grand finals of our first tournament back. It's been a long time since we've casted 1v1 tournaments in Age of Empires, but I want to sincerely thank you all for joining. Hopefully this will be a fun weekly occurrence that we can all do together. So Quill, Going to be playing the Ayubids, the Lord of the Camels. Going to be spawning on the southeast side of the map into the northwest. Or more west with a little bit of a tinge of north. It is going to be the Incan here. And he is going to be on the Mongols. So we'll see what he's going to be doing. Setting up his uh, gear up in the north. He does have his Uvu as well. Not sure what he was doing with that tree line there. I guess just gathering the 50 wood. And it's on, baby. Turn assuming his chat is old. He's right. Yeah, no, for sure. If you saw the channel demographics for this channel, it's like, I think like 98% dudes. And it's like the average age is between 25 and 37, I think, is like the biggest age bracket, like with an emphasis on the early 30s is like the stats. I'm 35 myself. All right, guys, let's focus on the game. Enough rambling. It's go time, baby. So the Mongols not going to be doing any harass. This map feels a little bit bigger, too. This is a really cool one. Look in the middle. Like the middle is like this big, like empty valley with a bunch of gold nodes. That's going to be where everybody, that's Flavor Town right there. This is Guy Fieri Town, man. Everybody's going to be uh, fighting over those resources there. House of Wisdom popping up here. Early berry bushes, no surprises. Ayubids, much like the Abbasid, like their berry bushes. So they are going to be feasting like the heathen kings of old on those berries. And over to the west, Mongols got their Uvu. Um, are gathering food and gold explicitly now, so going to be trying to hit a standard feudal timing here. So, yeah, everything's pretty normal. Nothing crazy, no early game Dark Age shenanigans, no early horsemen. That Khan having a good run, certainly, certainly uh, getting a good haul here. So these are two Conqueror players. You guys have seen some varying skill levels today. I think you've seen some Platinum, some Diamond, some Conqueror. I don't know, I don't think we had any Bronze players sign up, the Lords of Bronze, but that, by the way, that is going to be a, uh, ah, caster mode every time. I always forget that. So it's doing some weird sci-fi stuff right now. But that is going to be doing a new series that we're going to be uh, starting. Yes, we are going to be doing a Lords of Bronze series where we have bronze duels, which will be fun. So we'll grab some players from our community that are bronze players, but they have to be legitimate bronze players, you know, and uh, we'll have them duel it out. And we'll put like prizes up too. We'll put like a nice little cash prize for the winner. It'll be a lot of fun. You know, we got to see them at their most ferocious and their most hungry. Pone, well, Pone, Pone, will you be the king of the, the Bronze the bronze Lord series? Perhaps so. Perhaps. Khan circling around the top, doing a little bit of scouting as far as the map goes. We have dual sacred site, I think, on this map. Are there two sacreds or are there three? So one here, one here. And I always thought this map had one in the middle as well. But it looks like this is a very, very interesting sacred site. So check it out. We have in the middle uh, is devoid of any sacred play. But each player has like a home sacred site. Yeah, no smurfing, obviously. We're going to evaluate the players and all that sort of good stuff. So, But yeah, we got very interesting sacred play on this map. So winning with sacred, a sacred victory would be incredibly difficult. I mean, you still could. You could move, like, you could come and wall this corner and steal it and then go for your own and just, like, fight over here. And it would be really hard for them to decap your home sacred site. So there are some options for sacred victories. But I feel like you would have to have, like, it would be more of a win more mechanic. So age up is coming and it is going to be the economic wing of industry for the Ayubids. So we saw Quill do this earlier and I love this build order. I have to admit, I think I'm going to steal the hell out of this build. It seems clean. It seems smooth. He's basically getting a second TC like right when he ages up, which is very, very powerful. And uh, yeah, I, I like this a lot. So he uses the economic wing of industry, which immediately gives him 300 wood upon aging up here. 
And yeah, obviously the Khan, the Incan, is going to see this. Now, what the Incan can do in response is go Silver Tree. So if his opponent's going to be sitting back and just kind of having a big macro build, he can just go absolutely bananas. He can set up a trade post to Silver Tree and just do North to South trade and just have, just be fully erect. The most erect trade route that can possibly happen, you know? So we'll see what happens. Over on the west side, it's going to be Deerstones though, so not going to be Silver Tree, which is interesting. Um, obviously, he's staying true to his playstyle. He is the Lord of Mangudai. So how how will the Mangudai trade against the Desert Raiders is the question. I'm really curious to see that interaction because that's going to be probably the obvious response that we see here. A lot of villagers idling. It looks like they're going to be pulled back to the berry bushes right now. Oh, did the scout actually die? So a little bit of sloppiness there from the Ink, and he does lose his scout, which is going to suck. He's not going to have as much vision on where his opponent's placing the TC. He could always rebuild it, but I suppose he's just going to be scouting with Mangudai, which is going to be more than fine. Yeah, the Desert Raiders could shut down the trade, but the Mongols could also contest it as well. Mongols have great open field play between Kashyyyks. Uh, granted, Kashyyyks aren't very good against Desert Raiders, so it would mainly be Mangudai. And yeah, they might struggle to contest the Desert Raiders. Actually, that's a really, really true point. Yeah, it's a really, really true point. Mongol meta is deer stones into regular trade posts. Yeah, makes sense. I don't know too much about the Mongol meta, but now I do. I'm learning with you guys, so... Mangudai going to be hustling across the map. Second TC going to be set up near the berry bushes here to be securing that food. Uh, not near the deer camp. I actually thought it was going to go up here to get the gold as well as he would. But nope, it's going to be to the southwest here. And now these bad boys going to be hitting that tree line pretty damn hard. But the Mangudai moving in. I can't help but feel they're not going to have too much success on this raid. Um, looking at Quill, he has not built any military tech yet. Are these guys on wood? They are. So they're going to be getting wood so they can build some military tech. The TC's natural defenses should be adequate to defend against these initial Mangadai raids. But against the Ankeny trades 100% of the time. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what schemes the Mongolian Lord has. Mangudai are out and we are going to be seeing a stable. So most likely going to be Kashyyyk. The Desert Raiders are going to be probably popping out shortly after. I wonder, he's probably going to go military wing, like uh, age up here and get the um, reinforcements to spawn the Desert Raiders out of his base. Yeah, it spawns three Desert Raiders every two minutes for the rest of the game. So I, I would suspect that's going to be the play. Archery range up on the high ground here. I was going down as well to connect the Golden Age. So currently he is not in the first Golden Age, which gives him Villager Gather Rate. So he's going to be trying to connect to get that sweet Golden Age going, which uh, will be popping off soon. Mangudai here. It's a big, it's a big map. I don't know if they like change the size or anything like that, but we will see. All right. So four Mangudai have gathered. Going to be able to definitely harry the gold lines in the back. Over on the west side for the Mongols. Do we see trade? No, Blacksmith coming up. Okay, so going to be trying to get some uh, aggression tech, maybe an arrow upgrade for the Mangudai so they can pick off the villagers with a little bit more efficiency. And now the Incan's going to be circling around. We do see an early, early lead in the Ayubid economy. Desert Raiders popping out, and uh, we'll see how they perform. We're going to get to see the Jewel, man. Yeah, we'll get to see the Jewel. One villager going to be going down initially, and if you can get two bills from this raid, that's going to be very cost-effective. And it looks like he did miss shoot there a little bit. Maybe going to pop one. So could have gotten two villagers there, but unfortunately did shoot the building instead of shooting the villagers and paid the price. But the Desert Raiders are out. We got one Desert Raider on his mighty camel so far. Um, trade on the top of the map here would be super good. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see like a mass Mangudai raiding with that behind it. It's really, really cool. Desert Raider switching to his bow. He has no ranged armor though. So here's the thing. The Mangudai might be able to overwhelm the Desert Raider here because it has no ranged armor. Like, those Mangudai are going to kill it. If Incan plays properly, yeah, he should just kill that. Chase it down. There's no reason that thing should live. All right, so maybe the Desert Raider is not going to have such a good time. We talked about in the earlier game how they can certainly struggle against the uh, ranged DPS. And the Mangudai do hit for five damage, so not bad. And uh, yeah, they have shut down the gold for now, which is not bad at all. On the other side, Kashyyyk's coming in. So we're seeing the Incan with the, the dreaded high APMs. Villager's actually going down for Quill. So far, we have four Villager kills. Going to be another one getting popped down here. And these Kashyyyk's are going to continue harrying the Villagers. Only seven can fit in there. So I'm really liking this pressure from the Incan. But what is the follow-up going to be? Ranged upgrade coming in to give him a little bit more DACA. The Khan has arrived as well. So those bad boys are going to be circling around. And here uh, we do see the Kashyyyk's continuing to farm villagers. Wow, that was a great raid. I mean, seven villagers kill, a seven villager kills, bringing the eco within four, considering your opponent's on two TCs is mega valuable. Villagers trying to prison shank down this scout, and it looks like they're going to get it. So Quill is going to be losing a scout as well. Those villagers will need to get back to gold shortly as the Mangudai and the Khan keep enveloping the base. But the Kashyyyk diving, very good. Quill does seem to have adequate defenses now, so he does have five archers. Uh, as well as a Desert Raider who's going to be chilling near the TC here. And are the Mongols going to be trying to pop off on trade or is there going to be Fast Castle? 
Do we see any more upgrades coming out? Nope, looks like just the ranged upgrade, I believe, for these bad boys. So we can look here. Yeah, he only currently has the balanced projectiles, whereas the wheelbarrow is the only upgrade for the Ayubids. Pretty standard stuff. In the back, one Mangu does get picked off, gets swarmed by the five Ayubid archers on the defense. So they get taken down right there. And over on the west side, the Ayubid economy is starting to pick up once again after the dreaded Mongol harass. More Kashyyyk's coming out, so using the Uvu production to get the double on those. And yes... Yes, let it flow. The Great Mongolian Trade Network. This is what it's all about. Keep your opponents suppressed in the base. Keep them scared and just take advantage of the map control and the trade. It's been a great, great match so far. This is really fun. So yeah, that's going to be going down. That's going to be some big trade. 71 a pop, is it? I could have sworn this should be more. We'll have to see what it looks like after it all settles and everything. So look at this. Kashyyyk's moving in. Archer's going down. He idles the gold villagers of Quill once again. Quill's gold economy not having a good time and he's probably just gonna keep doing this he's gonna keep popping in and out in and out and harrying those gold villagers meanwhile attacking on the other front as well he tries the same thing twice he tried to get the kashiks in there um but this time the desert raiders are waiting for them and they're able to mitigate them um overall one villager does go down there but that's a bit of a better exchange there for the Ayubids, but the raiding will continue on the other side this is some really really nasty dual pronged play just bouncing back and forth and really just keeping Quill on his toes, which is what you need to do against a player of Quill's caliber. Quill is a conqueror three level player. So if you, you know, just let him, leave him to his own devices, he's just going to macro and become a, a dark god for sure. Uh, 71 trade here. And yep, so it's going to be 71. That is a hell of a lot. And outposts are now being set up. And uh, we're going to be seeing towers probably spread out. Yeah, we have a tower here for the EM network. And most likely one will be set up here to get the 15% faster movement on the trade. So Quill does muster a decent force here. The Mangudai going to need to pull back. Um, in terms of military investment, it does not look like the Incan is making that much military. I think he's just going to be trying to cackle and trade right now. He certainly has control of the map. Um, Quill is very, very much pinned in his base here, but Quill could move out and cause some havoc. I mean, he's got a decent force, and I think he's going to want to do that soon. If he doesn't shut down the trade that is uh, going on up north, like he's going to be drowned in gold. That is... That is some fat trade, ladies and gentlemen. Fat trade. Ram, thank you for becoming a channel member. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you for supporting our multiplayer community here. It means a lot, my friend. Appreciate all you guys. And uh, let's keep it going, man. So Khan, he is hard. He's kiting the Desert Raiders. And the Mangodai definitely seemed to out-trade the Desert Raiders in open field. Just kind of running. But the Khan, a little bit sloppy. You know, he was, uh, he was the uh, disappointing uh, child of Genghis Khan. And he gets picked off there. And another one will replace him. And perhaps he'll be a little bit better off. Over on the far side here, we do see more trade going down. Daximus, thank you for becoming a channel member and supporting all the multiplayer action here. Thank you, thank you. Helps pay for the prize pool for the tournaments. And uh, guys, I really appreciate it. All right, so Ayubid's macroing, but Mongols are not that far behind. Quill obviously knows there's trades. And this is where Mongols can really clinch the game. If the Mongols come and crush this army and don't lose much trade in the process, that is what's really going to be... Um, and yeah, this is a big tell here. The fact that these archers are lingering here are going to get pipped off by the Mongols in open field. Kashyyyk's going to ride them down. He's got to know that Quill is, is coming to shut down his trade. But if the Mongols crush this army, uh, that's really going to be setting Quill back. Um, and that's just going to basically just mean the trade is going to go unchallenged for a long time. And we'll see. It is four raiders, uh, four Kashyyyk's and Mangudai. More reinforcements should be coming this way for the Mongols. Uh, he doesn't see any trade. Pretty fortuitous timing here for uh, the Incan. His trade wasn't there when the Ayubids arrived, so um, there is a chance that Quill might think he's not trading and leave, but I mean, Quill should stay there and at least leave something to make sure nothing happens. So the Mongol army is going to be heading down south, but the trade's immediately going to be shut down here, so this is going to be good for Quill. Looking at the Incan right now in his base, uh, he's building more and more stables, so a lot of mobility is going to be coming out, which is risky against the camels. But the traders are going to be popped in the face, and now he realizes that he needs to go deal with this. So he needs to pull back all of his traders that are on the way. Golden Age Tier 2 has been developed, and for the Ayubids, I believe it's a bit different. It gives them research speed of uh, 50%, which is really good. So you can get all your techs a little bit faster, and you can live your best life. All right, the traders have been pulled back. Uh, honestly, the traders can just go this direction, too. This map is actually really nice for Mongol trade. Like, they can legit just reroute and go down here, but I think the Mongol army is going to crush this force. We do see the uh, the Kashyyyks, but they don't get their charge. A little bit sloppy there, but nonetheless, they do get in. And the Desert Raiders and the Archers are going to be massacred. Good micro by Quill trying to pick off the Mangudai, but also we see Incan responding to this, and he is going to be retreating his Mangudai to try and salvage them. In the middle of the map, another wave of pressure is going to be on the way. And the north to south trade, uh, no, it's going to say exactly where it is, so he didn't switch that up. But Quill is, you know, he's coming for blood, man. He's pressuring down here. On the top side, Kashyyyk's as well as Mangudai are uh, at the ready. Are they going to be raiding more? 
Yeah, and the trade is going... Oh, look at this. Now the trade's going the other direction. Hey, still, thank you. Huge fan of the channel. Never seem to catch you live since the first. Dude, thank you so much for that. That is a huge donation, man. That's like 100 bucks. Thank you, man. Thank you. And I'm glad you're able to catch it live. And I'll be trying to do more early streams. Uh, I know the late night streams are tough for people to catch. So thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, man. Hope to see you in more streams. So once again, Quill coming to shut down the rating. And, uh, or shut down the trading. And I think the Mongols are going to have to respond to that and make sure to shut it down uh, with a more ferocious emphasis. Now the trade has been reallocated, so it looks like it's going to be going this direction. So the trade is going from the bottom to the top, and that is going to be giving the Mongols some pretty good gold income. How many traders did they lose there? It looks like one trader was lost. The other one's probably rerouted. The Mongolian army, will they win this? This army's a little bit stronger. We do have six raiders here, as well as nine archers. But the Mongols, yeah, they got plenty of reinforcements. So the horsemen... Should be able to overwhelm this. Kashyyyk still hit hard, uh, despite the camel mitigating the DPS a little bit. And I think they should be able to beat down this army. The Hardened Khan giving it a attack speed upgrade, and that is going to be another army of Quills drowning. But it is buying time for him to macro up safely. And is he aging? Uh, no, he's staying in this age. Looks like he's mixing in some spears to his army with the Phalanx. They obviously get more attack range, which is really nice. And yeah, mixing in spears will start to change the tide of these battles for sure. The trade switch going from this direction is really, really clever. You know, I think that's a great play. You know, maybe still keep a little bit going north to south so that Quill thinks that's your primary trade route while you keep trading to the bottom. As far as the base goes, no age up. Quill currently spending all of his resources as he gets them, although he does have 600 food. So maybe, maybe he's going to be... No, it looks like he just bought some food. I'm not sure, but perhaps that was the case. Tower here being harried, and now the Mongolian army is on the defense. So this is good by Quill. He's putting Incan on the defensive, so... You know, the, he's not going to be as susceptible to raids. But he is losing a lot of troopers in these uh, engagements here. You can see the uh, DPS certainly kicking in there. As far as value lost, you can see this metric here. This casting tool has a lot of neat stuff. So the army value that has been... Oh, that's cool. So 2,300 against 1,000 there. Yeah, these casting tools are awesome, man. It's really, really nice to see. So yeah, north to south trade. Yeah, he's got that sneaky, sneaky trade network. And uh, I don't know if Quill is uh, expecting that. Quill might have thought that he successfully dealt for dealt with the raiding. Are the Mongols going to be switching to basic archers now? Look, looks like it's just Mangudai. Because there's going to be a lot of spearmen in here soon. And with the Phalanx upgrade, they're going to really wreck those cavalry units if they can get the numbers that they need. All right, so the army is now raiders and hardened spearmen. That's a really nice army comp. That is very, very clean. And potentially could start winning the trades against the Mongolian army. Although the Mongolians can kite them. The Mangudai can pull them back. Um, we do see Quill moving out of the map, taking some deer encampments and berry bushes wherever he can. And do we see any age up on the horizon? 460 and 207. He could go for the rapid age up, the advancement one, which makes him age up quicker. Certainly not a bad idea. Although, yeah, I don't know if this, uh, what, how he's playing really calls for that. A little bit of kiting going down from the Khan as well as the Mangudai is going to be forcing it back. And now the Incan is going to be seeing the prevalence of spears in the army, so probably will be changing his army comp a little bit. Maybe getting more basic archers to just cut those bad boys down. Economic upgrades for the Incan, Horticulture and Double Broadaxe, and for Quill, he's got Wheelbarrow, Broadaxe, and a Ranged Arrow upgrade. So the Mongol economy, I mean, could straight up just be stronger. The fact that this trade is going down to the west side of the map is very, very good. Very, very good indeed. Yeah, this is so, it's such a relief to like, yeah, for like a game that's like, I know, I've been talking about this, but like just having dedicated servers is just so nice. Dude. It's so nice, just suffering for years. Do not take this fight if you're the Mongols, you're going to get wrecked. That is so many spearmen. And does he have the phalanx upgrade yet? He does. So those spearmen have 100% more range, which means they can like attack in, I believe they can attack in like multiple ranks and obviously can just reach things. Khan going to be using the movement speed buff to try and get away there. But this harrying and harassing that the Mongols are doing here is good. It's keeping his trade online and keeping the, uh, the Ayubids back. Now, Golden Age Tier 3 is activated, which gives him production speed of 20% across his entire faction, which is very, very good. And once again, a little bit of an engagement here, but this is going to be a, a colossal defeat for the Mongols if they decide to take this with the, all those spears there. He needs to start making basic archers. I mean, he's still just making Mangudai, which can kind of do the trick. You can see the Mangudai are actually kiting effectively and picking off several of these units. Is there any trade on the north? He is leaving some trade there, which is pretty cheeky. Overall, the gold per minute for the Mongols is pretty solid, um, about equal to that of the Ayubids, although he's going to be getting it in bigger bursts. Nice dual prong raid here. That is so good. He's going to get so many villager kills here. That is brutal. That's going to be equalizing the ecos pretty hard. So the Incan, one thing about him is he, seem, he seems really good at fighting on two fronts, like and, and like engaging these multi-pronged attacks. And he just butchered Quill's villagers, equalizing the eco. 69, the blessed number to 68. And the rest of the Mongol army is just going to be kiting. So he's accruing value while pulling back. He's killing villagers. He's killing military. 
it's just such good play with the Mongols here. And Quill is obviously fighting against it very well, but man, this is uh, this is getting out of control, man. Absolutely out of control. So look at that on the bottom, man. That was that was so so big. So any other raids going down doesn't look like it. 72 to 71 in terms of the economic department. Uh, any castle age advancement coming for either player? No, but the Incan um, is he going to be advancing the castle anytime soon? Doesn't look like it. Just, uh, just kind of harrying and skirmishing. A very, very long feudal age for both these players, amassing armies. No player wanting to take the risk of expending the resources to go to castle and making themselves vulnerable. The Incan, uh, in the meantime, is going to be looking to get into the base here, so trying to find a way in. Using his scout to like poke and prod and see if he can find a way in. Meanwhile, the Palisade Wall here is going to be uh, pushed down and up on the top. We do see the Mangudai uh, probably going to be trying to deal with the Horseman Raid. The Horseman Raid will be good. It's definitely going to kill a couple traders, but he, like Quill doesn't realize that the trade is actually mostly on the other side. Maybe he's going to realize it right now, moving down here, but I think he's actually just going to deal with this little army, which he will squash for sure. Now back in the front, the Incan does find a couple horsemen and is able to take them apart. Quill, in the meantime, going to be re uh, reacting to this uh, fence raid that's coming down here. So these guys are going to get massacred, but they're going to do it for the Great Khan, and they are going to be uh, they're going to be quite happy about that. Maybe take a couple camel riders down with them. We'll have to see. And the Deer Stones is being packed up and moved. Horsemen definitely able to mitigate the raiding here to an extent. A couple of traders will be taken down. So this is just going to reaffirm Quill's belief that there's no trade on the other side. But no, he does discover it. So the Spearmen do discover it. Nice, well played by Quill. Good game knowledge there. He discovers that the traders are online on both fronts and is going to be fully shutting this down, which is going to be heavily diminishing the Mongol eco. The Mongols are very dependent on trade. And I suspect the Mongols will reroute everything north to south now. Um, realizing that this route has been compromised and it's very close to Quill's base, he's going to be doing the safer route here and probably just massing Springall Towers along his trade route to keep that online. So yeah, good counterplay by Quill. If he didn't discover that trade, it was going to keep going. This is best of one. This whole tournament's best of one. It's a more casual format. But um, future tournaments, we will probably switch this to a best of three final, but today we're just testing the waters and uh, all that sort of stuff. Any age up? Nope. Uh, no age up for the Mongols either. Mongols looking close to aging up though. Currently, we can see 900, and although they just spent quite a bit of gold on something. Yeah, it looks like they wanted to get the... Oh, wait, they did hit Castle Age. I did miss it. Okay, the Coral Tie is here. I did miss the Castle Age age up. So the Mongols do have the age up advantage, and this is an opportunity for them to, you know, really put the dagger in there. The Mangudai sitting outside the walls, picking off, picking off villagers on gold. That's so annoying, dude. You think you build the walls, and you're safe, and then the Mangudai are just sitting on the other side, peeking over at you. That's got to feel bad. Quill with the counterplay, though. Moving in and harassing, but the Mongol army is pretty fat here. Although those spearmen might be able to turn the tide of the fight. We'll have to see how this goes. He's going to be taking the fight. He does have the... Uh, he got to be careful with the timing here. Maybe going to want to kite that spear army. And yes, he does. The Mangudai pulling those units back. Just mowing through those uh, those camels. Brutal, brutal DPS. But you don't want to take a full engagement against those spears. This is exactly what you want to do as the Mongol player with this Mangudai base army. It's just move in, charge. Refresh the charge bonus on your cab. Pull back, shoot. Harass. Be really, really obnoxious. But Quill knows he's behind in tech and is going to be aggressing here. But he's aging up himself. Going to be getting bizarre. So every three minutes a trade caravan arrives with a random selection of four favorable trades. Uh, so he's going to be going for the bizarre tech for his age up there. So we'll uh, take note of that as we do go. Mangudai, dude, are just eviscerating this army, dude. Absolutely eviscerating. Look at that. Yeah, brutal. Brutal. And this army is just going to get picked apart. This is this is like historic, historical uh, accuracy 101, right? I mean, obviously not fully, but... <laughs> the Mangudai just like drawing and dragging enemy armies through the field and then when they try and retreat chasing them down and massacring them dude it's like this is like the most Mongolian play here and the Mangudai just cutting through the spearman units and it looks like he's going to be full on committing to the fight with his uh, Kashyyyks now granted those spear units those phalanx units really really strong but the uh, Mangudai are now castle age so they're going to be a big problem and uh, then the raiding is going to get even more uh, fervent here we see villagers moving out to try and take some deer on the map. The Mongol army uh, catching the overextending army in open field here is going to be taking him down. Somebody in chat saying Bizarre is Ayyubid's strongest wing by far, also known uh, for the casino wing because it spawns random. Yeah, that's fun. We're going to keep uh, tabs on it and see what it spawns. Yeah, the casino wing. Yes, yes. Some more Mangudai over here, dude. He's got Mangudai all over the place. And uh, so far, looking at the economy, Quill does have a bit of an economic advantage, but the Mongol trade... And tech advantage will certainly keep them in the game. If the Mongols start grabbing relics too, that is going to be a big win for them. And we do see the old veteran Mangudai heading across the map. This map is really cool. I like this. I'm very excited if it gets to the point where, um, you know, they have to fight over the middle. Like when both players run out. Granted, the Mongols could survive on purely trade if they wanted to. 
Looking at the food per minute, Quill's food eco is quite a bit better. Uh, the gold eco is going to be going massively for the Mongols, though, so they do have that advantage. Horsemen chasing down Mangudai, taking some casualties in the process. Horsemen coming out, but the horsemen are super unupgraded, which is pretty funny. Now they're being upgraded to veteran horsemen, but they were uh, they were very, very uh, underdeveloped. I believe they were still Dark Age horsemen. He's going to be coming around here. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Oh, no. If those villagers get discovered, oh, dude, they're going to get massacred. That's going to be a huge loss for Quill. That is 16 villagers that are going to be going down here, uh, potentially, depending on the micro of the Incan. Uh, looks like he had an automatic move going, so he doesn't get as many kills as he could. Both players do have pretty good villager and eco damage, 28 against 21. You can see the value of both of those. I'm currently 11,000 against 10, so not bad. All right, all right. The Casino Wing. So the Casino Wing is online now, so you can see they have arrived. You have the Bedouin Swordsmen, the Skirmishers, and obviously Traders, and things randomly arrive as well. So that's a fun landmark. On the bottom side, wood being chopped up. Pastures online for the Incan looking good, so he's not going to be having any issues for food. Probably needs like maybe two or three more pastures to make sure he doesn't have villagers kind of idling there. And this Mangudai Legion is just unholy. The army size of the Incan is quite a bit better than that of Quill, but Quill does have a, a better kind of villager count and is going to be pretty well ahead on food and wood. Gold might be a little bit different, but overall, yeah, the Mongols building more pastures, so good play here by the Incan. He realizes it, saw some idling villagers, and is going to be addressing that. Probably going to start seeing towers set up in the middle. And yes, the prayer tent is up. Going to start grabbing relics, which is going to be huge. A couple of villagers moving out for Quill. So Quill was going to try and wall. He snuck some villagers around the top side of the map and is probably going to try and palisade wall here to block these traders. But the Incan was very privy to that. Any Mongol player knows how to defend their trade. And uh, yeah, now are they going to get in the base is the question. That's a pretty good army. A combination of Gulams, archers, and horsemen. But the Mongols are going to be able to kite them into oblivion. So you can see the horsemen pursuing are just going to get mowed down. Horsemen falling here, and uh, he's really keeping him pinned in his base. So the Mongols, what I suspect is going to happen is he is <laughs> he is going to be trying to... Um, sorry, a comment in chat made me laugh. He's going to be trying to uh, starve him out. So the Mongols are just going to keep him pinned in his base and just keep trading with attrition until the point where the Ayubids run out of gold, and uh, then that will basically just be GG at that point. You know, He's going to be able to starve him, make better quality units, uh, hand cannoneers will eventually come in for the Mongols, and that is when everything uh, will pop off. Yeah, the Mongol food economy isn't terrible either. The extra pastures here should be uh, functioning well. Upgrades looking pretty strong. He's got three military upgrades. Quill has about the same. So their militaries are, uh, you know, oh, this could change things. Quill could get a really nice push. The main the Manjaniks, these things with their incendiary shots are going to punish that army. So this is what Quill needs to do. He, he can't let himself be put in a cage. He needs to move up, drop a keep in the middle on these two gold notes to secure it against the Mongols, and just have a scary push with Trebs. Or, excuse me, these uh, Manjaniks, these uh, Mangonels. I like that a lot. And what the Incan will probably do is split up his Mangudai and trying to fi find a way into Quill's base, I suspect. But yeah, this is good play by Quill. He knows he can't be kept in the cage. He's going to have to get the old, uh, the old keep up. And yeah, the prayer bus, I know. It's pretty cool. The Mongols can get their prayer tent, and they can move it around and just go grab relics. It's, uh, it's pretty hilarious. Is there going to be another one grabbed here? So far, I think he has one relic. But yeah, that keep drop's going to be nasty. And this army could be tough to deal with. The Mangudai are really going to struggle here. The Mongols need to get some Springholds out stat. And we immediately see that response from the Incan. So clearly, he is very on point with this. And we do see the Kashyyyks getting ready to do a big flank. If the um, if the Mangjaniks do get taken down, could be a problem. Quill, I love this play from Quill. Very, very nice. Bringing a keep out to the middle. Going to be securing this. Very solid, very clean, and he's going to be cackling all the way to the bank, ladies and gentlemen. Jordan, first stream. Thank you for the tenor. I've uh, been watching you since the heathen days of old. Dude, that is that is a long time. We've been doing YouTube on, I think, seven years. Jesus, six, seven years? Uh, I'd watch you commentate paint dry, and I would do that for you if you really wanted it. <laughs> I would do that. So Springholds and Coraltai, this is going to be the fight for the fate of Middle-earth here. The Urukai have the high ground, and... Uh, I don't know who would be who in this situation. Urukai definitely would not use horse archers. This is more of like a Rohan army. Okay, Rohan, and uh, I don't even know who this would be most apt. I mean, we got War Machines. That's a little bit Isengardish, isn't it? Nice pick there by uh, Quill. He finds the Springalds. There's only one Springald online. The Mangudai army with a massive amount of DPS in the front line. But the Manjaniks are ready. If the Mongols could flank with some villagers and torch these, that would be pretty big. But Quill is pushing the tempo, ladies and gentlemen. He's coming in, making outposts with Springalden placements. We now have uh, Manganels of their own here, which are going to start blasting into this army. And the Springalds here are shooting in. Nice flank coming in. Horseman flank. One goes down. Is the other one going to go down? It really needs to, because look at the damage it's doing to this big, big Mangudai army. The other uh, Manjik trying. Horsemen on the backside going to be flanking the villagers, making sure they can't do their thing. And the Mongol army 
actually getting a good engagement there and crushing the Ayubids in that fight. Man, that was a clean flank. Very, very clean flank. But on that same note, it does secure the middle for Quill. So Quill is going to be able to establish a keep, which means he's not going to be pushed out easily. However, uh, we could see some trebuchets and traction trebuchets being set up with Quill tie. This gold could easily be denied. And I don't think the Mango Dice are going to let that happen easily. They're going to roll down there and it's going to be very, very heavy duty. Yeah, Rohan versus Harrod. Yeah, <laughs> at the Herodrim. That's cool. That's pretty cool. All right, guys. So the battle on the outposts, you got to take those down. You don't want annoying spring all towers just chilling in your base and obstructing your reinforcements. As far as relics go, more stables being set up by the Incan. Uh, I know he had one relic last I looked. I don't know how effective he's been at grabbing those. But man, his micro is really good. You know, I was like watching some of the games today. I was like, oh, you know, I could I could maybe compete here. But then I get to this grand final and I'm like, all right, that's that's where the line is drawn. <laughs> that's where the old line is drawn. So where are they going to go? Um, they're harrying, looking for villagers. There are some farms down here which they could get. Quill has been able to macro very well. Despite losing his entire army, he is actually re-macroed and now has a bigger army once again. We do have the mangonels up on the high ground. Got to be careful not to lose those. If those things get sniped by a Quill dive, that would be really, really bad. Coral Tie sitting here, and this is going to show the main army here, and it looks like the Incan does find some farms, but realizes that he's going to need to go back to his base, and those mangoes are in a really precarious position. They're completely unprotected. This could be a game-winning play here for Quill. If Quill's able to get those mangoes and shut them down for free, um, that's going to be just so bad. I mean, you that's so many resources and so much, so many powerful units that you really, really just need in this fight. Coral Tide needs to set up here, and it looks like several of them have gone down currently. They do rip a couple shots and are able to take out some units before they go. Ram's coming down here, so the Jew hosting is going to be in full effect here from Incan. And he does manage to salvage two of the mangoes, which is good, and does get some uh, damage in return. So now Quill is going to be trying to hold down here. Yeah, the relic count in the bottom left, that's right. So we do see two relics for the Mongols and one for the Ayubids. Oh man, this interface is so nice. I'm used to just not casting with that type of stuff, but that's, that's really neat. So is he going to push up? Where are the trebuchets? No, Ram's move up here, but they're a little bit unprotected. The big crashing from over the hills. The Mangudai come down and just start shooting uh, the spearmen to pieces. But this gold, this is a lot of gold here. And the Mongols are going to start hurting for gold too. I mean, they have a gold node up here in their trade, which is really keeping them alive. I guess they have 2,700 a minute from their trade. Holy shit. Yeah, this trade is is just foul. Oh, that's so nice. Mangudai raiding on the far side, picking off quite a few villagers. And that is going to be more villager losses for Quill. But Quill doesn't care about vill losses as much now. He's at 130 eco, so it's not like that. It's not like the early game where losing them would be as substantial. You know, they can reproduce the villagers pretty quickly. So shots being ripped, shooting into the siege workshop here where Springalds are being produced. The Ghulams, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty diverse army. We have veteran archers, we have camel lancers, Ghulams, spearmen. It's got most of the bases covered, but this is going to be the Incan pushing in, and a couple Springalds could get picked here. That would have been pretty nice if they could have gotten those. But it looks like Quill is going to be defending. Nice play by Quill. His Camel Lancers move in. And those battering rams, about, what, like 7, how much wood is it? Like 750, 800, 900, something like that, are going to be paying the troll toll. So probably Spring Alds. We do see uh, population caps coming into play. So players are going to be pop capped here. So, you know, they're going to start trading their armies. Detaching a little bit of a raiding force is nice. Just going and pressuring into the Palisades here and having something that, you know, will distract Quill's mind from this very focused engagement is going to be quite important. So... This has the making of a uh, of a long game. Yeah, this has the making of a long game. This is very close. I mean, they're very even now. Nobody's like really super ahead of one another. I could even make an argument that maybe Quill is a little bit happier now considering that he's got all this gold in the middle under his control, but it's not as big of an issue with the Mongolian trade being what it is. Like that trade will keep him afloat. I mean, currently the Incan, this, dude, are we gonna see a wonder in this game? The Incan is crushing him in resources. Currently 3,000 there. And uh, we see Quill at about 800 here. Yeah, counter uh, counter raid here. We do see the detached lancers going to be moving up. Spring all towers and arrow towers will give a little bit of uh, momentum there. Mangudai moving through. And uh, they're like, coming through, ladies and gentlemen. Picking off villagers on the way. And uh, unfortunately, these poor mangonels going to get picked probably. Those spring alls are pretty prevalent for Quill. Quill seems to be doing better in the artillery trades. Uh, Mangudai taking an engagement on the high ground here. Both players going to be rapidly producing armies. More mangonels on the way out. But the Mangudai on the high ground doing nice DPS. But the Ghulams able to tank a lot of the shots. Raiding still going down here. This is huge for Quill. Um, the fact that Quill is getting this nice raid and really mitigating the uh, trade in the back. He unfortunately using, is using a control all army feature, which I do all the time. And that's why these guys stopped raiding. They could have gotten a lot more damage on the trade, but they were pulled back to the front line to fight. So the Mangudai, he might need to switch up his jam. Um, it looks like there is going to be an age up of the White Stupa. So that is going to be giving an, uh, a tech advantage here to the Mongols if they can survive this pressure. 
at that point, you just have to start spamming, I think, hand cannoneers. Like hand cannoneers, uh, men at arms, the Kashyyyks, whatever. Like some sort of a combination of those units. Because Quill is starting to take over in terms of the artillery game. He's got that nice presence of spring alts, which is just mowing down any artillery the Mongols make. But the Mongols are not hearing any bell. And the Mongols' golden come is pretty nuts. Kurultai also giving them a big advantage in terms of fighting power. 20% DPS on these units here is no joke. And uh, the Spring Alts do get the picks. Some of them trying to pull back, trade back online. Unfortunately, Quill did pull back his Raiders. He, he could have probably crippled the trade there pretty hard. But again, uh, when you do the control all army feature, it sometimes pulls away your Raiders, which is something that I do quite a bit as well. Battle continues, ladies and gentlemen. Veteran Mangudai pulling back here. Would you see the Spring Alts? Uh, you know, they're not Spring Alts of the launch. The Age of Spring Alts is probably the most miserable time in Age of Empires 4, is when Spring Alts could literally like fly super fast under the uh, Mongol towers, and oh god, that was pure misery, but obviously much better now. Downhill charge, a couple Spring Alts going to be falling. The Mongols hearing no bells whatsoever, and they are Imperial. They have the White Stupa, which is going to be giving augmented uh, sheep production over here, and the Coral Tie is going to be packing up and moving. And once again, man, the Incan is really just trading so well and these uh, in these fights here like he's winning the fights quill does have good map control but like quill's eventually gonna run out of gold i mean it's gonna take a long time but yeah it's gonna take a hell of a long time for that to happen mangudai raiding on the periphery able to drag down these camels pretty well the veteran desert raiders have z like zero ranged armor i believe they have one upgrade there so now it looks like he's going to be pushing and doing some raiding and trying to drag the army away from his lands while he gets upgrades we have the elite kashiks or the elite Mangudai with the incendiary arrow and stone commerce. So he's going to be getting a lot of stone, which means cannon towers, which is very, very strong, obviously. Rams coming out, spring alt shooting. A uh, little bit of a uh, roughness here as the old uh, spring alts do get popped down by the outposts. And the battle uh, continues. Man, this has been a great one, dude. This has been a great one. Yeah, some traps could be good, but also uh, Quill's been doing a really good job keeping the siege numbers down with these spring alts. He's not messing around with those. Oh, no, the Raiders have gotten in the base. Oh, wow, man, the, the Incan just with dual-pronged pressure on every front. Mangudai and Kashyyyks have gotten in the base, and these are no mere Urakai. These are uh, going to be elite Mangudai in just a couple seconds here, killing the spearmen that try and chase them down, and now he's into uh, Quill's farm eco. He could potentially get a lot of damage done here if he attacks, and he does. So big, big pressure here, ladies and gentlemen, as we do see the villagers getting popped. A couple towers in the back are upgraded, so that's going to be nice. But villager damage is going down back in the middle. We do see Quill with his main army. It looks like he's centralized here. Going to be trying to push the Mongols back. The Mongols now have Ramsteins coming in. And the Rams are going to start wearing down the central infrastructure. While in the back, a ton of idling. Uh, Quill's food bank isn't good. He's sitting on 27 food. So this idling of farms is going to give the Mongols a big advantage as it pertains to these military trades up in the front line. Yeah, nastiness. Army size does favor Quill a little bit. But the raiding in the back is very disruptive. I mean, villagers are still... Uh, just dropping like flies in the back. And the Mangudai are finding more and more, dude. This raiding is so good as the Ayubid villagers just getting absolutely cut to pieces. And the Kashyyyks bouncing around. And man, look at this. This is just disgusting. Good, good raiding. But Quill didn't hear no bell, man. And his his Phalanx infantry and his Ghulams are going to trade upwards into a lot of these Kashyyyk units. So uh, there are some very favorable military trades. The Mangudai are going to need to amass numbers here once again. As uh, still heavy raiding in the base, we do see Cole responding with some spearmen finally up on the top side. These guys hiding in the bushes. Um, obviously, he's very focused on microing in his base. And uh, the fight continues, man. This is this is serious. This is a really serious one. Bombard's coming out. You have to remember, uh, I believe the Mongols got the Imperial a little bit quicker, although I'm not sure. It looks like they're both Imperial now. And uh, the casino still going here for the Ayubids in the back. Raiding still going down. Dude, this is so annoying. This has got to be so obnoxious. And look at the economic difference now. They're below 100, which is still plenty of eco. You don't need much more than that. But the elite Mangudai, they are elite. Camel Riders are elite also. Elite Spearmen. So it looks like uh, Quill has been able to match his tech. So nobody is massively ahead. Although we do see two big upgrades coming out. We see the Incendiary Arrows in Biology, which is going to be making the Mongolian Cavalry uh, very, very good. They'll be trading pretty well indeed. Ayubids in the back have several farm uh, emplacements, which are just uh, basically on death's bed. They're, they're just, uh, I'm too weak, help me. And the Mongol trade with the stone commerce is really going to pop off. We're going to start seeing Mongolian stone towers everywhere, which are just so, so incredibly good for map control. Hmm. Yeah, 100 villager kills for the Mongols. That's one way to keep the Abbasid economy down, or the Ayyubid economy. Spring Alt's going to kill this Bombard Cannon. Nice pick there by Quill. Quill's army here should trade adequately well. But the Mongols are just going to kind of kite around and continue that harassing and harrying. And even still, farms are being idled in the back. And uh, yeah, the food eco here for Quill is tough. 
he does have some farms back online, but this whole farming segment has been offline for quite some time. So he's going to want to replenish that or else the Mongols are going to be able to overwhelm him. The Mongols need to get some springs and uh, be more effective with their spring odds. If Quill doesn't have springs, I think the Mongols can take over here. And if Quill, here's the thing, guys. If Quill gets pushed out of the middle, he probably loses the game because um, all of his gold is dependent on this middle infrastructure. He does have a keep here, which is very nice, and Quill knows this and is defending very, very well. But the Mongols can do this all day with this trade. They can just keep it up. Currently 2,800 gold, but Quill is also rich as hell. He's been banking a lot of gold in the middle. Looking at the golden age here, um, he's on the third golden age, which does give them production speed. Tier four, siege units cost 20% less and camels attack faster at tier five. If Quill could definitely put a bit of effort into, although he doesn't have much wood. Yeah, I was gonna say, you could spam a bunch of houses and buildings to try and get that. Um, Cause currently, yeah, he's not maxed out on his golden age here. Coral Tie setting up shop. Traction trebuchets are in play, so gonna start knocking down some of the defenses here. But Quill has definitely been playing much better as it pertains to the siege play. The map control play advantage has been going to the Incan, but the siege play has been keeping Quill in this game here in the uh, fourth quarter here, for sure. Up at the top side, more relics being taken by the Mongols. Gold is good. And the fact that they can play with this trade and not even care. Um, are we seeing cannon towers going down here? It looks like a couple of towers were placed there. In the middle, the Mangodai poke in. And the Mangodai are trying to snipe the uh, artillery there, which is funny. But now the Mongols have artillery superiority, it looks like. Spring all shooting in, and Quill could be in danger of losing the middle of the map. He could be in some serious danger. He's got reinforcements trickling in, but the fact that his food economy uh, was offline for a while has given the Mongols momentum as it pertains to the, uh, you know, just the raw troop count. Uh, army size is going to be favoring Mongols, 32 against 14. And now the Mangudai are going to be coming around. If the Mangudai can shut down the gold, that's going to be nasty. Granted, Quill has a big bank. A lot of villagers are going to be garrisoning here, but not all of them are going to be able to fit. And the Mongols know this is an opportunity for them to get some picks. To Mangadai coming into numbers. Meanwhile, the siege equipment and the traction trebs should be moving up. Uh, don't know what happened to the traction treb. Might have actually gotten killed there. And yeah, more villagers going to be getting butchered. 105, 106, 107. It is climbing pretty rapidly here as the Mangudai army does poke around. This is some very, very sweaty micro, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Quill looks like he's maxed out on his ranged upgrade, so we did get that. As far as his upgrades go, he's getting all his camels elite. So now Quill's army quality in terms of upgrades is going to be pretty close. More villagers did go down here, but a lot of idling villagers in the keep. Um, any dual-pronged raiding? Not really. And here's the thing. Yeah, plenty of wood safe. A lot of villagers mining wood out here, so that is a big opportunity for some raiding to go down. And now Quill is going to be reorienting his army. What if we saw a wonder in this game, dude? That would be nuts if we got to see a wonder. Yeah, good spring old numbers, and it looks like there's a palisade attempt, so yeah, that's pretty annoying. You can see here Quill trying to palisade in the Mongols, which is a very good tactic, super obnoxious to deal with. Something we see a lot in our FFAs as well. Over on the east side, we do see uh, the villagers hammering through the gold, and it's going to start becoming an issue soon, especially if the Mongols bring some bills up of their own and start grabbing what they can. 2,000 gold a minute for the Mongols. The Mongols actually have three relics right now, and they have one in their uh, their custody, so there are going to be four relics. With tithe barns and stone trading, to the amount of cannon towers you're going to start seeing all over this battlefield are going to just be disgusting. A uh, keep in the middle is in danger. Quill's army on the other side is here. And the Mongol Legion, man, showing that they still got it, man. Showing that they still got it. Incan is a Giga Chat. He really is with the Mongols. Yeah, absolutely, man. They're both these players are both great. I mean, it's the reason why they're both in the grand finals of today's tournament, right? They both earned it. I would not want to play this Mongol army. <laughs> this is a, it fills me with dread. And the Incan is pushing him back. Quill is on the back foot. The middle is gonna be going to the Mongols. So now the Ayubids are going to be forced back. Their gold bank, though nice at 5,000, is going to start draining out pretty quickly. He's going to need to find a way to keep that uh, keep that gold income going somehow. He could do cross-map trade of his own. Like, I think what would have been a nice play for Quill to do is build stone walls uh, in the back and secure a trade route of his own, like from here to here. But obviously, uh, that's not going down. And now the Mongols are going to start pushing on him again, which is going to be so tough to deal with. Uh, I think for Incan, a really nice play as well could be... Uh, building a bunch of towers in the middle and just upgrading them with the uh, cannons. I think that would just be brutal. More villagers going to get mowed down here, so that's going to be the last of the gold trade here uh, for the Ayubid. So those bad boys going to get dragged through the mud. And the Mongols, in the meantime, hunting and harrying. Up in the top here, we do see uh, Quill getting a nice pick. He does pick off those rams, and Quill still does have this and this. Both players with a little bit of Bronzodia in terms of not grabbing Sacred Sites. That's literally could have been thousands of free gold if they had just grabbed it earlier. I mean, they both have religious characters, so... I don't know why that didn't happen. But the Mongols are now harassing on both fronts. We have a Mongolian army in the front, and now we got Mongolian raiders coming in the side here. And uh, Quill trying to establish trade. You can see the traders had popped out. Looks like he had trade up here. Yes, and he's trying to get that going. 
But the Mongols have realized this. And uh, yes, now they're on their way in. So here comes the raid of the Incan. As hand cannoneer is being made. Yeah, but that gold's gonna run out quick. See how it's going down? He just had 4,000 and now he's in the pits. Mongols also gonna be getting bounty. So as they kill buildings, they're gonna be getting a bounty, which is uh, pretty huge. So there it is. Very nice. And in the middle, the Mongols setting up towers, securing the gold nodes, making sure it's secret and it's safe. The precious must be kept, uh, kept sacred here. And uh, yeah, another one building going down. Quill really, really pushed into the corner. Um, Mongols sitting happily on 2,000 gold a minute, so they can just happily bank that and you know keep it for a rainy day. Another TC gonna be going down here on the far side. A couple villagers got their daggers out, and I think this could be the end, potentially, for old Quill. Fighting against fully operational Mongolian trade is really hard. So the Kashyyyk's going to be taking this fight here. Um, surprisingly, they actually opt to take the fight. I thought they would retreat. Doing a little bit of a split push. So he's sending his uh, cavalry out in a couple directions. And he is going to be diving and potentially even getting kills on artillery here, which is quite nice. So one of those mangoes is going to be going down. But Quill does deal with the raid. Probably going to be rebuilding his palisades here. He did keep the TC, which is great. And in the front, the Mongols are going to be pushing up. And uh, the artillery hanging out. Mongols still just swarms and swarms of elite Kashyyyk all over the battlefield. If uh, if this gets discovered, man, that's going to be tough. Luckily for uh, Quill, the Incan hasn't really looked that way, and he's just going to be doing more of a central push right now. Maybe just going for the kill, and, you know, with the Ayyubids, all you have to do is kill these two landmarks. So it's much easier than dealing with, like, you know, Chinese or another civ like that. Yeah, you know, for a tournament that has a best of one grand final, this is, like, as good as you could ask for, like, an even long game. It's like, there's no excuses for either player. Like, oh, you know, I, I, was a, I got unlucky and mismicroed one or two units. No, it's like a... A good solid long grind but quill's coming out with a big army this is big for quill nice flank by quill high ground elite camels uh coming down killing several of the artillery pieces and now all these spring alts are going to be caught man right when you think quill is in trouble he comes back and he scraps and he gets a massively favorable trade and out out flanks the mongol army there um very effectively cannon towers here haven't been upgraded mongols actually have their stone tower upgrade now too so they get that and the Mongol army is going to be forced back, man. Quill did not hear any bell whatsoever. What an absolute champ. What an absolute champ. Because he is on the back foot like a thousand percent. The Mongols have their own cavalry who are going to come in and tear apart the siege equipment. So both players, uh, you know, no mercy on the siege equipment. But once again, just like history, when you overextend against Mongol army, they're going to pick you apart with their archers. And then when you try and retreat, they're going to chase you down. And you're going to have a really, really bad time. So Sacred Site being captured here, and uh, on the other side, the Sacred Site has not been captured here for Old Quill. Looking around, we do see the uh, Kashyyyks as well as the Mangudai hanging out. Cannon towers being placed in the middle, um, but they're still a ways off in terms of their upgrades. So the Mongols going to want to protect those if they uh, can. And uh, yeah, the Kashyyyk's trying to deal with these villagers. He still hasn't discovered this pocket over here, which is very fortunate. Although he's going to see it now because he just saw villagers coming from this direction. So um, now these bad boys are going to run over this way. Yeah, because the villagers were kind of a bit of a tell. But look at that. The villagers going for the torch on the uh, Kuril tie there, which is also being repaired. And a keep drop from Quill as Quill just keeps the momentum going forward. And the Mongols getting pushed back a little bit. Their cannon towers didn't get a chance to fully saturate. But um, if the Incan sees this, holy shit, that's 41 villagers. That would just be backbreaking. If Quill doesn't notice that, that is going to be just so brutal. Now back in the middle, the Phalanx Spearmen, as well as the Archers and the remnants of the Hand Cannoneers pushing up. But now you're going to be encountering the Mongol static defenses, the Bombard Towers, which will probably push that army back. Coral Tai has been stabilized. And the Mongols are going to be crushing in with another big army once again. Um, army size 49 to 60 in favor of Quill. And man, if the Incan was watching this and, and saw this like villager, he could have gotten... He could have probably ended the game right there. If he had seen all those vills, he could have killed easily 20 to 30 of them, which would have ended Quill's economy like super hard. Because Quill is starting to run out of, um, of eco. Like his eco's not looking great. He does see it. These guys are going to get in. Oh no, that's a lot of back pressure too. Mongols pulling back knowing they have cannon emplacements. They can safely just kind of defend while doing a big raid here. And this gate's going to go down. Quill desperately trying to repair that, but... He is going to be paying the troll toll here pretty damn hard. So gate is down, and that is also going to get into the trade here. On the other side, man, the Incan raiding on so many fronts, which, you know, you might see units sitting still every now and then, but that's only because he's microing like 20 units across the battlefield, right? Megadai picking off the archers, a couple of spearmen coming in to try and deal with that. Quill's economy getting hammered here, but despite all that, Quill is able to get his uh, gold vein back, his big veiny gold vein. So the elite Kashyyyks uh, could shut that down if they saw it, but it looks like they are going to run back. No, they do see it. That's going to be a lot of villager damage as they're all going to be idling. And this keep can only fit 15 villagers, so a lot of them are going to be left out to their own devices. They're going to be Leonardo DiCaprio and Titanic falling off the uh, falling off the old raft here, being left off it. 
Yep, Morville's going down. 85 eco. This is the lowest we've seen Quill in a long time as the Mangudai rating really starts to add up and uh, also the Kashyyyk rating. Yeah, he, he plays the Mongols really, really Mongol flavored. You know, it's it's not like, yeah, Inkin has 10,000 APM. It, it seems they both do. Both these players seem to have really good APM. So Ram's coming out, Mangudai surging forward with the Kashyyyks and the trading continues in the middle as both players uh, replenishing their armies pretty fervently. Villagers back here mining, and do we still see raiding in the back? We do. Look at that. He's actually he's actually going after the uh, the markets with just some uh, Mangudai. They're sitting kind of semi AFK back there. I'm surprised at how well the Mangudai are trading in the mainline fights, though. I've always felt like they kind of struggle there, but it seems like they're doing pretty well. Keep potentially going to be going down. The Mangonels shooting into it and wearing down its HP, and we do also see the torch damage adding up. A couple battering ramps being taken down, and once again. The open field fighting does seem to favor the Mongols. Yeah, just ripping through those forces. And these villagers are going to have to run for their lives because these Mangudai are going to chase them down as they try and retreat, uh, potentially. If they don't, it's a big mistake because that is a huge amount of eco. And uh, in the backfield, man, he's still raiding in the back too. He still has a couple Mangudai just trolling about. The cross map trade is partially online. It's going to an extent, but villagers are just hemorrhaging. He's down to 87. We have 187 villager kills. 187 villager kills from the Mongols this game. That is bananas. So right now, we have the elite Kashyyyks moving in. Elite Mangudai going to be uh, rushing up to meet them. And man, the, the, are we in an FFA game right now? This has been going 50 minutes. This is a duel of fates, ladies and gentlemen. Equally skilled, for sure. As, uh, yeah, farms are still all offline here. The food currently at 1,500 a minute, so still decent food economy on the other side of the base. Villager setting up on the wood as the Mongols might be able to just bull rush in here and get the Mangudai and just full on press. Middle Cruel Ties being set up. More towers going to be uh, placed as well. Could this be a rinse and repeat? Could Quill find a way to uh, re remuster his forces? It ain't going to be easy. It ain't going to be easy. Yeah, this is a real sweaty one. It's a real, real sweaty match, guys. Up on the top side, dude, and he's losing these traders too. These like two haggard Mangudai are just getting so much value back here. He does have the outpost towers. A couple camels are going to come over there to try and shut him down. In the middle, the Mongols look to be pressing. Traction Trebuchet is there. That's going to start putting some pressure on the base buildings. Coral tie sitting comfortably. Um, yeah, the Incan needs to get more towers all over the map. Like, all these areas need to be towered up. There's no reason not to. Because uh, that, that will give you a better idea of where everybody's moving and, you know, what's going down here. So, yeah, couldn't have asked for a, a better final, I know. Yeah, the gold difference. 6,000 gold, guys, against 400. The Mongols are just bathing in gold, dude. Genghis Khan is just just wearing a fully fully gilded suit of armor right now. He is just loving it up. And now the Mongols have gotten into the base. Granted, Kul's army is respectable, but they 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 could just go raid. They could go over here and raid, although probably not a good idea considering the camels over there. But they are just going to actually take this fight. And the Mongols just going to keep moving up with siege equipment, uh, traction trebuchet, knocking down whatever it can. A lot of villagers out here. That would be just just slim pickings. That, that would be just freebies. And this could be the beginning of the end. Um, army sizes are pretty equal, though, all things considered. Lancers into the base, though. That's going to be nasty. And look at this. More raiding on this side. Uh, Palisades coming up. Desperation Palisades from Quill as the Incan looks like he was going to be trying to flank there. Man, both players are just so on point with defending and attacking. And uh, the army of the Ayubid seems to be falling to the Mongol army perpetually. The Coral Ties being set up in your opponent's base, and that's always pretty bleak. Granted, there's still a lot of hand cannoneers and spears here with the Phalanx. They might be able to get it done. It looks like the house is being attacked. Interesting target right there. And man, if he just comes over here and crushes all this, that's going to be such a big loss right there. Meanwhile, this army on the side uh, probably will be knocking down those Palisades shortly, and he discovers it. This was I was this is what I was worried about here for old Quill because now Quill is just losing his wood eco. Um, he's only got 700, and those villagers just got wrecked, absolutely wrecked. Big Mongol army coming, wave two, dude. I don't think the Incan even knows what men at arms are or crossbows. The, he is just straight up lancer and and Mangudai all day every day. But yeah, this playstyle requires a ton of APM and a ton of micro. Like it is a not easy playstyle to do. Yeah, play the Who Wolf Totem. Yeah, that song's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. All right, so the archers are moving up. Nasty, nasty DPS from the Mangudai, supported by the Coral Tie, and uh, this this could be the end of Quill's army. I mean, look at his food bank. Quill's food is rough, and the uh, Mongolians can just buy food if they want to. The, the Great Khan is sitting on seven thousand two hundred and eight. Man, absolutely brutal. So they keep wrecking through these units. The Coral Tie's getting in there. Rams also pouring in, and the Mongols are pressing from here as well. So they're going to knock down this palisade, and then they're going to be able to come up here and potentially uh, get in the here and. Uh, Pressure depending on the uh, micro of all this, but I think Quill is potentially done for in today's tournament. I think he is going to be in trouble. 
Uh, his army looks non-existent. There's Mongolian rams in his base. And ladies and gentlemen, the great Khan coming in and claiming victory in our first tournament of AoE4 Tavern. Shout out to the Incan and to Quill, our grand finalists. They played like absolute champions. But the great Khan has shown no mercy here today, riding down all that stand before him. And that is going to be GG well played. Man, what a great tournament. What a great match. So we had some varying skill level matchups today. This felt like the most equal matchup we've had. Uh, that was so fun, man. That was so fun. GG, well played to both those guys. That was a great match. And if you guys enjoyed this tournament, do drop a like on the way out. It helps quite a bit. Um, you know, I really want to grow our Age of Empires community here and just put on more tournaments and more events and have more FFAs going on. So uh, every time you guys do drop a like, it helps out there quite a bit. So shout out to Quill as well as to our mighty winner, the Incan, doing the great con proud. I feel like I need to go listen to the Who now. Yeah, Genghis, he got he got his work done. That was very sweaty, that game. <laughs> yeah, he had like 9,000 gold in the bank. Craziness, craziness. So that one went pretty long, and I am getting pretty darn hungry, but don't worry, guys. Uh, we're going to be calling the stream for today. I think that's too good of a note to end on. We got to call it there. And I'll be back tomorrow um, with another stream, likely. So tomorrow, I think we'll do just a standard FFA stream, something like that. I don't know. We'll, we'll do something fun. It's going to be great. But the, this weekend, uh, let's see. So tomorrow, Saturday, got to go to jury duty on Monday. That's always fun. Um, but yeah, so sweaty as hell says Inkin, I know. That was a great match. They both played super well. They both played super well. Quill fought hard. Quill was behind a lot of that. Um, but yeah, there was back and forth, dude. But the fact that Inkin was able to stabilize his trade while also denying his opponent trade. And dude, 300 villager kills. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. GG well played. I am excited. Hopefully you guys like the single faction format. I think it's very fun. You get like a, a player who's defined as their faction, you know, and they carry that banner. I think I think it's a really cool format. Certainly a little bit more, um, more casual, but you know how it is. All right, guys. Take care of yourselves. See you next time. That's it for today. Dovi Zenya. Make sure to drop a like on the way out. We'll see you back next time. Congrats to the Incan. And Incan, make sure to check out on Total Tavern or AOE4 Tavern. Got to get used to that. You can, uh, you should have an avatar. A five win avatar. Yeah. You should have it. Yeah, there's also that. Quill was playing a new sieve. Um, Incan saying if you put him on Delhi or Abbasid, you die. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, he was playing a new sieve and you were playing a sieve you're very vulnerable. So that's a very good sportsmanship for you to say that. So um, yeah, I'm sure Quill will be back with a vengeance with one of his mains in the next tournament. All right, guys. Adios. See you next time. Take care of yourselves and congratulations to the great Khan, the Incan. He has done him proud for sure. GG, well played. Adios.